Hildegard von Bingen, Chivius, Book 3, The History of Salvation Symbolized by a Building. Vision 1, God and Man, and I a person taken up from among other people, though unworthy to be called a human, since I have transgressed God's law and have been unjust when I should have been just, except that by God's grace. I am his creature and will be saved. I looked towards the east, and there I saw a single block of stone immeasurably broad and high and the color of iron with a white cloud above it, and above the cloud a royal throne, round in shape, on which one was sitting living and shining and marvelous in his glory, and so bright that I could not behold him clearly. He held to his breast what looked like black and filthy mire, as big as a human heart, surrounded by precious stones and pearls. And from this shining one seated upon the throne extended a great circle colored gold, like the dawn whose width I could not take in. It circled from the east to the north to the west to the south and back to the east to the shining one, and he had no end. And that circle was so high above the earth that I could not comprehend it, and it shone with a terrifying radiance, the color of stone, steel, and fire which extended everywhere from the heights of heaven to the depths of the abyss, so that I could not see an end to it. And then I saw a great star, splendid and beautiful, come forth from the one seated on the throne. And with that star came a great multitude of shining sparks, which followed the star towards the south, looking on the one seated on the throne like a stranger. They turned away from him and started toward the north instead of contemplating him. But in a very act of turning away their gaze, they were all extinguished and were changed into black cinders. And behold, a whirlwind arose from those cinders which drove them away from the south behind the one sitting on the throne and carried them to the north where they were precipitated into the abyss and vanished from my sight. But when they were extinguished, I saw the light which was taken from them immediately returning to him who sat on the throne. And I heard the one who sat on the throne saying to me, Write what you see and hear. And from the inner knowledge of that vision, I replied, I beseech you, my Lord, give me understanding that by my account I may be able to make known these mystical things. Forsake me not, but strengthen me by the daylight of your justice, in which your Son was manifested. Grant me to make known the divine counsel, which was ordained of old, as I can and should, how you willed your Son to be incarnated and become a human being within time which you willed before all creation in your rectitude and the fire of the dove, the Holy Spirit, so that your Son might rise from the virgin and the splendid beauty of the Son and be clothed with true humanity, a man's form assumed for man's sake. And I heard him say to me, Oh, how beautiful are your eyes, which tell of divinity when the divine counsel dawns in them. And again I answered from the inner knowledge of the vision. To my own inner soul I seem as filthy ashes of ashes and transitory dust, trembling like a feather in the dark. But do not blot me out from the land of the living, for I labor at this vision with great toil. When I think of the worthlessness of my foolish bodily senses, I deem myself the least and lowest of creatures. I am not worthy to be called a human being, for I am exceedingly afraid and do not dare to recount your mysteries. O good and kind Father, teach me what to say according to your will. O reverend Father, sweet and full of grace, do not forsake me, but keep me in your mercy. And again I heard the same one saying to me, Now speak as you have been taught. Though you are ashes, I will that you speak. Speak of the revelation of the bread, which is the Son of God, who is life in the fire of love, who raises up everyone dead in soul and body, forgives all repented sins in his serene clarity, and awakens holiness in a person and sets it growing. Thus God the Magnificent, Glorious and Incomprehensible, gave him as a great intercessor, by sending him into the purity of the virgin, who had no corruptible weakness in her virginity, no pollution of the flesh should or could have been in the mind of the virgin. For when the Son of God came in silence into the dawn, which was the humble maiden, death, the slayer and destroyer of the human race, was deceived without knowing it, as if in a dream. Death went on securely, not realizing that life that sweet virgin bore 
for her virginity had been hidden from it, and the virgin was poor in worldly goods, for the divine majesty willed to have her so. Now write about the true knowledge of the Creator in His goodness. 1. The faithful should venerate the magnitude of the fear of the Lord. God, who created all things and appointed humanity to that glory from which the lost angel and his followers were cast out, should be worshipped and feared by every creature of his with the greatest honor and awe, for it is just that his creatures should worship the creator of all things and faithfully adore God above all things. This is symbolized by that stone that you see, for in this mystery it represents the magnitude of the fear of God, which should always arise and live in the hearts of the faithful with purest purpose. You see it as a single block of stone, immeasurably broad and high, and the color of iron. This shows how firmly the fear of God must be held, for God is to be dreaded by every creature with single-heartedness, so that they know he is the one true God, without whom is no one, and like whom there is no one. It has immense breadth because he is incomprehensible, and height because divinity is above all else in the highest pitch of any creature's senses cannot understand or attain to it. Its iron color means that it is burdensome and hard for human minds to fear God. For this is a heavy burden for soft and fragile dust, and the human creature rebels against it. 2. Every soul that wisely fears God becomes by faith God's throne. The white cloud above that stone is the clear wisdom of the human mind, and the royal throne above the cloud round in shape is the strong faith of the Christian people. In it God is faithfully recognized, for wherever the fear of the Lord takes root, human wisdom will also appear, and then God's wisdom will set faith above it and prepare his rest in it. For when God is feared, he is understood by faith with the help of human wisdom, and these will touch him as a seat touches its owner, and in them God prepares his seat for himself, supreme above all else. For neither power nor force can comprehend him, but he resides in single-minded and pure faith, one above all things. 3. God's mystery is incomprehensible unless he gives faith to do so. And one is sitting on that throne, living and shining and marvelous in his glory, and so bright that you cannot behold him clearly. He holds to his breast what looks like black and filthy mire, as big as a human heart, surrounded with precious stones and pearls. This is the living God who reigns over all things, shining in goodness and wondrous in his works. The deep mystery of his immense glory can never be perfectly contemplated by anyone unless faith allows that person to comprehend and bear him. As a seat contains and surrounds its owner, as the seat is subject to its owner and cannot rise to throw him off, so faith has no proud desire to look upon God, but only touch him in intimate devotion. 4. In the Father's wisdom, the perfection of the elect is revealed, and to his breast, that is, in the wisdom of his mystery, for love of his Son, he holds that poor, weak, infirm mire that is man, black in the blackness of sin, and filthy in the filthiest of the flesh, but the size of a human heart, which is the breadth and the profound wisdom with which God created man. For he has looked upon those who are saving their souls through penitence, and no matter how in their persistent weakness they have sinned against him, they will come to him at last. They are surrounded by ornaments, those great ones who rise up among them, martyrs and holy virgins like precious stones, and innocent and penitent children of redemption like pearls, so that by them the mire is surpassingly adorned, and by the virtues which so gloriously shine in God, shine also in the human body. For he who put breath of life in man was scrutinizing himself. How? because he foreknew and decided in advance that his son would be incarnate to bring redemption. Therefore, every stain of sin must be washed away from his body. And so, too, he knows the soul which, after many and great sins, while they are still in the body, will end up being justified. 
which after their several errors will walk in God's justice, will be steadfast in him and shake off their forgetfulness, turning from the vices that wounded them in the earthly places where they fell into sin. And he will also take note of the fact that many peoples have arisen from their erring ways and were brought back from the deadly stench of sin. Though they were walking covered with wounds and most dreadful sores, but many will arise who have been wounded so severely by the bitter and harsh pains of sin that their crimes are beyond measure, and their evil habits are ingrained, and they are too ill even to summon the energy to do their deadly works, murder and adultery, and all other evils. 5. Examples from the Gospel O oh, wretches! Do they not approach like pilgrims from the far-off land? As the scripture says in the gospel, the younger son said, I will rise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. Luke fifteen eighteen. This is to say, a person who admonished by the Holy Spirit comes to himself after a fall into sin says, I want to rise up from the unendurable sin whose heavy guilt I can no longer bear. I will retrace my steps in memory, lamenting and sorrowing over my sins until I come to my Father, who is my Father because he created me. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, wronged the celestial work that is myself. You formed me by your will and touched me in creating me so that I should be only celestial in my deeds. But I have belittled myself by shameful actions, and I have sinned before you because I have forsaken the humanity of my nature. How? By my many abominations. Therefore I am guilty both of losing myself and insulting you, and I am not worthy to be called your son. For in the wickedness of my heart I have led your creature in me in a path you did not appoint for me. But now let me be as your servant, redeemed at the price of your son's blood. You gave him at a price so great that not even death can ever repay it. But that price allows penitence to arise from your son's passion, and so set sinners free. I have lost my rightful inheritance as a child of Adam, for he who was created a son in justice was stripped of that joyful glory. But now the blood of your Son and penitence have redeemed the sins of humanity. And thus all should speak who have repeated Adam's fall, but then return through penitence and attain to salvation. They should remember the many warnings they have heard, told from the scriptures about the suffering and the blood of their Redeemer, and recall the lamentation, how they have transgressed the rules of keeping God's word instead of receiving them with longing, for they neglected his law, which was set up for them to keep when the commandments were instituted, and refused to think about what things they should have done, and left undone for fear of the Lord. But they come to the truth nonetheless, remembering what they heard and learned from God, even though they previously were blind, not desiring to know his justice, and avoiding whatever would set that justice they despised above their sins, even though they turned their back on God's word and rejected his law. Many of these will be superabundant in good things. They will not find it sufficient to feast in the house of the Lord, to celebrate his divine office, and work his justice to the fullest, but will always be weeping and woefully remembering the evils they did when they cherished unlawful works and ignored the deeds God's law allowed. 6. The meaning of the mire on the breast, and why the angel may not spurn man. This is the filthy mire that you see on the breast of the loving Father. How? The Son of God went forth from the Father's heart and entered into the world. He is surrounded by the people who believe, and by their decision to believe in Him, hold to Him. And therefore they also appear on the breast of the gentle Father. And thus neither angel nor any other creature may spurn a human being, since the incarnate Son of the Most High God has human form in Himself. For the blessed choir of angels would regard man as unworthy, for he stinks of vice and sin, while those heavenly angels themselves are invulnerable and free from any deed of injustice, except that they continually see the face of the Father and love in the Son what is loved by the Father. 
What is this, that the Son of God was born as a human? For I, the Father, established my Son born of the Virgin for the salvation and restoration of humanity, as my servant the prophet Isaiah says to you. Seven words of Isaiah. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather up the lambs with his arms and raise them to his bosom. And he shall carry those who are with young. Isaiah 40, 11. Which is to say, as a shepherd feeds his flock, so my son the good shepherd feeds the flock of his redeemed. How? He feeds it by his law, which he planted through me. Because my son is human, he will extend his power like his arm and gather together the lambs, who by the innocence of baptism which strips from them the old man and his works are innocent of Adam's sin. And by his virtue and his law, he will take them up into his bosom. How? By lifting them above the height of the heavens and making them members of himself. Therefore, the human form is to be seen as the inmost nature of the deity, where neither angels nor any other creature appear, because my only begotten Son, to redeem the human race, assumed human form in the flesh of a virgin, and he will carry in his heart those who are with young. How? My Son carries human beings in his blood and saves them by his five wounds. For whatever sin they have committed by means of their five senses are washed away by supreme justice when they repent. And he carries them so because he was incarnate and suffered wounds on the cross and died and was buried and rose again from the dead. And he has stretched out his hand to them and drawn them back to himself. How? When he assumed humanity for them, though they thought they were lost when Adam fell. For my only begotten conquered death, and it could no longer triumph over them. And so he knew them in the power of his glory, and knew that they were to come to him by the purgation of penance. And you see them appear in the bosom of the Father. This means that the Son of Man is perfected with all his members in the secret heart of his Father. How? Because when the world reaches its end, the elect of Christ, who are his members, are to be perfected. Oh, how beautiful is he, as the psalmist says, 8, the words of David. Beautiful of form above the children of men, Psalm 44, 3. This is to say, in him shines the beauty beyond beauty, the noblest form, free from any spot of sin, without a splash of human corruption, and lacking all desire for the sinful works demanded by the fleshly human weakness. None of these ever touched this man. And the body of the Son of Man was born more purely than any other people, for the stainless virgin bore her son in ignorance of sin, and thus ignorant of the sorrow of childbirth. How? She never felt any stubborn urge to sin, and therefore the pain of childbirth were unknown to her, but the wholeness of her body rejoiced within her. Oh, how beautiful then his body! But let the people know that his bodily beauty was no greater than the profound wisdom that established his human form. For the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, does not delight in the beauty of the flesh, but in the humility with which the Son of God clothed himself in humanity. And in his form there were no exterior blemishes. Sometimes, as ordinary person is given by God, an ugly appearance as bodies go, so when his limbs are distorted and mishappen, and he is crippled. This is not because nature so forms human bodies, but because God's judgment. A strong nature is expressed in a proper form, and a weak one in various deformities. But the latter was not the case with my son. Humans, I say, are widely divergent in body form. They can be black, ugly, polluted, leprous, dropsical, full of defects. They can also be persuaded by devilish art into becoming inflamed with sorcery, stupid, blind to the good things of the Lord, or forgetful to what they should praise and what they should blame. For they should do the works of justice, but they do the works of the evil and omit the good, despising the cross and martyrdom of their Lord. But God the Father contemplates this work of mire with the purpose of his goodness, as a father looks at his children when he hugs them to his breast, and because he is God, he has the love of a tender father for his children. For so great is his heart's inmost love for people,
that he sent his son to the cross like a meek lamb that is carried to the slaughter, and so the son brought back the lost sheep, bearing them on his shoulder by assuming humanity, which caused him great suffering, for he deigned to die for his flock. But among these people there are many surrounded by ornaments and adorned pricelessly with virtue. They are the martyrs, the virgins, the innocents, and the penitents. And as I said before, and those who have obeyed their masters, and those who accuse themselves of their sins and tirelessly strive to punish themselves for them, denying the self in them, and who or where these elect are must not be stated, for the number of them all have been reckoned. Does anyone think it possible to see into the deep wisdom of the Most High, and into the discernment of His knowledge, and count the number of those who are to be saved? His judgments are incomprehensible to all people. Your task is to run, for the kingdom of God is prepared for you. For as great as is the zeal of the faithful, washed in baptism and known in faith to fulfill God's justice, so great also shall be their reward. 9. The Father does, ordains, and perfects all His works through His Son. But you see that from the one seated upon the throne extends a great circle colored gold like the dawn, whose width you cannot take in. This means that from the Almighty Father there extends a supremely strong power and action, whose might encircles all things, and he works it through his Son, who is always with him in the majesty of divinity, ordaining and perfecting all his works through him before all the worlds and in the world from the start. His sun glows with the brilliant beauty of the dawn, for he was incarnated in the wisest virgin, whom the dawn signifies, by the hand of God, which is the Holy Spirit, in whom also each work of the Father is done. You can never comprehend the full extent of his glory, for no creature has, will have, or should have a standard of goodness or power with which to measure his power or his deeds. God's power is inestimable and incomprehensible, and his works are invincible and marvelous. 10. On the Revolving Circle And that circle wheels about from the east to the north, to the west, to the south, and back towards the east to the one on the throne, and has no end. This is to say that God's power and his work encircles and includes every creature. How? All creatures arose in the will of the Father who is one God, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, and all feel Him in His power. How? They all feel Him in their creation. He wheels around from the east in the origin of all justice into the north where the devil is confounded, and to the west where the darkness of death tries to extinguish the light, but the light conquers it and rises again, and to the south where the ardor of God's justice burns in the hearts of the faithful, and so back to the rising of justice as to the east. What does this mean? When in God's foreordained time his work shall have been completed in the people of his world, then the circuit of the world will have been made, and the perfection of time in the last day will arrive, and then each work of God seated in his throne without end will shine resplendent in his elect, for God is perfect in his power and his work who was, and is, and ever shall be, and his divinity has no beginning, so that it is not that he will have been, but that he is. 11. God's power is greater than man can know, and why the angels praise him. And that circle is so high above the earth that you cannot apprehend it. This is to say that the supreme power is so far exalted above the lives of all creatures and above the senses of the intellect of man, and so incomprehensible in and above all that no creature's senses can grasp it, except to realize that this power is much higher than it can know. And therefore the angels sing to God in praise, for they see him in his power and glory, but they also cannot understand or sense him completely, and they can never have enough of his magnitude or his beauty. 12. God is manifest justice, true and just, without alteration. But that it shines with a terrifying radiance, the color of stone, steel, and fire, this means that the divine power radiates formidable 
and severe virtue against iniquity that is dissimulated, impenitent, or unpunished. This strength is like steel because God's manifest justice yields nothing to weak injustice, whereas dust, as the saying goes, is unjust and does not please God. His justice, like steel, strengthens all other justice, which is weaker than it is, as iron is weaker than steel. And this strength is like fire, for he himself is the fire of judgment, burning up all sin and injustice which refuses to bow down before him and seek his mercy. And God is like the rock in man, for he is true and just without any alteration. As stone cannot be changed into softness, he is like steel, piercing everything with his all-penetrating gaze, never changing but remaining God of all things. And he is also like fire, because he inflames and enkindles and illuminates all things without changing over time, for he is God. 13. God's strength, justice, and judgment have no boundary, man can sense. And you see that this radiance extends everywhere, from the heights of heaven to the depths of the abyss, so that you cannot see any end of it. This is to say that the strength of God's power and work, his justice, and his upright judgment are everywhere. And neither in the heights of heaven nor in the depths of the abyss is there any boundary to them that human senses can comprehend. 14. Why and how the first angel and his followers fell. Then you see a great star, splendid and beautiful, coming forth from the one seated on the throne. And with that star comes a great multitude of shining sparks. For by the command of the Almighty Father, the angel Lucifer, who now is Satan, came forth from his beginnings, adorned with great glory and clothed with brightness and beauty. And with him came all the lesser lights that were his followers, who then shone with brightness, but now are extinguished in darkness. But he was inclined toward evil and did not look on me, the perfect one. He trusted in himself and thought he could begin anything he wished and finish anything he began. Thus the great honor he owed to the one on the throne, who was his creator, he gave to himself, and so descended into sin. But all the sparks that followed the stars towards the south look on the one seated on the throne like a stranger. They turn away from him and stare toward the north instead of contemplating him. This is to say that Lucifer and all his company, who were miraculously created by the ardent goodness of God, had a secret sin, which was that their pride disdained the one who reigns in heaven. All of them, formed at the beginning of creation, tasted the impiety that leads to perdition, and contemplated God not in order to know his goodness, but in order to exalt themselves above him as if he were a stranger. In their open elation, they turned away from knowledge of him, and his glory, and hastened towards their fall. But in the very act of turning away their gaze, they are all extinguished, and are changed into black cinders, which is to say that as soon as they disdained to know God, the splendid brilliance with which the divine power has clothed them was extinguished in Lucifer himself, and all the followers of his malice, And he destroyed in himself the inner beauty that was his consciousness of good. And he gave himself over to impiety. He was erased from the eternal glory and fell into eternal loss. Therefore, they were all changed into black cinders, stripped of their bright splendor along with their leader, the devil. They were smothered in darkness and deprived of the glory of beatitude, like a dead coal without its smoldering spark. Then a whirlwind arises from those cinders, which drives them away from the south, behind the one sitting on the throne, and carries them to the north, where they are precipitated into the abyss and vanish from your sight. This is to say that when these angels of iniquity tried to prevail over God and oppress him with their pride, the wind of impiety that arose in them was belched forth in bitter perdition and blew them backward, from the south, 
which means from goodness, into the north, which means into forgetfulness of God, the ruler of all. Thus, when they tried to exalt themselves in pride, they were confounded and met their downfall, and they were precipitated by their pride into the abyss of eternal death, which is their doom, never again to be seen in brightness. Even so did I tell the noonday forest, which should ardently have borne the fruit of justice and did not, but my servant Ezekiel, 15, words of Ezekiel. Behold, I will kindle a fire in you and will burn in you every green tree and every dry tree. The flame of the fire shall not be quenched and every face shall be burned in it from the south to the north and all flesh shall see that it is I, the Lord, who have kindled it and it shall not be quenched. Ezekiel twenty forty seven through 48 which is to say, O fool, who raised yourself up in pride against me, who have neither beginning nor end, will bring this to pass. In my zeal, I will kindle in you the fire of my wrath and burn up all your vigor with which you have tried to begin a work, trusting in your false energy more than in me and choosing to act as your pride dictated on your own foolish wisdom. And I will burn up in you all your dryness the aridity which belongs to your sin and that of the other lost ones and in which you attempt humanity which is ashes to sin and this temptation will not bring you back salvation but will become in you eternal fire there is no reward of salvation for you or those who follow your example and the fire of punishment shall not be quenched or abate its tortures but will burn up that headlong pride in which you looked upon the face of honor and tried to seize it for yourself. And thus were you ejected from all your glory. You rose in the south in clear and ardent light, but you set in the darkness of the north, which is to say, in hell. And everyone shall see this and know Gehenna, both the elect and the reprobate. The elect will know Gehenna because they have escaped it, and the reprobate because they will remain in it and be punished, knowing that it is the place that I, the Lord Almighty, have kindled in retribution for your crimes, O devil. And it will not be extinguished by your evil deeds or those of your followers. So the sin of diabolical pride has cast Satan and his angels into the outer darkness of eternal torment without any comfort from light, so that there is no place for them in the eternal light, and you, frail human, cannot see them there any longer, as Ezekiel, imbued with my spirit, says with mystical significance to the king of Tyre. All who see you among the nations will be astonished at you. You are brought to naught, and you shall not be forever, Ezekiel twenty-eight nineteen, which is to say, all the upright of heart, O devil, will be astounded at your filthiness, seeing you drunken with the vices of the nations who embrace you and transgress the laws of God and wither away. For you pollute with temptation God's temple, which is man. And so through your pride you are brought to naught and fall from the glory of salvation. For you have no honor and no felicity, and no glory shall be yours in the eternity of heaven. You are lost from them forever without end. 16. The glory lost by the devil and the others was saved by the Father. But when they are extinguished, you see the light that was taken from them immediately return to him who sits on the throne. That is to say that when the devil, because of his pride and obstinacy, lost his exceeding brilliance, for Lucifer was of purer light than all the other angels, and whence the seed of death entered into him, and all his followers, that brilliance returned to God the Father to be kept in his secret heart. For the glory of that splendor was not allowed to go for nothing, but God kept it as a light for another of his creations. For God, who commanded one variety of his creatures to arise without flesh, yet bright in splendor, namely the devil and his company, kept this splendor for the mire that he formed into man who arose covered with a vile earthly nature, that he might not exalt himself into the likeness of God. For the one created in bright splendor and not clothed in the miserable form as humans are, 
could not sustain his self-exaltation. There is only one eternal God without beginning or end, and thus comparing oneself to God is the wickedest of all crimes. And so I, the God of heaven, kept the illustrious light, which departed from the devil because of his crime, and hid it within myself until I gave it to the mire of the earth, which I had formed in my image and likeness, as does a human being when his son dies, and his inheritance cannot pass to children of his. When he has no children to inherit, the father holds the inheritance and plans to give it to the children yet unborn. And when they are born from him, he gives it to them. 17. The devil fell without leaving an heir, but fallen man had one. For the devil fell without leaving an heir, which is to say without the intention of doing good works. He never accomplished or began anything good, and therefore another received his inheritance. This other also fell, but did have an heir, which was the beginning of obedience. And he received this inheritance with devotion, even though he could not complete the work that went with it. But then God's grace completed that work in the incarnation of the Savior of the nations and restored the good inheritance. So man receives his inheritance in Christ, because he did not reject God's commandments when they were first given, whereas the devil did not want to serve the Creator for good, but to vaunt his own pride, and so was deprived of the glory and perished in perdition. 18. Example of Goliath and David As Goliath rose up despising David, so the devil rose up presuming upon himself and wanting to be like the Most High. And as Goliath was unaware of David's strength and despised him as nothing, so the devil's towering pride despised the humility of the Son of God's humanity. When he was born into this world and sought not his own glory, but in all things the glory of the Father. How? The devil did not seek to imitate this example and submit himself to his Creator as the Son of God submitted himself to his Father. But David, with the secret strength given to him by God, cut off Goliath's head. And as it is written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, And David, taking the head of the Philistine, carried it into Jerusalem, but his arm he placed in his own tent. 1 King 17.54 This is to say, my son took the spoils and booty of the devil with his great power and deprived the ancient serpent of his head, where? In the womb of the virgin, who crushed that head. Through whom? Through her son. What is this crushing? The holy humility, which appears both in the mother and in the son, and struck at the origin of pride, which is the head of the devil. And so in his humility, my son in his body carried that head into the holy church, which is the vision of peace, and showed it that the pride of the devil had been slain. The strong arm of the devil's stubborn vices by which he had overcome the human race and made them worship him as God, for he had terrified them by his vices, as people are terrified by arms. But my son broke them and placed them in his tent, that is, in the passion of his body, while he suffered on the cross. So now he lets the battle continue among the tents, which are the bodies of his chosen members, and that they may divide with him the devil's arms. How? As he conquered the devil in his passion, they too may conquer him by restraining themselves from their desires and not being in harmony with his vices. And to extend the metaphor, as the glory of Goliath was given to David, so the glory that was taken from the first angel was given by me to Adam and his race, which confesses me and keeps my precepts after the devil's pride was destroyed. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings, ardently love my reflection, and pant after my words, and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 2. The Edifice of Salvation Then I saw, within the circumference of the circle, which extended from the one seated on the throne, a great mountain, joined at its root to that immense block of stone above which 
were the cloud and the throne with its occupant, so that the stone was continued on a great height, and the mountain was extended down to a wide base. And on the mountain stood a four-sided building, formed in the likeness of a four-walled city. It was placed at an angle so that one of its corners faced the east, one faced the west, one the north, and one the south. The building had one wall around it, but made of two materials. One was a shining light like the light of the sky, and the other was stone joined together. These two materials met at the east and north corners, so that the shining part of the wall went uninterrupted from the east corner to the north corner, and the stone part went from the north corner around the west and south corners and ended on the east corner. But the part of the wall was interrupted in two places, on the west side and on the south side. This building was a hundred cubits long and fifty cubits wide, so that the two side walls were of equal length, and the front and back walls were of equal length. But the four walls were equal in height except for the bulwarks, which were somewhat taller. And between the building and the light of the circle, which extended from the height of the abyss, at the top of the east corner was only a palm's breadth. But at the top of the west and south corners, the breadth of the separation between the buildings and the light was so great that I could not grasp its extent. And as I was marveling, the one seated on the throne again said to me, 1. Faith rose in the circumcision of Abraham and climaxed in the Incarnation. Faith appeared faintly in the saints of the Old Testament who did that justice which was constructed on high in the goodness of the Father. But at the incarnation of the Son of God, it burst into burning light by the open manifestation of ardent deeds. For the Son of God did not desire transitory things, and taught by example that they should be trampled underfoot and only celestial things loved. The early patriarchs did not flee or separate themselves from the world, for it had not yet been shown to them that they should forsake all things, but they worshipped God with simple faith and humble devotion. Therefore you see within the circumference of the circle, which extends from the one seated on the throne, a great mountain joined at its root, to the immense block of stone above which are the cloud and the throne with its occupant so that the stone is continued on a great height, and the mountain is extended down a wide base. This is to say that the mountain which signifies faith stands within the mighty and strongly built power of the Supreme Father. This faith, great in virtue, first appeared in the circumcision of Abraham, and progressed until the coming of the Supreme Son of God. Since the ancient serpent was ruined, this faith has been inspired in people by the Holy Spirit, faithfully working in the Father. They can believe that God is Almighty, who could conquer so great an enemy, and uplifted by this belief, they can attain to the glory from which the devil was cast out for his pride. 2. Faith and fear of the Lord are joined to one another. And this mountain is rooted in its immense stone which holds the mystery of the fear of the Lord. For faith is connected to constant fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord to the strength of faith. This is because the Son was sent from the Father to be born of the Virgin, and from the Son came forth true faith, which was the first foundation of the good works that fear of the Lord brings forth with all of its virtues, whose height touches God. And so in the wise minds of the faithful, God who reigns over all things is faithfully worshipped. How? Because fear of the Lord with its sharp contemplative sights penetrates the secrets of heaven. For fear is the beginning of the just intention. And when that flowers into sanctity by good works, it joins with blessed faith and reaches God in full perfection. 3. The faithful build good works on faith in all four corners of the earth. And on the mountain stands a four-sided building, formed like the likeness of a four-walled city, 
This is to say that the goodness of the Father builds good works on faith, gathering multitudes of the faithful from the four corners of the earth. He draws them to celestial things and fortifies them in his constancy of virtue. Then the Heavenly Father graciously places them in his bosom, which is to say in his inner power and his mystical counsel in four categories of faith. How? Four. On the four categories. I, who am the most high ordained in my work, the first category of people, the race of Adam, which race after his death went on weakened by great discord until the second arose. This was the coming of Noah. When the flood took place, in which by the ark I foretold the mysteries of my son, but in the time of Noah my commandments, I showed the shining part of the wall of the building. By drowning sinners in the flood, I implied to them that they should flee death and seek life, and thus open to them the knowledge of the choice between the two ways. What does this mean? A person flourishes and thrives in the living life, which is the soul, and in it he contemplates and sees two ways, good and evil. Either way is open to him, so that while he is in the body, he can do good or evil with soul and body starting with the mental choices and perfecting his will in his deeds. And so in Noah, by my command, there was shown the knowledge of the choice between the two ways and a sharp warning to spurn evil and love good. And with the decree of circumcision, this anticipation of God's will lead to the third category in which Abraham and Moses were united in circumcision and the law. Circumcision and the law continued until the fourth category, the time of the Holy Trinity, when the Old Testament was openly fulfilled in the Son of God. And so through the Son of God, an inner shoot arose in the church. He was born and suffered for human salvation, rose again and returned to the Father, and so restored that corner of the wall that had been obscured and weakened by Adam's fall, building it up again with saved human souls. 5. People must go forward humbly and wisely flee the devil's snares. But the fact that the building is placed at an angle means that man, who is the work of God, is too weak to go forward by conquering the devil by force. Without fear of sin or bodily harm, he must humbly avoid the devil and wisely flee his snares and faithfully unite himself to good works. Thus he will be established on the Son of God, who sits in the corner and is the cornerstone, and thus join himself to the work of human salvation. 6. The four corners of the building and what they mean. But one of its corners faces the east, and one faces the west, and the north, and the south. This means the following. The Son of God was born to the Virgin and suffered in the flesh, that justice might arise and humanity be restored to life with all justice. And that is the eastern corner. From it arose the salvation of souls, when in his Son God fulfilled justice, which was prefigured from the time of Abel till the coming of the Son himself. And in him was ended the physical observance of the law in the Old Testament. Then came the salvation of faithful people by their faith, which in the last times the Son of God, who was sent by the Father, brought into the world, which is the western corner. In Abraham and in Moses, justice raised itself against the devil, and they foreshadowed the promised grace through which man was saved. Though the devil has deceived him and slain him like a robber in Adam's fall, which is the northern corner, and the wretched and fatal fall of the human race was at last through heavenly grace nobly and beautifully restored, and the ardent work of God and man bore full fruit, which is the southern corner. 7. Another meaning of the corners. The southern corner also means that the first man, Adam, was created by God, but the knowledge of the choice of the two roads does not come from this corner which means that from Adam on the human race was disorderly and did not worship God in wisdom by eager service to the law, but did its own will in great evil. It did not grow with the knowledge of God or true beatitude, but lay in death. But what the Father willed to do with the human race lay hidden only in his heart. 
The eastern corner designates Noah, in whom justice began to show itself. Thus there was openly manifested and foreshadowed the knowledge of sanctity that would later be perfected in the Son of God. And because in the Son of God, who is the true Orient, every kind of justice began, and for the sake of his sanctity and honor, first truly declared in Noah, the building should always be named starting at the east. The northern corner also means Abraham and Moses, who, working against Satan, surrounded the knowledge as if with precious stones, and roofed it in with the golden roof of God's manifest justice, which was circumcision of the law. For before circumcision of the law, justice was naked and without deeds. And the fourth, the western corner, also means the true trinity, which showed itself when the Savior was baptized, and he returned to heaven with all his works to save souls, and built there the true holy city Jerusalem. 8. God gives people fortification and defenses of their good works. The building has one wall around it, but made of two materials. One is the shining light in the light of the sky, and the other is stone joined together. These two materials meet at the east and north corners. This is to say that the goodness of the Father gives people unbroken security in the form of a fortification and defense of their good works. And thus, surrounded and strengthened by them, people may forsake the lusts of the flesh and fly to the one God, who is their protection. The wall is of two materials. The first is the knowledge of the choice of the two roads, which is given to people when they speculate and think clearly with their mind to make them circumspect in all their affairs. And the second is earthly human flesh, for people were created by God to do active deeds. 9. On the Reflective Knowledge And the knowledge shines as brightly as daylight because through it people know and judge their actions. And the human mind that is carefully considering itself is radiant. For this beautiful knowledge appears in people like a white cloud and passes through the human mind as swiftly as the cloud moves through the air. And it shines like daylight, because when God graciously does his most splendid work in humans, and they avoid evil, the good they accomplish is as bright in them as the day. And every human deed proceeds from this knowledge. How? Each person can have two ways. How? With his sensibilities, he knows good and evil. And when he moves away from evil by doing good, he imitates God, who works good in himself who is just and knows no injustice. But when he does evil, the wily devil entangles him in sins, for the devil seeks iniquity and flees sanctity, and will not rest until he holds the person bound by evil deeds. But if the person breaks free of evil and does good, the supreme goodness will receive him, for he has conquered himself for the love of God, who handed over his son for him by his death on the cross. This knowledge is reflective because it is like a mirror. For as a person sees his face in a mirror and discerns beauty or blemishes, so too in the finished deeds he ponders within himself, he can knowingly discern good and evil. For this discernment is part of the reason with which God inspires man when he breathed life in the soul and into his body. The life of animals is deficient. Because it is not rational, the human soul is never deficient. But because of its rationality, it will live forever. And so a person contemplating good and evil knows whether a deed is a wicked or a good one. Who was formed by the grace of God and given reason at the beginning of creation. And in the choice of baptism and the salvation of souls in the New Testament, he is restored by that same grace. As my most loving Paul says, about this election of grace. 10. Words of Paul There is a remnant saved according to the election of grace, and if by grace it is not by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Romans 11, 5-6 This is to say, the remnant who are not inside the snare of death shall not stoop to the devil's example. For they were openly saved when God sent his Son to become incarnate. And this is the election of grace manifest for human salvation. How? 
the grace of God created man, but by evil works he fell. Then the election of grace was shown in the chosen vessel, for the Son of God was born from the virgin, and it was not possible for him to lapse. For if a person makes something useful for himself and is taken away from him by someone else, he will get himself something even more useful that no one will take and be content with it. And this is the way the grace of God acted. It made Adam the first man, and the devil drew him away from innocent deeds. But the grace brought the fullness of good works and the salvation of souls through the Son of God. But if the grace of God was the cause of salvation, then it was not by the merit of any human deed. How? There was no justice in Adam's deeds. Therefore, humanity would never have returned to salvation by the merit of his works, except that it was restored by grace through the work of the just Son, who was obedient to his Father and cleansed by baptism, which the Son of God gave to humanity along with good works. So in this work, the grace of God collaborates with humanity and humanity with it, and therefore the grace of God goes with his work. And the work has arisen from grace. But if salvation arose from human merit and righteous human deeds stemmed from the people themselves and not the grace of God, grace would no longer be grace. How? Because then man would stem from himself and not from God, and no creature would give thanks to God, and the grace of God would be nothing. But as it is, the grace of God has given people the support of reason, that they may work justice in the knowledge of good and evil. And by this knowledge they can seek the good and cast away the evil, and so know life and death and choose which one to stay with, as Solomon says in his Knowledge of Wisdom. 11. Words of Solomon He has set before you water and fire. Stretch forth your hand to which you will. Ecclesiasticus 15.17 That is to say, when the soul awakens, God gives it a great and acute power, the knowledge of evil and good, which are water and fire. For as water overflows and conceals in its depth deadly creatures and useless things, so a person overflows with evil deeds and conceals them, lest he be discovered. And as fire burns and leaves no impurity unconsumed, or as a craftsman purifies jewelry by fire to remove its rust, so too does good purify a person, melting the rust of wickedness off him. Now water and fire are inimical extinguished or evaporating each other and so too does a person he kills good by evil and evil by good in either way he silently hides his desires within himself and turns them over in his mind 12 on the works of the two motives and while he is mulling over the desires the person's will makes its choice of the way he wants to go and he stretches out his hand to it and moves along it by his deeds. He does good works by God's help through grace, and he does evil by the devil's craft and his artful temptations. And the person himself observes his deeds by the exercise of his reason. With this reason he contemplates good and evil, and the desire rises in him to choose between the two ways, good and evil, according to his will. What does this mean? The person has the choice in that his mind's desires reflect different things to him like a mirror. And he says to himself, if only I could do this or that. He has not yet done them in actuality, but he has thought about them. So he stands at the fork of two roads with knowledge of the motives of good or evil. And as he desires, so at last he does and travels upward or downward. 13. Righteous Institutions arose in Abraham and Moses. And the other part of the wall, as you see, is like stones joined together, which symbolizes the human race, but also designates the righteous institutions that came from the mind of people like Abraham, Moses, and the others, who were the preliminary offshoots of the law of God in all its just additions up to the end of time. How? God works in man and through man, Thus he sent his son to save humanity at the end of, of the law, working in a sinless human body. 
And he took the foundation of faith on himself and carried the whole human race with him, even the first man who was cast out of paradise for transgressing justice. And he achieved this wondrous deed for humanity through his law, in which he embraced all Christians. And they make up this building in the goodness of the Father, because man will live in the celestial Jerusalem. 14. Reflective knowledge began in Noah, but iniquity reigned uninterrupted. So the two kinds of walls join each other on the east and on the north. For reflective knowledge and human labor join together to end the injustice in which the human race was entangled when it forgot God. From Adam arose the raging injustice of the world before the flood. And because of the world's iniquity, the injustice was drowned with the people in the flood of waters. And then reflective knowledge first appeared, by my inspiration, in Noah's knowledge of good, as in the east corner, as was foretold. But though God's admonition flourished in Noah, bold and greedy evil arose again and marched triumphantly to the north. And the iniquity of division from God was not trodden underfoot until Abraham, in whom, as in the north corner, it was choked off, and the penetrating light of God's justice arose. And truly, the shining part of the wall goes uninterruptedly from the east corner to the north corner. This is to say that reflective knowledge to fortify human minds first appeared in the east corner, that is, in the day of Noah, before Noah, Iniquity sought to do all it could to mock God, and so people followed their own lusts instead of loving to worship God. And the first descendants of Adam were completely devoured by the devil because the knowledge was hidden from them, until in Noah that knowledge was displayed openly. This had been foreshadowed even when the devil was confident that the whole human race was in his power. But iniquity went on as far as the north corner, that is, until the coming of Abraham and Moses. For before them, iniquity still reigned almost supreme, not yet interrupted or defeated by the established justice of God's law, since the circumcision and the law had not yet been given. But by these fathers, the devil began to be confounded, where previously he had reigned confidently in the world, in the words of Paul, my light-giving vessel of election. 15. Words of Paul. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the same way as Adam, who was a type of him who was to come, Romans 5.14, which is to say death reigned with no competitors or conquerors from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. How? Before Moses, the severity and dignity of the law had not yet been given, except the small preview of it in the circumcision Abraham accomplished. By God's command. And so deathly vice went from error to error as it pleased. But then by God's will there arose the strong soldier Moses, and he prepared stout weapons of justice which destroyed the worship of death by means of the law, which contained in itself the complete salvation of souls, because it foreshadowed the Son of God. Death indeed even ruled the innocent who were simple and moderate and did not repeat in their actions the deeds of Adam. And Adam was a type of him who was to come. How? God created Adam just and innocent of all thought or deed of sin. And so too the Son of God was born in the Virgin Mary with no stain of sin. 16. Righteousness is shown in Abraham and Moses, justice in the Incarnation. But you see that the stone part goes from the north corner around the west and south corners and ends in the east corner. This means that the righteous works of humans with which God fortified them came forth from the north corner, which is to say from the circumcision of Abraham and the law of Moses and the justice they inspired in people. They continued to the west corner where open justice arose in the incarnation of the Son of God went on from there to the south corner, where through baptism and the other just works of the new chosen bride of the Son of God, ardent deeds were enkindled to restore Adam to salvation, and at last returned to the east corner, to end restored to the Supreme Father. 
in his mystery ordained every work of justice and would bring the first fallen man back into salvation by the return to God. How? Man had fallen, and so I arose in mercy and sent my son to restore salvation to souls, and my servant, the psalmist David, shows, saying, 17 words of David, His will is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he shall meditate day and night, Psalms 1, 2, which is to say that the will of the Father to save is contained in the law of justice. His only begotten Son showed to the world, who is one God with the Father and the Holy Spirit and rules the whole globe. And he, the Son of the Father, was incarnate and seen as a visible man, and in the flesh was lifted above all creatures. How? The Son of God was begotten of his Father before all worlds, and later, in the last times born, was begotten of his Father before all worlds, and later, in the last times born into the world of a mother. But while he was not yet incarnate, he remained invisible within the Father, as the will is invisible in a person before it is shown in a deed, and then later appeared visibly in the flesh for human salvation. So the Almighty Father meditates with his Son upon an act of justice to counter the original fall of Adam, where, in the love of his Son, who was before time began in the Father and the glory of divinity, and then became miraculously incarnate at the appointed epoch of the world, when the Father sent him from his heart into the world as the high priest of all justice. Therefore the Son embodied the law of justice, and he received it from the Father when Christian law was made. And on that law, which the Father willed to establish and make through his Son, he meditates by day, how he himself is the day. And in that day before he made any transitory creature, and while no darkness or iniquity existed in any creature of his, he meditated on his son's law. And also by night, how? Because when evil arose in his creatures, which is like the darkness of night in angels and people, the father continued to meditate and will to do so until the last day, as long as his ineffable work shall last. He shows that and reveals the law of his Son, when in him he perfects all the good deeds that are to be perfected in man. 18. Christ's members and the church still lack the perfection they will have. But you see that the stone part of the wall is interrupted in two places, on the west side and on the south side. This is to say that the work of the human race to fortify its defenses is still unfinished in two areas. The members of the Son of God, his chosen, remain imperfect, which is to say that the west side is interrupted, since from there the Son of God was sent in these last times, in these last time, into the world, and the church is still imperfect in virtue, not as she will be set up and established in the celestial Jerusalem, so that the south side is interrupted, for the church will be perfected in heaven. 19. The number 10, diminished by Adam, is multiplied again by Christ. This building is a hundred cubits long, which means that the mystical number 10 was diminished by humanity when it transgressed, but was restored by my son, but multiplied by 10 to 100 as virtues were multiplied in the salvation of souls. And from the hundred, again multiplied by the 10, there will come the perfect number, 1,000 referring to the virtues that will completely destroy the thousand arts of the devil, which now seduce the whole flock of Almighty God's loving sheep. What does this mean? I, the Omnipotent, in the beginning made lights that burned and lived, shining in splendor, some of which stood fast in my love, but some despised me, their creator, and fell. But it did not befit me, the creator, to discard what I had made as useless and ruined, How a part of the angelic creation grew proud of the good the Creator gave to it, that it might know Him, and decided that it could take on false glory and be like its Creator. And so it fell into death. Then God foresaw that what had fallen in this lost group could be more firmly restored in another. How? He created man from the mud of the earth, living in soul and body, to attain to that glory from which the apostate devil and his followers were cast out. Man is thus exceedingly dear to God, 
who made him truly in his own image and likeness. He was to exercise all the virtues in the perfection of holiness, as indeed God formed all creatures to do, and to work in humble obedience, to do acts of virtue, and so to fulfill the function of praise among the more glorious orders of angels. And thus, in this height of blessedness, he was to augment the praise of heavenly spirits who praise God with assiduous devotion, and so fill up the place left empty by the lost angel who fell in his presumption. And so man symbolizes the number ten, perfecting these things by the power of God. But in this figure ten is multiplied by a hundred. For man was seduced by the devil and fell away from God, but at last he was admonished by divine mercy and inspiration, began to acknowledge God in the law and prophecy of the Old Testament, and then attained more insight by the sanctity and the means of constancy and virtue given by the church. And so, starting with Abel, man began to practice all the virtues, and will continue to perfect them until the day of the last just person. And this is why the length of this building is the number 100, which God shows to humanity in a mystical figure that it may not despair if it falls back into iniquity, but rise above it and vigorously do the work of God. For anyone who falls into sin but then rises again will be stronger than he was before, as God gave greater and stronger virtues to humanity by sending his Son into the world to raise up the prostrate human race than it had had before. And therefore people work more strongly in soul and body than if they had no difficulty in doing it, since they struggle against themselves in many perils. And waging these fierce wars together with the Lord God who fights faithfully for them, they conquer themselves, chastising their bodies, and so know themselves to be in his army. But an angel lacking the hardships of an earthly body is a soldier of heaven only in its harmonious lucid and pure constancy and seeing God, while a human handicapped by the filth of his body is a strong, glorious, and holy soldier in the work of restoration, which he does in soul and body for the sake of God. And so by the number 100 of his present labor, he attains to 1,000 of future repayment. On the last day, he will receive his full and eternal reward, and rejoice in soul and body without end in the celestial habitations. And so the diminished ten is recovered through my son, who was born of the Virgin and suffered on the cross and brought back humanity to the realms of heaven, as my son says in the Gospel. 20. Words of the Gospel What woman has ten coins? If she loses one of them, does not light a candle and sweep the house until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my coin that was lost. Luke 15, 8 through 9. Which is to say, the holy divinity has ten coins, namely ten orders of the heavenly hierarchy, including the chosen angels and man. It lost one coin when man fell into death by following the devil's temptation instead of the divine precepts. Hence, the divinity kindled a burning lamp, namely Christ, who was true God and true man, and the splendid son of justice. And with him he swept the house, namely the Jewish people, and searched the law for all the meaning of salvation, and established a new sanctification, and found his coin, man, whom he had lost. Then he called together his friends, namely earthly deeds of justice, and his neighbors, namely spiritual virtues, and said, Rejoice with me in praise and joy in Build the celestial Jerusalem with living stones, for I have found man, who had perished by the deception of the devil. 21. The five wounds of Christ wipe out human sins. And you see that the building is fifty cubits wide. This is to say that the whole breadth of the vices of humanity, which should have built on and revered the work of God, but instead followed its own lusts, is mercifully wiped out and forgiven by the five wounds that my son suffered on the cross. So the wounds of his hands obliterated the deeds of disobedience done by the hands of Adam and Eve, and the wounds of his feet cleared the path of exile. 
for humanity to return, and the wound of his side from which sprang the church wiped out the sin of Eve and Adam after Eve was made from Adam's side, and therefore my son was nailed to the tree to abolish what had been done through the tree that occasioned sin, and therefore he drank vinegar and gall to take away the taste of the harmful fruit. 22. The Holy Spirit made man's five senses able to know good and evil. The wall is five cubits high, which refers to the virtue of divine knowledge of the scripture, which imbue man's five senses for the sake of the work of God. The Holy Spirit breathed on them for people's good. For with the five senses people can regard the height of divinity and discern both good and evil. 23. Soul and body must work to avoid evil and do good in all circumstances. Thus the two side walls are of equal length. For contained within the edifice of God's goodness, people must work with great constancy with the two side walls of soul and body flanking them. How? To avoid evil and do good. How? The profound and incomprehensible power of God created man to worship God with all his strength and all his might and with all his devotion of his intelligent reason. And it is right that the creator of all things should before and above everything be worshipped worthily as God. 24. The mind must have the wisdom and discernment to know God. Therefore the front and back walls are of equal length. For in the work of God, wisdom and discretion are like two walls, with wisdom as the higher part and discretion as the lower. And God imbues the whole of the human mind with these, an equitable and just gift, that the mind may know him. 25. People should gain devout faith from considering the four elements. But the four walls are equal in height, except for the bulwarks, which are somewhat taller. That is to say that man living as he does among the four elements should hold high the Catholic faith with constant devotion and veneration through the goodness of the Father. He should worship the Son with the Father and the Holy Spirit as the Son does all their works in them. How? Every work that the Son of God has done and is doing, he perfects through the goodness of the Father and the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? According to the will of the Father, the Son, in his great goodness, redeemed humanity through his incarnation. For the Father ordained that the Son should be born of the Virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and assume humanity for love of man to bring him back to restored life. Therefore, man has a part in God and can enter into salvation with him. If he has the true Catholic faith and knows the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the one true God. 26. The faithful person ascends from virtue to virtue. The bulwarks are much higher. How? Because when a person regards the height of goodness in his mind, he then builds a high wall of faith by virtue of the work of God. Then he ascends above the rational faith which shows him God in the power of his divinity. And on it he builds bulwarks of virtue higher than the wall. How? He finds that it is not enough to have faith in God, and so builds virtue that rises higher. And so he grows, like a flourishing palm tree, from virtue to virtue. And by these virtues his righteous faith is exalted and adorned as bulwarks do a city. 27. The Father sent his Son into the world to do his will and redeem man. And between the building and the light of the circle, which extends from the height to the abyss, at the top of the east corner there is only a palm's breadth. This is the width of the heavenly secrets that lie between the work of the Son of God when he lived in the world and did divine works. Here shown as a building, and the power of the Father which expands in mighty splendor into the places below and the places above. He sent his Son into the world to be the capstone of the corner that faces east, made up of the justice first prefigured in Noah and perfected in the incarnation of the Son. Thus these secrets were, so to speak, just a hand's breadth wide, the distance from the thumb to the little finger of the flat of the hand. And that was the time ordained in the heart of the Father when he willed to send his Son. 
He sent him with a strong hand and surrounded him with all the joints of his fingers, which are his works in the Holy Spirit, that he might accomplish the will of his Father and suffer upon the cross for the wretched and contemptible disobedience with which the devil inspired the first man to redeem that man from the sin God's mercy bent down to earth and the incomprehensible height of the divinity was contained in the humanity of the Son of God. 28. The defeat of evil and the goals of justice are secrets of God's will. But at the north and west and south corners of the breadth of separation between the building and the light is so great that you cannot grasp its extent. This is to say, that no one weighed down by a mortal body can understand the elation of evil in the heart of the devil in the north, or in the consummation in active creatures in the west of fallen man, or of the beginning or end of the supernal justice, which is the ardent south. Nor can such a one see how these things are worked out and differentiated between the deeds of all people and the power of my knowledge. Both the elect and the reprobate are subjected to a just scrutiny and examined most diligently and strictly in their obedience to my precepts. And all should trust in me and feed them in their needs. But all these things are so hidden in my secret counsels that human senses and understanding can never take in or understand the extent of their profundity, except as far as it's granted by my permission. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 3. The Tower of Anticipation of God's Will After this I looked, and behold, in the middle of the shining part of the building's outer wall there stood an iron-colored tower, which was built out from the outer side. It was four cubits wide and seven cubits high. In it I saw five figures standing separately, each in its own arch, with a conical turret above it. The first of these faced the east, the second the northeast, the third the north, and the fourth the pillar of the word of God, at whose foot was the patriarch Abraham, and the fifth faced the tower of the church, and the people who were hastening here and there in the building. And the five figures resembling each other and being dressed in silk garments and white shoes, except the fifth, who was armored at all points. The second and third were bareheaded, with loose white hair, and wore no cloak. The first, third, and fourth wore white tunics, and this was all the difference between them. The first figure wore on her head a bishop's mitre, and had loose white hair, and she wore a white pallium, whose two borders were adorned on the inside with embroidered purple. In her right hand she held lilies and other flowers, and in her left hand a palm. And she said, O oh, sweet life, O oh, sweet embrace of eternal life, O oh, blessed happiness, in which consist the eternal rewards, for you are always in true delight, and so I can never be filled or sated with the inner joy that is in my God. And the second was clothed in a purple tunic and stood like a youth who has not yet attained adulthood, but is very serious. And she said, Neither the dreadful foe who is the devil, nor the hostility of humans, nor this world shall frighten me, who stand in the discipline of God, and am constantly in his sight. The third covered her face with white sleeves that clothed her right arm, and said, O oh, filth and uncleanness of the world, hide yourself and flee from my eyes, for my beloved was born of the Virgin Mary. The fourth had her head veiled in womanly fashion with a white veil, and was hung about with a yellow cloak. On her breast was a picture of Jesus Christ, and around it was written, through the depths of the mercy of our God, in which the day spring from on high has visited us. Luke one seventy eight, And she said, I stretch out my hands always to pilgrims and the needy and the poor and the weak and those who groan. But the fifth was armed and arrayed with a helmet on her head and a breastplate and greaves and iron gloves. A shield hung from her left shoulder 
She was girded with a sword, and she held a spear in her right hand, and under her feet a lion lay, its mouth open and its tongue hanging out. And some people also stood. Some were blowing trumpets, some fooling with instruments used in shows, and some playing different games. And that figure trampled the lion under her feet, and at the same time pierced these people with the spear she held in her right hand. And she said, I conquer the strong devil, and you also hate and envy and filth with your deceptive jesters. And inside the building I saw two other figures standing opposite this tower. The first stood on the floor of the building in a niche of fiery splendor, whose inside was painted with pictures of various evil spirits, and which was across from the tower. The other figure stood next to this niche, but was outside it, and had no niche of its own. Both figures looked sometimes at the tower and sometimes at the people who were entering and leaving the building. These figures were also dressed in silk garments and veiled in women's fashion in white head coverings and wore no cloaks but had on white shoes. And the first of these had on her head a three-sided crown of a glowing red like a hyacinth and was clad in white tunic with green embroideries in all the folds. And she said, I conquer in the east with the mighty Son of God, who went forth from the Father and came into the world to redeem humanity, and afterwards died in great suffering on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and returned to the Father. Therefore I shall not be confounded, but will flee from the miseries and pains of this world. And the second was clad in a white tunic, which was slightly tinged with color, and on her right arm she carried a cross with the image of a Savior over which she bent her head, and she said, This child bore many sorrows in this world, and therefore I will weep and know sorrow always for the sake of eternal joy, into which the good sheep will be led by the Son of God. And I saw that all these figures were uttering their individual speeches through the mystery of God to admonish humans. And again the one sitting on the throne, who was showing me all these things, said to me, 1. The divine virtues put forth by the law bear fruit in the gospel. By the strength and constancy of God's will, the divine virtues sprang up gradually in the Old Testament. But to those who revered them almost in ignorance, they did not yet haste completely sweet and delightful, for then the law was seen only in austerity, sharply correcting the delinquent. But afterwards, these virtues by the grace of God brought forth much fruit in the new law, showing the hungry, the sweetest, strongest, and most perfect food, the love of celestial things. Previous to this, as was said, certain hidden things were a sign of what was to come, and so this miraculous vision appropriately shows. For this tower you see standing in the middle of the shining part of the building's outer wall is the image of the anticipation of God's will shown in many different ways and meanings in the circumcision, so that by the sign of circumcision God displayed the law, and by the law the grace of the gospel. For by the faith manifested in Abraham there arose in him also the circumcision, a true prefiguration of the mystery, beginning in him the divine power built up strong virtues, as it were in the middle of the road of the knowledge of the two ways, defended by the goodness of the Supreme Father, and these virtues were by God's will destined to appear openly. They foreshadowed his will before he displayed it manifestly by his deeds. It is iron-colored and built out from the outer side. This is God's justice, strong and invincible, which first showed itself outward in reflective knowledge by means of the circumcision, which was apparent in the outer flesh, and it is established with the blessed virtues among the spiritual things of the spiritual wall that God built within people. 2. Virtues are brought about in people by God's will. The tower is four cubits wide, for these virtues by God's will are brought about in people by placing them in the world of the four elements, for which, while they are in the body, they get physical nourishment. It is seven cubits high, for they were seven gifts of the Holy Spirit which are so firm and tall that the tower raised itself on them until, after the incarnation of my Son, which was prefigured in the circumcision of the Old Testament, the church came forth from it. 
3. On the States of Heavenly Love, Discipline, Modesty, Mercy, and Victory. In it you see five figures standing separately, each in its own arch, with its conical turret above it. This is to say that in this tower that is in the strength of the circumcision, there are five strong virtues. Not that any virtue is in living form in itself, but a brilliant star given by God that shines forth in human deeds. For humanity is perfected by virtues, which are the deeds of people working in God. Hence these five virtues stand in this tower in the likeness of a person's five senses. They seized with great zeal upon the circumcision and cut it off from all iniquity, as the five human senses are circumcised in the church by baptism. But they do not work in a person by themselves. For the person works with them, and they with the person, just as the person's five senses do not work by themselves, but the person with them, and they with the person, to bear fruit together. And so each of them works hard as much as it can, and thus has a turreted apex of authority the surpassing dignity of virtuous constancy. The first of these faces the east, for this virtue looks forward with sobs of love to the Son of God wherever he was to come, and spoke openly about the eternal life the circumcision was hiding. The second looks to the northeast, for this figure divided her attention between the east and the north, regarding God in the east with great discipline, but also disdaining the behavior of the people in the north, who manifested undisciplined licentiousness and did not regard God or his law with worthy reverence. The third faces the north, for she destroys unlawful fornication with great strength, despising it and shielding herself from it by the law. The fourth looks towards the pillar of the word of God at whose foot is the patriarch Abraham. For she cleaves to the incarnation of the Son of God, touching it through the beginning Abraham made, that miraculous foreshadowing of the ram caught in the thorn bush. And the fifth faces the tower of the church, and the people who are hastening here and there in the building. For this image rises up victorious, and she destroys every injustice that originated in Adam. She looks to the strength of the church to help her conquer the vices of the devil, she shows herself to the people who are hastening to and fro in the church, and all behaving differently, inspiring them to be the flock of God's justice and worship him with reverent zeal. 4. Their dress and what it signifies. And the five figures resemble each other, which is to say that they worship God in human deeds with equal devotion. Each of them is dressed in silk garments, for each of these virtues is sweet and delightful, never weighing people down or constraining them, but softly instilling into their minds the sweetness of the heavenly kingdom as balm distills from a bush, with no crusted filth of injustice. And they are shod in white shoes, for they follow my justice and righteousness and celestial purity, trampling down surrender to the devil and stamping out his traces in the human being. But the fifth virtue is armored at all points, for she looks to the church where the fiercest wars are waging against the devil's vice. She extends her victory everywhere in it, wearing the priceless armor, which is God's invincible strength. And this strength slays all injustice and confounds the deceit of the devil. The second and the third are bareheaded with loose white hair. This means that for love of me, they avoid assuming burdens of labor or wealth or lust bareheaded, which is to say with a clear conscience. They open to me all their secret minds. They cast away all confusion and license of the desires of the flesh. And the first sign is their white hair, which symbolizes the purity of the mind that desires good works. And they wear no cloak, for they reject the customs of the pagans and the lust of the filth of the devil and abandon all secular cares because the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. The first, third, and fourth wear white tunics, which means that they hold fast to innocence, which prefigures with sweet chastity the incarnation of my Son, who withdrew humanity from death and clothed it with life in salvation. And this is all the difference between them, for each gets her strength from the Holy Spirit, but they use different paths of the soul to attain their one desire in God.
And so by them the celestial Jerusalem will be perfectly built. For these virtues are the deeds people do to reach God. 5. The celestial loves dress and what it means. Therefore the first figure signifies celestial love. For this love must exist in people before anything else. She wears on her head a bishop's mitre and has loose white hair, for this virtue was crowned with the high priest Jesus Christ, but also in the high priests of the Old Testament and in those who called to the Son of God. Would that you would rend the heavens and come down. Isaiah 64, 1. She stands without a woman's head covering, so that her hair flows free and its whiteness is seen. And by this hair she prefigures the freeing of the priesthood from the ties of marriage, through the advent of my son, for his priests should, for all sake of salvation, imitate him in chastity, and they should always hold to the perfect heavenly love and shake off the evil actions of sin-stained humanity, and thus form the clear white part of God's spiritual gift. And she wears a white pallium, whose two borders are adorned on the inside with embroidered purple, this is to say that the grace of God surrounds her in gentle purity, its boundaries fortified and adorned with the beautiful ornaments of charity. For divine grace will extend to every good deed, which is made up of two parts, God's love and the doers. And in her right hand she holds lilies and other flowers, which means that for her good works she has the reward of the lilies of eternal life and light and holiness. These are her companions who have joined themselves to her by heavenly love. And in her left hand she carries a palm, which has grown out of the secret place of blessed virtue and remembrance of death. And this is what can stop death, as if by rolling stones on its path. And this she declares in the words already quoted, that she speaks to the children of God. 6. On Disciplines, Dress, and What It Means and the second represents discipline, for after the love of the celestial life has arisen, carnal lust must be restrained by the discipline of contrition. She is clothed in a purple tunic, for she is surrounded by my law and the mortification of human flesh. And the purple garment is the example of my son, who was born of the virgin in charity and gave it every means of working. She stands like a youth who has not yet attained adulthood, but is very serious. For discipline is always full of childlike fear, the fear of a child under restraints who respects his schoolmaster. I, the Almighty, am the master of discipline in me. She appears not as an adult, for she does not try to wield power to do her own will, but faithfully and reverently fears. And she shows this in her words, quoted above. 6. On Discipline's Dress and What It Means and the second represents discipline, for after the love of the celestial life has arisen, carnal lust must be restrained by the discipline of contrition. She is clothed in a purple tunic because she is surrounded by my law and the mortification of human flesh, and the purple garment is the example of my son, who was born of the virgin in charity and gave it every means of working. She stands like a youth who has not yet attained adulthood, but is very serious, for discipline is always full of childlike fear. The fear of the child under the restraints who respects his schoolmaster. I, the Almighty, am the master of discipline. In me she appears not as an adult, for she does not try to wield power to do her own will, but faithfully and reverently fears, and she shows this in her words, quoted above. 7. On Modesty's Dress and What It Means The third represents modesty, for modesty appears after discipline to blush and drive away sin. Therefore she covers her face with the white sleeves that clothe her right arm, for she protects her inner conscience, which is, as it were, the face of her soul, by flying from fornication and the devil's pollution. She defends herself with the white garment of innocence and chastity, on the right hand of which is salvation coming from her deeds. For contempt and utter rejection of the filth of Satan is entwined strongly round her conscience, and she declares in the words of her admonition quoted above, 8. On mercy. And the fourth signifies mercy, for after modesty appears the virtue of mercy to help the needy. In the heart of the Father is true mercy of his grace, which he ordained in his eternal counsel and mercifully showed to Abraham in the circumcision. For he led him forth from his land and commanded that he and his race be circumcised, and showed him great wonders in the true trinity. 
And through this, he symbolically foreshadowed his son and foreshadowed mercy to Abraham in the sacrifice of Isaac. And she has her head veiled in womanly fashion with a white veil, which is the roof and foundation of salvation inasmuch as one who has mercy can bring back lost souls to the pure protection of the holy veil from out of the exile of death. It makes souls white and people radiant to be covered with God's mercy. And so those who disdained God while they were in sin will find him shining on them like a gentle sunbeam when mercy is brought to them from heaven. And so mercy in the figure of a woman is a fruitful mother of souls saved from perdition. For as a woman covers her head, so mercy averts the death of souls. And as women are sweeter than men, so mercy is sweeter than the rabid insanity of crime in a sinner before his heart is visited by God. And the virtue of mercy also appears in feminine form because when one virginal body was enclosed by a woman's chastity, sweetest mercy arose in the womb of Mary. Mercy had always dwelt in the Father, but now the Father showed her as visible through the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb. She is hung about with a yellow cloak, for she is surrounded by the shining sun, the sign of my son, who shines on her world from heaven as the sun's splendor shines on the earth. For my son is the true son, lighting up the world by the sanctification of the church. And on her breast, she has a picture of my only begotten, which means that I put my son on the breast of mercy when I sent him into the womb of the Virgin Mary. And therefore round it is written, through the depths of the mercy of our God, in which the day spring from on high has visited us. Luke 1, 78. What does this mean? That everywhere my power extends, the secret of what is on the breast of mercy shows that my son is the true mercy. How? As it was foretold in the words of my servant Zechariah in the gospel, for it was he who said, through the depths of the mercy of our God, in which the day spring from on high has visited us which is to say that salvation comes from the depths of the Father's mercy. For it was hidden in his heart, as the viscera is hidden in a person, that his Son was to be incarnate and God visit humanity at the end of time. How? In the celestial bread which is his Son born on the flesh of the Virgin Mary, and come forth from the heart of the Father on high to offer the greatest mercy to those who seek him, as the virtue tells the children of God in her words quoted above. 9 on victory's dress and what it means. And the fifth figure foreshadows victory. For after the mercy I showed by the circumcision when I willed to send my son into the world, the same circumcision gave rise to victory, which then went on with increasing strength till the coming of my son, and goes on with him until the last day. For in my son I defeated the ancient serpent, which had exalted itself over his head and bound the human race by a thousand evil deeds like a chain. My son triumphed over those evil deeds with all the arms of war that, like flowers of virtue, arose in his incarnation. What does this mean? That after mercy arises victory in people too, as soon as they conquer themselves and their harmful vices. How? Among the five virtues, the first is celestial love, which consists in a person knowing and loving God above all things. Then the person, because of his faith, is bound by the law of discipline, and from there he goes on to repress his tendencies to sin through good and righteous modesty. And so by these three powers the person will retain a just heart and be able to see the next thing, the suffering of his neighbor. And then he will provide all necessities for him as for himself. And with these three powers the person soon becomes a strong soldier, perfected in mind by imitating my son, the true Samaritan, in mercy. And then he wins victory over the power of the devil with arms of virtue. He conquers himself and governs his neighbor, and by these virtues slays all evil, rejecting the pride that drove Adam from paradise. And this fifth virtue is armed with a helmet on her head. For man in the fullness of celestial desire should long for God, who is the head of all things, and so attain eternal salvation. She is arrayed with a breastplate, this is so that man may resist the devil by justly restraining the will of his carnal desires. For he has become subject to God in true fear and trembling, faithfully dreading his stern judgment, as the psalmist David says, instructed by me. Your lightnings lit up the world. 
the earth shook and trembled. Psalm 76, 19. That is to say, your wonders and secrets, O Lord of all, shone forth and miraculously appeared. How? Like lightning, which is partly seen and partly concealed. Just as your mysteries are sometimes understood, but sometimes unknown. For throughout the whole world, wondrously created by your will, there is no race to which the name of your glory and the power of your majesty will not come. They will come miraculously by different paths and remarkable signs, even to those whom the light of faith and truth has not yet illumined for their salvation. Therefore people will turn shaken by sighs away from their own evil. They will forsake their lusts, trembling at the judgment of heaven. Formerly man forgot himself and walked in earthly deeds, but now he will be wise and come to himself. This virtue is also arrayed with grieves, so that when she sees the right path, she can leave the paths of death by way of chastisement of the body. And she has iron gloves, so that through mental circumcision and right faith, she may escape the works of the devil, believe in God, and so evade the snares of the cruel enemy. A shield hangs from her left shoulder, for the left is the side of the devil's combat with man, and so she is surrounded there by the grace of God's mighty precepts. Man by these is surrounded and defended with such strong faith that the devil cannot corrupt him by temptations. And he will not succumb to the devil's vices as long as God's protection circles his shoulders. For God's grace binds the high and strong soul to himself with the bond of love of God and neighbor. And she is girded with a sword because people must keep themselves in the austere power of God's word by chastising their bodies and cutting away iniquity both from themselves and from others. And she holds a spear in her right hand which is to say that a person who trusts in God may attack and overcome the devil's filth with the great peace of the Lord. And this is true justice in the evil combat of devil against man, which the latter can hardly win without the help of God. And under her feet a lion lies, its mouth open. This is the devil laid low by victory at the foot of the righteous path of life and truth as he was gaping with bitter cruelty to swallow the human race. Its tongue is hanging out which represents his plan wickedly to devour the whole race of people descended from Adam. And some people also stand under her feet. These people brought to a standstill by her fighting force are the flutes of the devil who are supple, that evil may be played upon them. And she, acting righteously in God's zeal, justly strikes them, because their many and various perverse tricks aid and serve the devil. Some of them are blowing trumpets, for they are drunk with the sound of evil and rave in the exaltation of a burning mind. In great pride they hate God's justice race upon race. Some are fooling with instruments used in shows, for they try to deceive with the devil's fantastic illusions and stubbornly hold to their twisted pride and envy God's discipline. And others are playing different games. They are caught in the perverse filth of vice, not by the choice of their own will, as they suppose, but by the snares of the devil. And that figure tramples the lion and all these people under her feet. For with great zeal and divine justice, she crushes all the vanities of the human heart and diabolical persuasion. And at the same time, she pierces them with the spear she holds in her right hand. For with the confidence and daring she derives from God, she pierces, conquers, and wounds all these uncleannesses. For by God they are mocked and judged as not as she says in the words of admonition previously seen, 10, on patience and longing and what they mean. And inside the building you see two other figures standing opposite this tower, which is to say that in the work the Heavenly Father did through His Son, which showed clearly and visibly the one prefigured in the circumcision, two other virtues sprang up. One of these was to see the example of Christ and how to follow in His steps, and the other was to anticipate with fortitude and reverence, the will of God. And they are the fruit that was foreshadowed in the circumcision. The first of these stands on the floor of the building, in a niche of fiery splendor whose inside is painted with the pictures of various evil spirits, and which is across from the tower. For with virtue is perfected amid earthly things and treads them underfoot, in the goodness of the Father, when it follows the example of the Son of God, and passes beyond the desire of the flesh. How? 
by great endurance it bypasses the world's misery, he picked it in this niche, which is the might of secular power, fierce and terrible in its detaining pride. The devil's company follows it, and the devil himself draws to his will the inner desires of the soul of the secular, who love carnal things, and the niche in its earthly power often opposes itself to justice and resists the true testament built on God. But patience is victorious, and in good people conquers everything with the help of God, no matter how they are opposed and exhausted by the snares of the evil spirits. The other figure stands next to this niche, but is outside it, and has no niche of its own. For after the first virtue patiently conquers the power of arrogance, even though it inflicts pain on her, the second one surpasses this power. For it arises outside the range of the pains dealt out by arrogance and escapes its rage. Longing stands next to patience in remembrance of the gifts from which she took her origin. But she is outside all niches, for she is free from the power of this world and openly carries the cross of Christ. Both figures are looking sometimes at the towers, which is to say that the work prefigured in God's provident will is completed in them, and so they regard its roots in the circumcision of the Old Testament. They are greater than their start in the circumcision, because the radiant deeds excels the beginning of the thought, and sometimes they are looking at the people who are entering and leaving the building. This means that they are admonishing in the Holy Spirit both those who are treading the path of justice towards God and those who are entering the orbit of the devil's crime and leaving the just path, and they are telling the latter to imitate them in good. 11. Their dress and what it means. These figures are also dressed in silk garments, for they possess great sweetness, so that people may not groan under a heavy weight of labor when persecuted. They are veiled in women's fashion in white-headed coverings, for people should justly be subject to God as their head and wrap him around their mind in pure love and embrace him in joy and gladness as a wife holds her husband according to the God's ordinance in fear and loving honor. They wear no cloak, for they lack all care for secular things, but lean only towards the things which are eternal in God and the life to come. But they have on white shoes, for they shine in the path of justice by the purity of faith in human minds, so that people may follow their steps and their example. 12. On patience's dress in particular and what it means. The first figure designates patience, who arose in the horn of Abraham, which is to say, in the time his disobedience to God began. And this, with his circumcision, was the first sound of obedience that had occurred after the fall of Adam. It preceded the work of obedience and the true word, which is in the Son of God, as sounds precede a word, and it came in the north. The side facing the wicked deeds and turbulence of the ancient serpent, and she has on her head a three-sided crown of glowing red like a hyacinth. For she was first crowned through the faith in the Holy Trinity of the faithful people who despised their flesh and do not hesitate to shed their blood for the love of God and the true faith. For the Son of God appeared in the flesh to conquer death with the redness of his blood, and it adorned the church like the glowing red beauty of the noble hyacinth. She is clad in a white tunic with green embroideries in all the folds. For she has clothed herself in the garments of God's work in the whiteness of perpetual light whose folds are embroidered with the sorrows and laments of the one who says, Oh, when shall I come to the light of the true light? And this desire is suffered happily in the present life by thinking of what it foreshadows. The very adversities and calamities of the faith adorn their soul with greenness, and their suffering them in patience. For that sake God embellishes them, which indeed this virtue declares in her words already quoted. 13. On longing's dress in particular and what it means. And the other figure represents longing. For after patience in adversity there arises among my elect the longing for the remembered life, springing from my admonition that I sent my son from my heart because of the longing of my people. For my people of both the Old and the New Testaments had and have this remembrance of mine which ornaments its longing with groans, for it is true compunction of heart. And so she also stands in the north quarter to repulse the dissolute uncleanness of the devil's snares 
and she is clad in a white tunic which is slightly tinged with color for the purity of faith surrounds her with good works but nonetheless she is pale and troubled because her faith always sighs and sobs for eternal felicity on her right arm she carries a cross with the image of the savior over which she bends her head which is to say that with her right hand the hand that strongly does her noble task she embraces my son's passion she longs for him and bends over him with her whole desire and intent imitating him in suffering and grief and she shows in the words of her exhortation already quoted and so you see that all these figures are uttering their individual speeches through the mystery of god to admonish humans for in all the virtues god's tenderness sweetly instructs the minds of the people and exhorts them to put aside evil and raise themselves up to good but let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings that ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience vision four the pillar of the word of god and then beyond the tower of anticipation of god's will one cubit past the corner that faces the north attached to the outside of the shining part of the main wall of the building i saw a pillar the color of steel most dreadful to behold and so big and tall that i could not form an idea of its measurements and the pillar was divided from bottom to top into three sides with edges sharp as a sword and the first edge faced the east the second the north and the third the south and the latter was somewhat merged with the outside wall of the building from the edge that faced the east branches grew out from the root to the summit at the root I saw Abraham sitting on the first branch, then Moses on the second, then Joshua on the third, and then the rest of the patriarchs and prophets, one above the other on each branch, sitting in the order in which they succeeded each other in time. They were all looking toward the edge of the pillar that faced the north, marveling at the things they could see with spiritual vision going on there in the future. But between the two edges, the one facing the east and the one facing the north, the side of the pillar to which those patriarchs and prophets turned their faces was from bottom to top all round, as if it turned in a lathe, and wrinkled like the bark of a tree that puts forth shoots. And from the second edge facing the north, there went forth a marvelously bright radiance which shone and reflected as far as the edge of the face of the south. And in the radiance, which was so widely diffused, I saw apostles, martyrs, confessors, and virgins, and many other saints walking in great joy. And the third edge facing the south was broad and wide in the middle, but thinner and narrower at the bottom and top, like a bow drawn and ready to shoot arrows. And at the top of the pillar, I saw a light so bright that human tongue cannot describe it. And in this light appeared a dove with a gold ray coming out of its mouth, which shed brilliant light on the pillar. And as I looked at this, I heard from heaven a terrifying voice rebuking me and saying, what you see is divine. And at this voice, I trembled so much that I dared not look there any longer. Then I saw inside the building a figure standing on the pavement facing this pillar, looking sometimes at it and sometimes at the people who were going to and fro in the building. And that figure was so bright and glorious that I could not look at her face or her garments for the splendor with which she shone. I saw only that, like the other virtues, she appeared in human form. And around her I saw a beautiful multitude with the appearance and wings of angels standing in great veneration, for they both feared and loved her. And before her face I saw another multitude with the appearance of human beings in dark clothes, and they stood immobile with fear. 
and the figure looked upon the people who came in from the world and in the building put on a new garment. And she said to each of them, Consider the garment you have put on, and do not forget your Creator who made you. And as I wondered at these things, the one seated on the throne spoke to me again. 1. The austerity of the law was sweetened by the incarnation of the Word. The Word of God, by whom all things were made, was Himself begotten before time in the heart of the Father. But afterward, near the end of time, as the Old Testament saints had predicted, He became incarnate of the Virgin, and assuming humanity, He did not forsake deity. But being one and true God, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, He sweetened the world with His sweetness, and illumined it with the brilliance of His glory. Hence the pillar you see beyond the tower of anticipation of God's will designates the ineffable mystery of the Word of God. For in the true Word, the Son of God, all the justice of the New and Old Testament is fulfilled. This justice was open to believers for their salvation by divine inspiration when the Son of the Supreme Father deigned to become incarnate of the sweet Virgin, and the virtues showed themselves to be powerful in anticipation of God's will, which was the beginning of the circumcision. Then the mystery of the Word of God was also declared in strict justice by the voice of the patriarchs and prophets, who foretold that He would be manifest in justice and godly deeds and great severity during the justice of God and leaving no injustice free to evade the command of the law. 2. The patriarchs, in a mystery, showed that the law was near. And you see that the pillar is standing one cubit past the corner that faces the north, which symbolizes in human terms how very near the patriarchs who announced the strict justice of the word of God were in their meaning to the law, thus resisting the devil in the north. 3. No pride can resist the strength of God. The pillar is the color of steel and attached to the outside of the shining parts of the main wall of the building. For the power of the Word of God is unconquered and unconquerable, and no one can resist Him by vain rebellion or vile pride. And so the Old Testament fathers were united with the reflective knowledge, as it were on the outside, by the bulwarks and deeds of justice. But they were not yet imbued with the fiery perfection of the work that arose in the Son of God, and which they but foreshadowed outwardly in their words. 4. God's justice is dreadful and exceeds every creature in height. It is most dreadful to behold, for the justice of the Word of God is fearful to humans. Who knows only the impious judgment of unjust judges judging according to their own whims? It is so big and tall that you cannot form an idea of its measurements, for the Word who is the Son of God, exceeds all creatures in paternal majesty by the magnitude of His glory and the height of His divinity, and no human in a corruptible body can fully understand Him. 5. The Word of God has three divisions, law, grace, and exposition of Scripture. And the pillar is divided from bottom to top into three sides, with edges sharp as a sword, which is to say that the strength of the Word of God as prefigured in the Old Testament and declared in the New, circling and turning in grace, showed in the Holy Spirit three points of division. These were the Old Law, the New Grace, and the exposition of the faithful doctors. And by these the holy person does what is just from the beginning, starting with the good and moving upward, to end with the perfection. For all that is just was, is, and will be forever in the simple deity, which is in all things, and no power can stand firm in malice if he wills to conquer it by the glory of his loving kindness. 6. The knowledge of law, the work of the gospel, and the wisdom of the doctors. The first edge faces the east, which signifies the start of the knowledge of God through the divine law, before the perfect day of justice. 
the second looks to the north for after this good and chosen work was started there came the gospel of my son and the other precepts of me the father which rose up against the north where injustice originated and the third faces the south and is somewhat merged with the outside wall of the building that is to say that when the work of justice had been confirmed, there came the profound and rich wisdom of the principal doctors, who through the fire of the Holy Spirit made known what was obscure in the law and the prophets and showed their fruition in the gospels. Thus they made these things fruitful to the understanding. They touched on the outward content of the scriptures and the work of the Father's goodness and sweetly ruminated on their mystical significance. 7. God worked from the beginning of the law to the manifestation of his Son. And from the edge which faces the east, branches grow out from the root of the summit. This is to say that when God first became known through the just law, branches appeared on the eastern edge, which was the time of the patriarchs and prophets. For this sharp-edged pillar of divinity carries on the work from its roots, which is the good beginning in the minds of the elect, to its summit, which is the manifestation of the Son of Man, who is all justice. And therefore at the root you see Abraham sitting on the first branch, for the time of the inspiration by God began with Abraham, when he obeyed God, and with a tranquil mind departed from his country. Then Moses on the second, for after this God inspired Moses to plant the law, and so foreshadowed the Son of the Most High. Then Joshua on the third, for he afterward had the Spirit of the Lord in him in order to strengthen the custom of the law as God commanded. And then you see the rest of the patriarchs and prophets, one above the other on each branch, sitting in the order in which they succeeded each other in time. For God inspired each patriarch and prophet in his own time to nurture his particular shoot towards the height of his commands. And all in their day reposed on this disposition and order of the justice. He showed them faithful and obedient to the divine majesty as it showed itself in their times. 8. The patriarchs and prophets marveled at the Incarnation. They are all looking toward the edge of the pillar that faces the north, marveling at the things they can see with spiritual vision going on there in the future. For they were all alerted in their souls by the Holy Spirit, and so turned and saw how the gospel's doctrine repulsed the devil by the strength of the Son of God. They spoke of his incarnation and marveled at how he came from the heart of the Father and the womb of the Virgin and showed himself with great wonders, both by himself and by his followers, who wonderfully imitated him in new grace and trod the transitory underfoot, greatly thirsting for the joys of the eternal. 9. The word of God was hidden by provision in the soul of the elect of old. But between the two edges, the one facing the east and the one facing the north, the side of the pillar to which those patriarchs and prophets are turning their faces is from bottom to top as round as if turned in a lathe and wrinkled like the bark of a tree that puts forth shoots. This is to say that between the two edges, which are the manifest knowledge of me and the teachings of my son, the one word which is my son, was hidden as a foreshadowing image in the soul of the ancient fathers who abided in my law. For the first chosen one until the last holy one, thus they were decorated all around with mystical ornaments. For he carefully arranged and polished all his chosen instruments and showed himself to them all with swift grace. He was loving to them all, as is prefigured in the wrinkles of the circumcision which was the shadow of the things to come, for it contained hidden in the austerity of the law the opposite meaning of the most righteous offshoot, the high and holy incarnation. 10. The word of the Son goes from and returns to the Father through the doctors, 
and from the second edge facing the north, there goes forth a marvelously bright radiance, which shines and reflects as far as the edge that faces the south. This is to say that from the second age, which is the New Testament, and stands opposed to the devil, there issues the word of my Son, which comes forth from me and returns to me. For when the Son, which is my Son, stands forth in the flesh, the light of the Holy Ghost shines in his preaching and pours itself out from him and his disciples as fruits and blessings, and then returns into the fountain of salvation, where it reaches and guides those who profoundly search into the words of the Old and New Testaments. And they show how wisdom is raised up in that sun who enlightens the world and burns like noonday in his elect. 11. The apostles, martyrs, and other elect were made so by Christ's teaching. And in the radiance which is so widely diffused, you see apostles, martyrs, confessors, and virgins, and many other saints walking in great joy. For in the clear light in which my son preached and spread the truth, there have grown up apostles who announce that true light, and martyrs who faithfully shed their blood like strong soldiers, and confessors who officiate after my son, and virgins who follow the supernatural branch and all my other elects, who rejoice in the fountain of happiness and the font of salvation, baptized by the Holy Spirit and ardently going from virtue to virtue. 12. Gospel knowledge was limited, is now broad, and will grow weak at the end. And the third edge facing the south is broad and wide in the middle, but thinner and narrower at the bottom and top, like a bow drawn and ready to shoot arrows. This is to say that the gospel was spread, the wisdom of the saints broadened, they burned in the Holy Spirit seeking it in the depth so as to find through it the deepening of their understanding of the word of God, strengthened by the faith of the Christian peoples, and so the sense of the scriptures that went forth from the mouth of the holy doctors broadened too. They searched the depths of the scriptures, a stringency, and made it known to them who learned from them. And thus they too enlarged their senses by knowledge, more of the wisdom of the knowledge of the divine writings. At the beginning of the church's institutions, as it were at the bottom of the edge, this knowledge was narrower and less studied. For the people did not yet embrace it with the love they gave it afterwards. And at the end of time, as it were at the edge's summit, the studies of many will grow cold. Divine wisdom will not be lovable to them as deeds are lovable, but they will hide their knowledge and keep it for themselves, as if they had no obligation to do good works. For they will know it only on the outside, as in a dream. 13. People must begin works timidly, continue strongly, and finish humbly. And therefore the edge is widest and sharpest in the middle. For the austere works of the worship of God were denuded in the Old Testament's darkness and grew from their narrow beginnings in their middle, which consists in the strongest virtues and loftiest zeal. For the people were then swifter against iniquity wounding the devil with his words from God and casting out and trampling down all his vices with the great austerity of God's justice. But then the people forgot themselves and declined. And as the end of the world drew near, lived in a narrower fervor for the Holy Spirit. So as a bow is stretched tight by the bowstrings in time of war, a person must rise up against vice in body and soul, more constricted at each end and broader in the middle, so that the beginning and the end of his work may be circumspect with fear and humility, while in the middle it's strong and constant, sending forth by the gift of the Holy Spirit the darts of good deeds against the ambushes of the devil. For when a person begins to do good, his strength is fragile. Then when he continues to work good, he grows stronger because the Holy Spirit has poured itself out in him. But since the power cannot come often, at the end of his good work, he will be less in strength again because of the weakness of the flesh. 
and so the bow should always be bent for defense against the vices of the devil. 14. God shows people the mystery of the Son of God by foreshadowing. But at the top of the pillar you see a light so bright that human tongue cannot describe it. This is to say that the Heavenly Father in His highest and deepest mysteries made known the mystery of His Son, who shines in His Father with glorious light, in which there appears all the justice of giving of the law in the New Testament. And the latter is of such clarity and brilliance of wisdom that it is not possible for any earthly person to express it in words, as long as he is in corruptible flesh. And in the light appears a dove with a gold ray coming out of its mouth, which sheds brilliant light on the pillar. For in the heart of the radiant Father, the brilliance of the light of the Son of God burns the Holy Spirit who comes from on high and declares the mysteries of the Son of the Most High, to redeem the people seduced by the ancient serpent. And so the Holy Spirit inspires all the commandments and the new testimonies, giving before the incarnation of the Lord the law of his glorious mysteries, and then showing that same glory in the incarnation itself. And the Spirit's inspiration is a golden splendor and a high and excellent illumination, and by this outpouring, it makes known, as was said, the mystical secrets of God's only begotten to the ancient heralds who showed the Son of God through types and marveled at his coming from the Father and his miraculously arising in the dawn of the perpetual virgin. And thus the Spirit in its power fused the Old Testament and the Gospels into one spiritual seed from which grew all justice. And so you cannot contemplate the divine glory because of the immense power of divinity. No mortal can see it except those to whom I will to foreshadow it. Therefore, take care not to presume rashly to look at what is divine, as the trembling that seizes you shows. 15. The virtue of the knowledge of God. And you see inside the building a figure standing on the pavement facing this pillar. This is to say that a virtue shows itself within the work of God, the Father, which declares the mystery of the Word of God, for it has revealed all the justice in the city of the Omnipotent to the people of the Old and New Testaments. She is standing on the pavement, which is to say above all earthly things, in the work of the loving Father, for everything in earth and in heaven are foreseen by Him. And she looks sometimes at the pillar and sometimes at the people who are going to and fro in the building. This is to say that she is contemplating in the word of God the mystery put forth by his power and also the people who are working in the Father's goodness and which of them are succeeding or not succeeding in their work. For she knows the nature of each one at will. And this image signifies the knowledge of God for she oversees all people and in all things in heaven and on earth. And she is so bright and glorious that you cannot look at her face or her garments for the splendor with which she shines. For she is terrible with the terror of the avenging lightning and gentle with the goodness of the bright sun. And both her terror and her gentleness are incomprehensible to humans. The terror of divine brilliance in her face and the brightness of her beauty and her garments, as the sun cannot be looked at in its burning face or its beautiful clothing of rays. But she is with everyone and in everyone, and so beautiful in her secret that no person can know the sweetness with which she sustains people and spares them an inscrutable mercy, spares even the hardest stone, which is a hard and incorrigible person who never wants to turn aside from evil until it can be penetrated no further. But like the other virtues, she appears in human form, for God, in the power of his goodness, profoundly imbued man with reason and knowledge and intellect, that he might dearly love him and devotedly worship him and spurn the illusion of demons and adore him above all who gave him such high honor. 16. The angels that surround her and why they are winged. And around her you see a beautiful multitude with the appearance and wings of angels standing in great veneration, for they both fear and love her, 
which is to say that all the blessed and excellent spirits in the heavenly ministry worship the knowledge of God with inexpressibly pure praise, as humans cannot worthily do while they are in mortal bodies. These spirits embrace God in their ardor, for they are living light, and they are winged, not in the sense that they have wings like the flying creatures, but in the sense that they circle burningly in their spheres through the power of God, as if they were winged. And so they adore me, the true God, and persevere in proper fear and true subjection, knowing my judgments and burning in my love. For they behold my face forever in desire and will nothing but those things they see are pleasing to my penetrating vision. 17. On the human beings who are called compelled sheep. And before her face you see another multitude with the appearance of human beings in dark clothes, and they stand immobile with fear. They are people who live in the knowledge of God. How? That person whom God foresees will belong to him stands in great honor in his sight. But one who chooses to stay in perdition rather than in God is lost. Those people you see in the multitude are called compelled sheep. They have a human form because of their human deeds and dark clothes because they have done sinful works in doubt. And they fear the judgment of God with a stringent fear. They are called compelled sheep because I compel them by many means to come to life and to be snatched from death through my son's blood. Thus compelled sheep are those people who are compelled by me against their will, by many tribulations and sorrows to leave their iniquities. These they gladly embrace in the desire of their flesh and the flower of their youth as long as they held the world wanting to retain heat and lust until the fire of the flesh departed from them in cold age. But I forced them all in different ways according to what I saw in them to cease from their sins. 18. God constrains some gently, some by strong lash, and some by extreme pain. Some of these in whom desire for the world does not burn so fiercely I force with a lighter rather than a heavier scourge. For I do not perceive in them the great bitterness I see in others, since when they feel my correction they renounce the pomps of the world and hastily leave their own will and come to me. Others I correct with heavier blows, since they so burn and yearn for the sins of their vicious self, and they would not be fit for the kingdom unless I forcibly compelled them. And my knowledge sees and knows these, and constrains them in proportion to their bodily excesses. And others again I conquer by the greatest and sharpest misery of mind and body, for they are so rebellious and so extreme in their carnal pleasures, that if they were not constrained by the heaviest calamity, the wantonness of their flesh would lead them to unceasing crime. These never turn to God while their wills prosper. Some fall into desperation through timidity of mind, but others are mocked by prideful ambition and the former allow despair to trample them underfoot, while the latter cannot contain themselves for the overabundance of their spirits. So when those who belong to me resist me by their deeds, I force them as my knowledge of them directs. And so through the physical and spiritual calamities they suffer, they are compelled to come to me and be saved. Thus Pharaoh, having been greatly terrified, finally made the Israelites go forth from his land, as it is written. 19. Example of Pharaoh, Moses, and Aaron. And Pharaoh, calling Moses and Aaron by night, said, Rise up and go forth from my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go sacrifice to the Lord as you say. Take your flocks and your herds as you ask, and as you depart, bless me, Exodus twelve thirty one to 32 which is to say the heavy and burdensome crimes inseparable from the world weigh people down with sorrow and misery. They say in their hearts, alas, alas, whither shall we flee? Then these sorrows clash and drive the people away from them, and the people hasten to withdraw. For their bodies are shriveling up from the weight of the scourge in the hand of God, 
and they cannot live with joy amid the pleasure of the world, for God claims them, calling the just by the many calamities of the dark deeds of their night of sin. Hence Pharaoh, which is to say the vices of the devil amid the clamor of grief and misery, calls Moses, which means those people whom God constrains by the keenest spiritual or physical sorrows, and Aaron, that is, those people whom he compels by lighter adversities and calls out of the night of evil deeds. And the vice is saved from amid the oppression of human pleasure. Arise from your carnal habits and go forth from the ancient dwelling places you had with us. Separate yourself from the common people whom we possess and who worship us. Separate yourselves from the secular affairs to which we gladly cling. You who were terrified by us when you were our prisoners and take the children of God with you who see and acknowledge him. Go therefore by another way, leave us and offer yourself to God by means of those invincible fights in which you say you have conquered us by your will. In the newness of mind you now seek, assume the gentleness of the sheep, which prevents you from acting with us because you chose the sorrow of following the lamb, and assume the victorious arms of the strength of herds, which we cannot resist and which have conquered us. Separate yourself from us as you wished when you fiercely fought us. Go to the country you had longed for in your minds. Embrace the new life that takes you from us and bless and praise God for the battle by which you have torn yourselves away from worldly matters and cares. 20. How God scrutinizes people, chastises and consoles them. And I, Almighty God, in compelling these sheep to come over to me, strengthen my pillars, which are the strong heirs to heaven. On a foundation of chastisement, I chastise them according to the degree of wickedness by which they are assailed and implicated in the sin of Adam. For if I do not confirm them by my grace, they cannot stand. Some who are not weighed down by a very great burden of vice, I punish more lightly. For if I were to correct them with a sharper blow, their spirits would entirely fail and they would fall into desperation. For they are not bound by the force of the great whirlwind of the devil's temptations, but others who in the battle with the devil are burdened with a greater weight and have savage ways and excessive lusts, I constrain harshly with heavy sufferings, so that they, they will not withdraw from my covenant, for they belong to it, and wish with all their hearts to lay hold of me and observe my precepts. But if I chastise these as lightly as the first, they would count my corrections as nothing for they are assailed by the ancient serpent's most heavy attack. And there are also certain people whom I do not know, exiles from the heavenly country, for they completely abandon me, seducing themselves in the greed of their thought with devouring rage. These do not seek me nor desire to know me, but choke off their good desires. And so they ask no help for me but greedily feast on their own good and please themselves in carnal lusts. Now some of these latter express their will in excesses and pleasure of the flesh, but do not live in hatred and envy. They are simply engulfed in sweet joys and carnal delights. To these I give the fruits of the earth in prosperity and do not let them lack to be poor. For they were created by me and they do not devour my people with malice. And so what they choose is given to them. But others are fierce and bitter, full of gall and hatred and envy, rendering evil for evil and suffering no injury to be inflicted on them. And if these obtain worldly honor and riches, they destroy the heavenly virtues in others and do not let them grow. And so from these I take fruits and riches and throw them into the great miseries so that they cannot do as much evil as they would want to. For if they could, they would do the works of the devil. And so by just measure, I mark out the ways of good and bad people and weigh their wills according to what my eye sees of their desires. As wisdom testifies through Solomon saying, 21 words of the wisdom of Solomon. All human ways are open to his eyes. The Lord is the wear of spirits, Proverbs 16, 2, which is to say, 
to the sight of the Almighty, all roads are open that the human living mind can choose in the present state of its wisdom. For each person possesses the knowledge of fruitful utility and of vain foolishness. Thus God sees all things and nothing is hidden from his divine sight. He knows and observes all things. And so he can deal rightly with each and every case. How? He is the wear of spirits. He treats them tenderly with sweet caress and peace. And he chastises them with the tribulation of misery that they may be conformed to the right measure. They cannot escape him by running or fleeing unless he so wills it in accordance with their merits. For they are weighed both in this world and in the world to come by the weight in which they worship God. So that these spirits are weighed justly and a person's mind is uplifted to higher things or sunk to lower things exactly as far as God's just judgment requires. No soul has enough power to fight against God who resists their attempts for he judges all things most righteously and opposes them with his irresistible justice so that they can do no more than he permits. And as the leaden counterweight weighs money correctly, so God in his equal scales counterbalances the good and the bad with obstacles so that they can never escape the equity of his judgment and the good receive for their merits the glory of the joy of life, and the bad the pain and grief of death according to what God's vision sees in them. 22. How the knowledge of God scrutinizes those clothed in a new garment. And the figure looks upon the people who come in from the world and in the building put on a new garment. This is to say that the knowledge of God knows those who leave the wickedness and infidelity, and by the power of God's work put on the new self in baptism for the sake of eternal life. And she warns them not to turn backwards and go towards the devil, or if they do thus stray, that they should return to God their creator. As she says to each of them in the words of her admonition quoted above, But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflections and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 5. The Jealousy of God After this I looked, and behold, in the north corner where the building's two kinds of wall joined, there appeared a head of marvelous form, planted firmly by the neck at the outside of the corner, at the same height from the ground that the wall itself rose to in that corner, and no higher, so that the top of the head just equaled the summit of the wall, and this head was fiery in color, sparkling like a fiery flame, and it had a terrible human face which looked in great anger towards the north. From the neck down I saw nothing of this figure's body, for the rest of it was hidden by its pressing into the corner. But I saw its head, a bare human head. It was not covered by hair like a man's, or by a veil like a woman's, but it was more manly than womanly, and very terrible to see. It had three wings of wondrous breadth and length. White like a cloud, they were not raised but extended straight out from each other, so that the head was slightly brighter than they were. The first rose from the right side of the jaw and stretched toward the northeast. The second and middle, the second and middle one pointed from the throat to the north, and the third stretched from the left side of the jaw toward the west. Sometimes these wings moved very terribly and struck these regions but after a while ceased striking, and I did not hear the head uttering any words. It only remained motionless in body and struck with its wings from time to time in the place toward which they extended. And again I heard the one who sat on the throne saying to me, 1. The form of the jealousy of God and what it does. God worked his jealousy very severely on the people of the old law, but toward those of the new, for love of his son, he was mild and sweet. 
This is not because he overlooked and carelessly dismissed the sins of those who transgressed, but because he was mercifully awaiting the true inner penitence of the pure heart. And at the same time, he refused to tolerate the iniquity of the hardened, but punished them with just judgment. Therefore, the head that you see in the north corner, where the building's two kinds of walls join, symbolizes the jealousy of the Lord, which punishes that inflexible iniquity that desires no curing. This jealousy was prefigured in the symbols of the patriarchs and prophets and arose openly in the mystery of the word of God. So too the jealousy of God is in the form of a head, for of all the fear it inspires, it is known best for the severity of its vengeance, as a person is known by his face. And it flames out against the north because it is most swift and sharp in God to slay the devil and all evil. For in Abraham and in Moses, the defense of those who labor, which is to say the knowledge of the two choices, the way of good and evil, is joined to the human race in the work of God. For in all things, through the goodness of the Father, man must work strongly against the devil and the knowledge of good and evil. But the jealousy of the Lord avenges sin. The choice expressed in the deeds of people who do not observe God's precepts. For this work is not deserving of remission. Where does this happen? Where there is no acknowledgement of God and therefore no fear of God or man. And when a heart is thus hardened and deadened by the filth of iniquity, which fears neither the judgment of God nor the continence of man, the jealousy of the Lord confounds it by just judgment and throws it down by vengeance in the law of God. How? 2. God examines sins to punish or pardon in a person's body and soul. When the commandments were established, it was jealousy that by righteous judgment removed the injustice wherever there was transgression of the law. In the Old Testament, injustice was wiped out by a severe reprisal upon the outer person, in whom transgression of the law caused bodily sores. After the grace of the gospel, jealousy works through penance, and after the person's death it will work in the pains of the torments of hell. For I so examine human iniquities, conceived and brought forth and twisted by the doers of deeds, that I avenge them either physically in the person's body or in the pains of the world to come or else the person himself will purge them through penance and remission while he is still living with the soul and body that performed them, as my servant Job says, speaking in my spirit. 3. Words of Job on the subject. I changed my face, and I twisted with sorrow. I feared all my works, knowing that you do not spare the offender. But if I am wicked, why have I labored in vain? Job 9, 27-29. This is to say, I will change my interior aspect. How? I will overthrow the thing that I am. Changeable, overcome by the blood in my veins, at one time full of delight and at another time anger, and at another time unbearable sadness. For I look into myself as one who sees a delightful face when I gladly pursue these things. But against my will I will change this and turn myself to good work. And when I do so, I am tortured as by a scourge, for I am forcing myself and tearing myself away from my familiar face, which is my will toward perverse delights. I am joining myself to meditation and in my good conscience attaining the vision of God, who cannot be reached by the lusts of the flesh. And because of these two choices, I fear all my works. How? When I do good works, I fear that it is not perfect before God, for I do not see it clearly, but as in a dark glass. Sometimes I know in the spirit, but sometimes I do not know it because of being weighed down by the body. But when I do an evil work, my spirit's conscience is in confusion. For I know within me that those who knowingly sin are not spared. That is, when a person understands that his deed is contrary to God, he must be purged, either by the penalty in the body, or by penance, or by the punishment through torture in the life to come. And so a transgressor is not spared if he does not repent. He is not given the power to sin in order to use it. And if he does, he must be chastised either here or hereafter. Therefore, if I am so wicked and obstinate that I do not want to give in and turn from my own things, which are my sins, 
and if I am so weak that I cannot face the great struggle against myself, and if I am always contrary to God in my motives, conceived in sin and desiring to work iniquity and not fearing the Lord's judgment on me? Why am I forced to labor in vain, often opposing the evil in myself through my knowledge of God? For I am not so weak that I do not know good from evil. Thus, if I drive out my understanding and say, I do not know God, I am a liar. For the knowledge of my debt to God convicts me when I start to do wickedness. But when I oppose evil with a good conscience, I do not labor in vain, for I am the work of God, and so I turn to him and receive the good reward. 4. Sinners can receive grace by penance or suffer future punishment. Therefore I, who am the Lord of all things, say that it is needful that each person pay for his sins, either by groaning sorrow, or by contrite penitence, or by a proper punishment, in this world or in the world to come. How? Those who fear their sins and repent in sorrow deserve to rise by God's grace from the sins of their purgation. And when they are not fully purged in this world, they will have purgation unto life in the world to come. But those who are so hard-hearted that they do not wish to acknowledge their sins or repent them in fear and sorrow, but continue to defy God by their wickedness, are not purged of their sin either in this life or in the life to come, but will suffer pains without consolation or purgation unto life. For they were created by me with rational minds, yet did not give the proper reply to disobedience. How? 5. Human reason can counter evil with good, or good with evil. Human reason can understand two ways to the knowledge of good and evil, and choose two replies, also good and evil. How? Good replies to evil when by God's help it resists it, but evil replies to good when, with the devil's help, it attacks it. Those who live in goodness answer evil by refraining from it and taking no pleasure in their own delight. But those who live in evil answer good by not withdrawing from bad deeds. They feast on their own lusts and refuse to answer evil challenge. How? 6. Man is called two ways, one leading to life and the other to death. Each person has in himself two callings, the desire of fruit and the lust of vice. How? By the desire of fruit he is called toward life, and by the lust for vice he is called toward death. In the desire of fruit, a person wishes to do good and say to himself, Do good works, and this is the reply to evil, to avoid it and bring forth useful fruit. But in the lust of for vice, a person wants to do evil and say to himself, Do the work of your own pleasure, and this is the reply to good the refusal to resist iniquity and the delight in attaining to vice, whereby the person despises me and by not honoring me treats me as an impostor. And because he turns away from good and puts himself into no sorrow or affliction through fear of me, such a one turns celestial things to scorn, as enlightened by me, the psalmist David says. 7. Words of the Psalmist They have set their mouth against heaven, and their tongue has passed over the earth. Psalm 72, 9. This is to say, many people are foolish in understanding and unwilling to admit the infinite fear of the Lord. They cast away the good desire they should have for me, and the knowledge of the true God, and refuse assent to the good knowledge that assists people to perform good works in God. And they embrace bitterness and contradict the good, and so despoil themselves and steal from themselves the good treasure, laying up for themselves instead a treasure of multiple iniquities. And in those iniquities they apply their twisted minds to celestial works, and, opening their mouth in an evil way, destroy those works in rage and mockery, saying in their hearts, We can do the works of our own will as lawfully as those who are called celestial. For those were established without our knowledge, by the people of the Old Testament according to their own pleasure, and thus they mock the words of the institutions of the Old Testament fathers, which were established by me in heavenly works. And so, tasting wicked deeds as if with their tongues, they excite and surpass themselves in the greatest possible audacity. They boldly fulfill their own wills and have no desire to restrain their bodies from vice. And so, without their minds working, they are, as it were, rolled on the ground by the desires of their flesh which are the seductions of the devil. 8. God's wondrous judgments were seen in the Old Testament to make him feared. 
So you see this head of marvelous form, which is to say that in the jealousy of the Lord are marvels and wondrous divine judgments, such as no person weighed down by sin can know. It is planted firmly by the neck at the outside of the corner. This means that, as was shown through Abraham and Moses in the Old Testament, my jealousy against the devil is plain to the sight of the people in reflective knowledge and in human deeds, and they may fear me and stand face to face with my terror. And my justice faces the north to threaten Satan's cruel iniquity. 9. God's rectitude in judging is not moved by deceitful or adulatory words. It remains immovable, for God cannot be moved, or his righteous judgment of unatoned sin softened, by deceitful or adulatory words. And so it renders to each person who does not observe the precepts of the law the punishments he deserves for the evil deeds that have sunk him in filth. It is set up by God to establish laws for humans according to their works, and with its excelling strength, like the strength of its neck, it resists the devil and his followers and opposes itself to their injustice. 10. Supernal vengeance does not exceed the gravity of the deed it punishes. It is at the same height from the ground that the wall itself rises to it in that corner. For God, in his supreme avenging justice, towers above all earthly things, and his vengeance exactly matches human deeds, as shown by the law of its foreshadowing of Abraham and Moses. For divine judgment is as high as any mystical speculation or deed of the people, to throw down their ignorance if they refuse to know God. But it is no higher, so that the top of the head just equals the summit of the wall, for heavenly vengeance does not surpass human deeds or punish their evil more than it is deserved. It only judges all things equitably and righteously in excelling justice. This the psalmist David knows in the spirit when he says, 11. Words of David. I have known, O Lord, that your judgments are equity and your truth you have humbled me. Psalms 118.75 this is to say, by your goodness, O Lord, I have experienced in myself that you do not judge the knowing or the ignorant in your power or your anger more than they deserve. For you have not slain me from my sin or taken the power of, to act from my soul or body. For I do good to my adversaries, but I do evil in the desire of my flesh. And therefore you reward the good and judge the evil, but you judge only as is equitable and just. How? If you were harshly inflexible about the nature of human deeds, it would not be equity or judgment. But if you carelessly neglected spurring us to penance and did not try to purge our iniquities, then, O oh just God, you would be condoning and encouraging injustice. Death indeed was most bitter judgment for the sin of Adam. But now you recall man to life by the grace restored in penitence, and this would be impossible for anyone but you who are God. And this purgation unto life and grace is your just and equitable judgment, for your judgments are meted out in right measure for each case. All that you do is in the truth, and so you never wrongfully exceed the measure. For both excess and deficiency in justice are wrongful, and you use your power sparingly and in mercy, never slaying anyone just because your glorious power can do so, but rather choosing to spare by penitence. Therefore I have humbled myself on account of your mercy, giving glory to your name, and I am troubled over what my faults deserve in your judgment. 12. God sees every injustice, and no human can understand his judgment. And you see that this head is fiery in color, sparkling like a fiery flame. This is because God's jealousy is a fierce obstacle to evil, glowing red in the powerful fire of his vengeance. And it has terrible human face, for the eyes of the Lord see all injustices face to face, and no guilt of crime is unsearched by his terrible gaze. He examines all by his just judgment and turns a human face towards the acting of carnal desires because it is human actions that are thus monstrous and horrifying. And it looks in great anger toward the north, for God in his vengeance scorns all evil that rises from the temptations of the devil. And from the neck drawn you see nothing of this figure's body, for the rest of it is hidden by its pressing into the corner. Which is to say that the righteous judgment 
with which the jealousy of God scatters the evil works of the wicked cannot be fully seen by any human sense, for they are hidden and covered by the corner of reflective knowledge and human deeds. Thus they cannot be seen or understood by investigation except sometimes when something is shown to be a case of God's judgment, which appears as a human face according to his will. And so in such a vengeance there is nothing automatic, except that people always receive just judgments according to their sins, for their crimes, as it was said before, are not left unexamined, but are probed by the jealousy of the Lord. 13. The jealousy of God, justly judging human acts, is awful to all creatures. And so you see its head, a bare human head, which is to say that the jealousy of the Lord is not subject to mortality, but is bare of all weakness, justly judging human acts. It is not covered by hair like a man's, or by a veil like a woman's, for it feels no masculine anxiety about being conquered by one superior in strength, nor has it any feminine weakness, as of a timid mind afraid that it cannot conquer its opponents. But it is more manly than womanly, for the mighty power of God resembles manly virility more than it does softly womanly weakness. And it is very terrible to see, for jealousy is terrible and fearsome to all creatures when they feel its vengeance in their case. 14. The Holy Trinity judges all people rightly according to their intentions. It has three wings of wondrous breadth and length, white like a cloud. This symbolizes the expansion of the ineffable power of the Holy Trinity. No one can comprehend the extent of its glory and the limits of its power as it shines with the immense sweetness and brightness of divinity. In its righteous vengeance it subdues all human minds, as they flit hither and thither diffusely like clouds. These wings are not raised, but extended straight out from each other, so that the body is slightly higher than they are. For the vengeance of the Lord is not puffed up by any arrogance, but adapts itself to each case according to its merits, and so it stretches forth within the boundaries of the righteousness in the just judgment of its correction. And God's potential strength, like the head of his vengeance, exceeds it in power. And so those human deeds which the true Trinity does not let go unexamined are not punished or crushed as severely as that power could, if it willed. 15. God's jealousy beats the devil by Christ and the elect, and in Antichrist. The first wings rise from the right side of the jaw and stretches towards the northeast. For God in his just judgment conquers the devil and all evil first by his Son, who is at his right hand for salvation. The second and middle one points from the throat to the north. For after salvation was wrought by the Son of God, and in the middle times, when the faith was already strengthened, and its sweetness tasted by the elect, God put the roaring enemy to flight by their means, and snatched them from his jaws. And the third stretched from the left side of the jaw towards the west. For Satan, having been put to flight by the elect of God, will be completely crushed and consigned to perdition on God's left hand, in the person of the son of perdition, when the world approaches the end of its days. Sometimes these wings move very terribly, and strike these regions, for the jealousy of God is moved to vengeance by its terrible and formidable judging of every creature. It exercises its judgments and strikes wherever in their justice it pleases the divine majesty. For where fear and love and honor of God are held in faith and reverence, God shows himself mild and gentle, and does not exercise his vengeance. But he chastises terribly those who are hard and rebellious. 16. The hardened who despise God and man's warnings are lost. And therefore the first wings of my vengeance strike and cast into the abyss of perdition those people hardened more than stones who ignore their inner faculties and despise my justice. They look to their own intellects and consent to carnal desire and diabolical temptations rather than seeking true justice. They refuse to turn away from their iniquity by their own decision or by my admonition or by human exhortations, and so they outrage the spirit of their own knowledge. For they seek and perform the injustice of the devil instead of my justice. They pour, so to speak, melted lead into their hearts, which is to say, dissolute desires for evil decadence, and so they make them as hard as iron in forgetfulness of God, and are themselves hardened like iron. And then they spare no one in their wickedness for the sake of God or man. 17. 
the element complaints of the hardness of the impenitent who are punished. And against them the elements in all creation cry out and complain that vile and short-lived human nature is so rebellious against God, while they themselves are doing God's will with fear and reverence. And so they are loud and terrible on the subject of man. How? It is not that the elements cry out with a voice or complain in the words of rational creatures, but that they cry out according to their nature with noisy sounds and complain by inspiring fear with their terrors. So God's just judgment moves them and the rest of creation to react to humanity, which is ever rebellious. While the elements themselves never go against or swerve from what the divine power commands them to do. And so these hardened people cruelly imitate Satan, who in the hardness of his iniquity refused to be subject to God his creator, and therefore he perished from all beatitude, and those who follow him will perish with him. 18. God brings the punishment of past villains on conscious sinners. And the middle wing of my jealousy strikes people who rave, and the presumptuous and evil deeds that they knowingly and rashly commit. The first such deed cried out in the blood of Abel, whom his brother hated because he was dear to God for offering his substance. Another was Pharaoh's, who was warned by my miraculous deeds and terrified by fear of me, and so let my people Israel go. But then in his madness he tried to bring them back, and therefore my jealousy swallowed him up. Another arose among the same people of mine. Though they knew me and saw my miraculous deeds, they adored the idol in Horeb, and therefore the crown fell from their head, and the law of God and the two stone tablets was corrupted by them and others like them, and therefore they fell from their glory and happiness, and my vengeance fell on them, and my servant Moses in jealousy of me meted out punishments to the contrary people who opposed me so often. He sternly told my chosen that every man should kill his brother and friend and neighbor, and later he forcefully ordered the judges of that same people to kill their neighbors, who were initiated into these rites of Belphegor. And so I avenged myself, and the iniquity that fought against me was slain. 19. God's justice, developing from Abel to Christ, is avenged by his jealousy. And when God's justice had first arisen in Abel, in all of these evils and perverse generations, many other elect were found. They collected and honored my smallest precepts like true children of Israel, and among them arose sorrow and longing for the humanity of my son. And when my son appeared, born of the virgin, all the justice of the law was baked and salted and became pleasing food for all the people who believed in me when the apostles showed them the truth. And so, in all those generations, my jealousy has avenged and will avenge my justice upon its conscious transgressors. For God was and is and will be, and his justice, which scours off all the rust of injustice, will not end until all tribes and peoples cease to be. 20. The jealousy of God will cast down all who harm the church or its property. Therefore, in my jealousy, I removed and cast out the iniquity of anyone who, like a dog, despises the church, which flowers in me and of anyone who in insane wickedness destroys a place consecrated to me, or any rites which properly belong to my temple, for the rites were instituted by foreshadowing by my servant Jacob, as the scripture narrates. 21. Jacob's action prefiguring the dedication of churches. And Jacob arising in the morning took the stone he had laid under his head and set it up as a marker, pouring oil upon the top of it, and he called the name of the city Bethel, Genesis 28, 18 through 19. That is to say, Jacob arose in the morning because he got up as a timely lover of true justice in the newly constituted temple. On it he conferred a befitting name, since from it was to arise the most upright of temples, the Virgin Mary, from whom the Son of Justice would shine forth. And he took the stone which prefigured an altar, which he had placed under his head, which is Christ, and sanctified it in the name of him who is the true rock, and having sanctified it, named it. For every sanctification of an altar is under the power of Almighty God, the head of all the faithful, the order of the heavenly Jerusalem. For as in the heavenly Jerusalem Christ is the head of his members, so every sanctified altar is the most excellent part of the temple, for oil was poured over it, 
to symbolize the chrism, which is the grace of Almighty God outpoured in holy baptism. And he called that holy place the house and temple of God, which is the name of the city of the heavenly Jerusalem, the living temple of the living God. 22. A sealed stone legitimizes communion even without a temple around it. Therefore, by this example and foreshadowing, when a temple is planned in my name, a stone must be erected, for the temple itself is signified by a stone, since I am the firm rock of all justice and Christian law, and wherever the body of my son is to be sacrificed, there must be a sanctified place where a stone is sealed with my name even if by some impossible chance there cannot be a temple there. For I am the strength of truth, and my servant Jacob erected his stone in foreshadowing, as was said of my son becoming incarnate of his race. 23. The work of the people should justify the building of a temple. Such a temple dedicated to me should not lack the activity which was the reason for its being put up, but be associated with the work of the people who minister to it, For the celestial Jerusalem, whose head is Christ, does not lack his justice, but is always mindful of the work of her children whom she will receive in God. How? They are to withdraw from the service of the devil, restrain themselves from the desires their flesh craves, and for love of the heavenly, cut off their own natures and afflict themselves against their own interests. Thus they should not use all they possess, but withhold some and offer it to God in his honor. As my exemplary servant, Jacob appointed tithes of all of his substance. For as again it is written, he said, 24. How and why Jacob gave a tenth of all his possessions. Of all things that you shall give me, I will offer a tenth to you. Genesis 28:22, Which is to say, of all that you give me, I will offer the tenth part to you, because this is your law. First I will tithe my soul, O oh my God, and cut away my own will from it offering you your own justice against myself, and then I will tithe all the goods I have on earth. What does this mean? That every faithful person who is numbered in the tenth order of the citizens of heaven should give my temple the tenth of his substance, to reflect the redemption by which is counted in that tenth order of the number of God's knowledge, for they live and belong to the true temple, that of the celestial Jerusalem. 25. Woe to destroyers, defilers, despisers, and cheaters of churches. But to those who forget their fear of me and in insane wickedness destroy temples dedicated in my name, or defile that dedication originated by Jacob by polluting holy places with murderous blood, or the impure seed of adultery or fornication, or when offering the supernal sacrifice ignore the Old Testament fathers, and neglect to do it in the presence of the sealed stone like Jacob's, or fail to give the tithes or the property to my temples that I justly decreed? O woe to those wretches! O woe to those wretches! O woe to those wretched people who so shamefully misguide themselves and so perversely before my face neglect my institutions, translated out of the old law. For the new law was brought forth out of the Old Testament by my Son, In the mercy of grace and all the justice of the law and the prophets was increased in my son, since all the signs the ancient fathers uttered secretly in obscurity were in him showed clearly in total justice. 26. Those who share church property with the wicked are thrown down by God. Those who divide the property of the church with dogs and swine and other beasts, which is to say with evil people, shall be cast down by the jealousy of God from the highest to the lowest degree. As for those who despise and disdain the food of life derived from both testaments, treading it underfoot like mud and using it for their own purposes, I will also despise them and their posterity, casting them down from the highest to the lowest and from the riches to poverty in the vengeance of my jealousy. 27. How God's vengeance strikes both believers and unbelievers. The third wing of my vengeance strikes both believers and unbelievers in their wicked and unjust works. It strikes believers who do not use their will to do good and just works, who clearly see the faith and know God's justice, but nonetheless sit in the gloom of evil deeds, foolishly long for the darkness of inquiry and perversely will to give themselves to madness. But God does not let them do their will. For he cuts it off from them by his vengeance as long as they forget him and cover themselves in obscurity and freely avoid him. 
but it strikes the unbeliever in their unbelief, so that even their iniquity is taken from them by the retribution of vengeance, and they cannot do the evil they would gladly do. And so the malicious devil, conquered by the blessedness of the fruitful souls who shine forth before God's eyes, wants in his wickedness to draw the faithful into darkness and death, but he has no hold on them greater than their deeds warrant. 28. How fearfully God's vengeance consumes those who gain power by injustice. And there is another kind of people on earth who are rich in a spirit of intelligence. Since their minds are illumined, they are wise enough to remember God if they would. But because of their intelligence, they presumptuously seek to know the wisdom for themselves and do whatever they want with it. And so they mingle justice with iniquity, but they are fools in their wisdom and they think of themselves as completely able to possess and lay hold and acquire their full wishes, whatever they are. But as they are seeking to lift their wings in power in the provinces and the cities, and the other places, the things they are busy governing and willfully ignoring the fact that God watches and measures what they do, they are dismissed and cast out from before God's eyes, for they judge with wicked and unjust judgments and did not make the wise choice of fearing the Lord. And so through this, my jealousy, they will become a great lamentation and speak tearfully before all people who will see and hear the day when their iniquity is judged. Some of them will go on living in great misery and deprivation, and some will die a terrible death with diverse sufferings. By such a variety of fates, my jealousy punishes and consumes all injustice, for it is repugnant to me. 29. God's jealousy does not loudly warn, but firmly and justly judges. But you do not hear the head uttering any words. It only remains motionless in body and strikes with its wings from time to time in the places towards which they extend, as was mentioned. This is to say that in the jealousy of the Lord there is no clamorous voice or warning raised in its pride, but a motionless persistence in strength and righteous judgment. It punishes the mad deeds that merit its vengeance, deeds done without fear of the Lord. It confounds and crushes them to the full extent of its justice, as was shown to you, O human, in this most true vision. And because God is just, it is needful to examine all injustice by the standard of his justice, for God himself knows well the capacity of man's knowledge to scrutinize all things. 30. Man's knowledge is like a mirror reflecting the desire for good or evil. For knowledge in man is like a mirror, in which lies latent his desire to do good or evil. And each person standing between these two choices inclines himself by his will towards the one he desires. The person who turns towards the good and with God's help embraces it in works of faith will be praised and blessedly rewarded, for he has spurned evil and chosen good, but the one who turns towards evil and absorbs its nature into himself by the perverse conduct suggested by the devil will wretchedly undergo a just retribution, for he has neglected good and done evil. Therefore, one who submits himself to God in devotion and humility will faithfully work out his salvation, which comes from the supreme good. His soul will be joyfully filled with inner holiness, for he is serving his creator in well-disposed and ordinate single-heartedness. How? 31. Compunction leads to fear and fear to trembling, and they work justice. Compunction, which is the beginning of anguish, causes fear. Fear produces trembling, and by these three a person should do what is just. How? The person feels compunction and therefore begins to be in anguish. For by the gift of the Holy Spirit, his reason tells him to. It means that he cannot refuse to know God. And his knowledge of God causes fear in him so that he respects the things that are of God. And if he knows God and desires these things, the fiery grace of Christ strikes him and tells him to tremble and be terrified in his conscience. And then he may faithfully work God's justice. 32. The first root of human choice and the fiery grace of Christ. Now therefore, O human, understand and learn, from whence do these things come? What does this mean? It is God who works in you what is good. How? He has so constituted you that when you act with wisdom and discretion, you feel him in your reason. For the irrational animal does all its deeds without intellect or wisdom, without discretion or shame. It does not know God, being irrational, though it feels him, being his creature. 
But the rational animal, which is man, has intellect and wisdom, discretion and shame, and does rational deeds, which is the first root fixed by God's grace in every person, given life and soul. These powers flourish when there is reason. For all of them make people know God, so that they may choose what is just. Therefore, the deeds that a person embraces in his Savior, the Son of God, through whom the Father does his work, and in the Holy Spirit is productive and perfect and prosperous. And the fiery grace of Christ Jesus calls this to the person's mind and kindles his enthusiasm anew. 33. No sinner may murmur against his Creator. Therefore, let each person perform works of justice in the joy of the Holy Spirit, and not hesitate and perversely murmur. Let him not say that he lacks anything when he has the first root placed in him by God's gift and the fiery grace of the Holy Spirit, which touches that rip admonition. For if he were thus to fall into perversity, his reprehensible urge would bring him into anguish. His interior root would be diminished, and he would fall further into compulsion. And then he would truly murmur to himself, Alas, alas, what have I done, not being able to discern my works in God? So let him also go forward without the burden of unbelief. Let him not distrust God in his works, but avoid evil deeds, and thus be safe from tearful lamentation. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words, and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 6. The Stone Wall of the Old Law and after this I saw the wall of the aforementioned building, which ran between the north and west corners, and its inner side was all arched like a chancel, except that it was not open like chancel arches, but unbroken, and each arch had the picture of a human being in it. And on the outer side of this wall I saw two smaller walls extending from the north to the west corner, and joined to these corners at each end like a vault. The height of these two lesser walls was three cubits, the distance between the inner arched wall and the middle one was one cubit. Between the middle one and the outer one, it was one palm, and that a child's. And inside the building I saw six figures standing on its pavement before the arched wall. Three were grouped together before the wall near the north corner, and three were together at the end of the wall that looked to the west. And they were all looking at the pictures in the arches on the wall. And at the same end of the wall I saw another figure within the building, sitting on a stone resting on the pavement for a seat and leaning against the wall to her right, but turning her face toward the pillar of the true trinity. And at the same end, I saw another figure standing on the wall above the first, also turning towards the pillar of the true trinity. And in these figures, I saw the following resemblances. The last two were clothed in silk garments and white shoes, as were the first six, except that the right hand figure in the group of three standing at the end of the wall was so pure and bright that I could not discern any detail about her because of her great splendor, and that the one who was standing on the wall was wearing black shoes. And none of these wore a cloak except the middle one of the three who stood at the beginning of the wall. She was wearing a cloak. And two of the same three, the ones to the right and the left of the middle one, and the two of the other three, the middle and the left figures, did not have women's veils on their heads, but stood with bare heads and white hair. But the middle one of the first three, and the one who sat on the stone next to the wall, had white head veils in the manner of women. And the middle and the right hand ones of the second three were clothed in white tunics, and I saw the following differences between them. The figure who stood in the middle of the three first ones had a yellow circlet like a crown on her head, with this inscription carved on the right side, Always burn. And I saw that a dove was flying at the right side of this figure and breathing out this writing from its beak. And that figure was saying, one, words of abstinence. I am poured forth from the inner compassion, from which springs the river of mercy, which never tries to hide money or precious stones or pearls from the poor and needy under any pretense. For they do not have the necessities of life and thus are weeping. I will console them and forever refresh their poverty for the love of the sweet and mild Son of God, who distributes his goods in the souls of the just and heals the wounds of their sins because of their penitence. 
and the second figure standing at her right had a lion on her breast that gave off light like a mirror, and hanging from her neck to her breast on a twisted flexible rod was a pale colored serpent. And she said, two, words of liberality. I contemplate the light-giving lion, and I give for the sake of his love. I flee from the fiery serpent, but I love the serpent hanging from the rod. And the third figure on the left was clad in a tunic of hyacinth thread. On her breast was a picture of an angel, a wing out on either side, so that its right wing stretched to the figure's right shoulder and its left wing to her left shoulder. And this figure said, three, words of piety. My companionship is with angels, and I do not choose to walk with dissembling hypocrites, for I feast with the just. Now the figure who stood in the middle of the three second ones was dressed in a yellow tunic. Above her right shoulder hovered a dove of exceeding whiteness, breathing into her right ear. On her breast was the picture of a monstrous and shapeless human head. Beneath her feet lay the likeness of people trodden down and crushed by her. In her hands she held a document, fully unrolled. On one side, the side that faced heaven, there was seven lines of writing. I tried to read it, but could not. And she said, four, words of truth. I choose to be the rod and scourge of bitter correction against that liar who is the son of the devil. For the devil is the persecutor of the ineffable justice of God. Hence, I oppose him and trouble him. I am never found in his mouth, and I spit him out of my mouth like a deadly poison. For with all his cunning, he has never found me. He is, to me, the worst and most troublesome of all evils, since all evils originated from him. Hence I cast him out and tread him underfoot in the lovable justice of God, which I love unceasingly and without end, and support and lead. For on me the whole edifice of God's virtues, which build on high, is stabilized and will stand, O God, who art strong and noblest, hearken. The second figure on her right had an angelic face and wings capable of flying stretched out to each side, but she was in human form, like the other virtues, and she said, 5. Words of Peace I rebuff the attacks of the devil which come against me, saying, I will not suffer tribulation, but I will rid myself of all my adversaries. I am not willing to fear any. Whom should I fear? But those who utter this evil speech are cast out through me. For I have been appointed always to be glad and rejoice in all good things. For the Lord Jesus abates and consoles all pain. He who bore pain in his own body. And because he is the restorer of justice, I choose to unite myself to him and sustain him always. Free of hatred and envy and all evils. And I also choose to present a joyful face to your justice, O God. And the third figure on the left was clothed in a white tunic, picked out with green. And she had in her hands a small vase pale and shining, which gave off bright light like lightning. And this light shone on the face and the neck of the figure, and she said, Six words of beatitude. I am happy, for the Lord Jesus adorns me and makes me beautiful and white, because I have flown from the deadly counsel of the devil, which always reverts to misery, seeking by evil deeds that God rejects. I fly from this Satan, I reject him and hold him as an enemy forever. For I desire that lover whom I may fervently embrace and joyfully possess in and above all things. Now the figure who sat on the stone at this end of the wall was clothed in a black tunic. On her right shoulder she bore a small cross with the image of Jesus Christ, which turned hither and thither. And as from the clouds there shone on her breast a wondrous bright light, divided into many rays, as is the splendor of the sun when it shines through an object's many small openings, in her right hand she held a small branch, like a fan, from the top of which three twigs had wonderfully sprouted forth into flower. And in her bosom she carried some minute stones, jewels of all kinds, which she looked at very carefully and diligently as a merchant looks over his goods. And she said, Seven. Words of Discretion. I am the mother of virtues, and I have God's justice in all things, in spiritual war and in secular tumult, Within my conscience, I always wait upon my God. I do not condemn. I do not trample. I do not spurn kings and dukes and counts and other secular ruling powers who were ordained by the ruler of all things. How were it lawful for ashes to spurn ashes? 
the crucified Son of God turns himself to all people, admonishing them by his justice and mercy, and I choose to submit to each of his ordinances and institutes according to his will. And this figure that stood on the wall at the same end was bareheaded, with curly black hair and swarthy face. She was dressed in a tunic of many different colors, and I saw that she took off the tunic and her shoes and stood naked, and suddenly her hair and her face gleamed newly white, like a newborn baby, and her whole body shone like light. And then I saw on her breasts a splendid cross with the image of Christ Jesus. It was depicted above a little bush with two flowers on it, a lily and a rose, which reached upward towards the cross, and I saw her vigorously beat the tunic and shoes she had taken off, so that a great deal of dust flew out of them. And she said, Eight words of salvation. I take off the Old Testament and I put on the noble Son of God with his justice and holiness and truth, and thus I am restored to my good deeds and stripped of my vices. Therefore, O my God, I beseech you, do not remember the sins of my youth and my ignorance and take not revenge on my sins. Psalms 24, 7, Tobias 3, 3. And as I looked attentively on these things, the one seated on the throne again spoke to me. 9. No Christian should refuse to submit to government, prefigured of old. Let none of the faithful who humbly wish to obey God hesitate to submit to human institution of government. For through the Holy Spirit, the authority of the church has been ordained for the use of the people while they live. And it was prefigured in the people of the Old Testament that human government is included in churchly authority and should be kept faithfully and firmly. Hence, you see the wall of the aforementioned building which runs between the north and the west corners and its inner side is all arched like a chancel, except that it is not open like a chancel arch, but unbroken. This symbolizes the times of Abraham and Moses, who resisted the devil, as it were in the northern corner, until the open declaration of the true trinity in the true and Catholic faith, when the Son of God was sent into the world by God the Father in the last days, and set forth his doctrine in abundance, as it were in the western corner, in that period, the wall, which is to say the Israelite people, was set up in the law of God's justice, which built the building of the goodness of the Almighty Father. That is, in the Old Testament, the Israelite people were curbed and united, and after the harshness displayed by the jealousy of God because of the deeds of the early rulers, the reign of the new dignities was foreshadowed. For the Old Testament extended till the time of the new, and from that sprang the greater precepts of the law of the New Testament. Thus from the lesser the greater was born, the greater and broader new doctrine from the lesser doctrine in the Old Commands. For the Old Testament was only the foundation laid down that the profoundest wisdom of all might be built on it, the wisdom manifest in the incarnation of the Son of God. So the old wisdom lasted from the law of circumcision to the new rule of baptism, which was adorned with greater commands. 10. The Incarnation made clear by the grace of the Spirit what the law hid. And the wall, which is to say the Jewish people and their inner understanding, by which the human soul knows God, was all arched, which is to say surrounded on all sides by their predecessors, wisdom which proclaimed the commands of the law of God, and walled in and protected by that wisdom, as lesser people are wont to be guided by greater ones. This is the meaning of the structure of the chancel which is to say the foreshadowing in a type by the Holy Spirit. For by the incarnation of the Son of God who manifests the archways of his mercy as a refuge for all who ask, the Spirit elucidated the difficult writings. But the wall was not opened by the doorkeeper, that is to say the Holy Spirit, who laid bare the spiritual meaning of the old law. The archways of mercy were opened in the flesh of the Son of the Most High, when he was made manifest, but the old wall remained closed in the harsh precepts of the law, even though that law was later made clear through the Holy Spirit in the fountain of living water. 11. A person invested with a government dignity represents God, and each arch has the picture of a human being in it. For as these pictures show human images, so a person in a triumphal arch, which is to say a government dignity, stands in the place of God. How? Because by the grace of God, profound and excelling wisdom is placed in the mouth of human reason. And so a human being, in the name of God, can exercise an office of instruction as a representative of the justice and mercy of the Most High Himself. 12. A spiritual office is the greater. One which rules the people is lesser. And on the outer side of the wall, you see two smaller walls. 
which is to say that in outward affairs there is the intermittent establishment of greater and lesser people set up by God's authority like two walls. The outer one is the people of high birth, who by my ordinances have the might of secular power. The middle one is the lesser people who live under the power of both spiritual and secular persons, and thus are between the arches of the inner wall, which is spiritual government, and the outer wall, which, as said, is secular power. And so there are two walls outside the circumference of the inner arched wall, for secular persons in earthly affairs have more outward than inward qualities, and yet they are part of my appointed order. How? 13. The outer authority is an allegory for the inner. Through outward things the inner ones are understood, and so, when people see from the visible and exalted dignity of one in power how he should be feared and honored and loved, they should also understand by the same insight how the invisible and most high God is to be dreaded and worshipped and loved above all things. For by outward and secular dominion people are taught about the inward and spiritual power of the divine majesty, which is so concealed and hidden from humanity that no fleshly eye can see it unless faith grasps it. So God is invisible to mortal creatures, but at least through visible authority people can learn to fear and worship the Most High, who established it. How? 14. Why God lets one kind of person excel and another be subject. God's inspiration gave the human mind, by means of its reason, a sense that great persons should rule the people and be feared and honored by them. For God has allowed one kind of person to rule and another to be subject, so that people would be divided into two groups, and so would not kill each other off and perish, or because if the example were not given by fearing and honoring human beings, the people would be lazy and not know how to acknowledge God. Therefore the Holy Spirit led the people to the inner spiritual law, which could rule them inwardly and outwardly, until the fountain sprang up and flowed forth into the world in the fullness of justice to rule both body and soul. So secular powers are set up to order earthly things, and that the body may seek refreshment and not faint. And the spiritual authorities established that the soul might long for celestial things and aspire to the service of God. And so both these things are established by my order, as Isaac said to his son Jacob. 15. Words of Isaac to Jacob. Be the Lord of your brethren, and let your mother's children bow down before you. Genesis 27-29. Which is to say... Be the Lord of your brothers, powerful over them in honor and triumphs, blessed by the benedictions given me by God. And let all the children of your mother's children bow down before you, subject to you because of your exceeding blessing. For out of you shall come forth a great race, from which will arise the man most strong and mighty, whom his brothers shall persecute and drive away. But he will escape them like a lion in his strength and rule them with most excellent rule. And he will restrain them in the name of his power, and never dwindle into a mere appendage like a tail. His brothers will become the tail. And thus to I, the Heavenly Father, said to my incarnate Son, Be the Lord of all who are born of human seed, who were created by me through you. For you were born miraculously of a virgin, not conceived by the seed of a man. You went forth from me as a flaming fire, and appeared on earth as a true man. But the seal of the untouched and chaste virgin remained closed. You, therefore, in the supernatural light of divinity, are the Lord of those who, by your incarnation as a mere man, are your brothers. And so let the children of the mother of your incarnation bow down and be subject to you, and all peoples born of humanity serve you in loving devotion. And since the Son of God is thus Lord of all creatures, by the will of the Father and the touch of the Holy Spirit, he also establishes the order of the different powers in the world. How? Thus. There was excess and vaunting because no people honored any other people, and everyone was doing as he pleased. And this would have continued if God in his infinite wisdom had not done away with it. Therefore, he made distinctions between one people and the other. He made the lesser subject to the greater in the service of obedience, and he made the greater help and serve the lesser with intelligence and devotion, just as was granted to Jacob by his father, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to be Lord of his brothers. 16. This means that there are three orders, rulers, free people, and servants. And by his being made Lord, it was shown that in secular affairs there is a kind of person who is to rule over others' freedom. They honor him for his authority, and thus he spares them and does not oppress them by claiming service from them, but cherishes them with fraternal love. 
but when it says they are made to bow before him, it symbolizes the service due from those who are released from the bonds of servants, but remain children of the flesh with fleshly cares. But later, Jacob stole the lordship of his brother through his father's blessing, and then gained heavenly renown by the stone he set up as a sign and a tithe he vowed to give, as was said. And so he symbolizes each protagonist in the spiritual army, for every faithful person must ascend from the lowest rank to the highest. That is, he must learn from the secular powers the higher authority and clearer light of the spiritual life. For in the latter is fulfilled the office of ruler by the way of the Immaculate Lamb, who has lifted man on high in the plentitude of goodness and justice, raising him up from the snares of the wicked robber who laid him low. 17. How secular and spiritual people are each divided into four categories. And hence the two ways of life concerning with earthly and with heavenly things are divided into four parts each. And God gave man the great power of reason that, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he may know these parts in himself by the pattern of the four elements. And thus he adds variety to the two ways, which I do not spurn or reject. For he who in my name multiplies what is less is worthy of reward and not of rejection. And these four parts pertain as much to the secular as to the spiritual life. For in secular affairs there are lesser and greater nobles, servants and followers. And in spiritual matters there are excellent and the superior and the obeyers and the enforcers. 18. No one may seize, steal, or buy either a spiritual or secular office. And I do not will that these offices which I establish should be seized or stolen or put up for sale. I want them given for reasonable cause, that those who receive them may be useful to God and humanity. But there are poisonous scorpions who ignore my justice, and in the deadly venom of their avarice and their pride usurp these positions. And this is not just in secular, but also in spiritual offices. The usurping of secular offices, in which the earthly confronts the earthly, will be harshly judged in the wrath of the jealousy of God. But the usurping of spiritual ones is more serious and more punishable. For secular people are flesh of flesh in outward things, but spiritual people are inwardly joined to the Spirit. Secular people indeed, though occupied with outer things and earthly cares, should seek to be guided by the inner Spirit in their duties. But spiritual people are within the ranks of religious and must scorn earthly things and rest fully in the hearts of the Almighty Father. And so they have a much greater obligation to be ardently in imitation of the priesthood of the Son. For as the Son went forth from the heart of his Father, so the Father in his Son set up people to be his officials, arrayed in their ranks to serve the church and be united to God in good work. How? 19. Those worthy of office are intelligent, moral, eloquent, and modest. There are those who have compunction and well-searched hearts and mature minds in all else that is good to me. They have good consciences, so that they do not seek office wickedly by conflict, or try to obtain it by devilish arts, or buy it with money, or with secular power, or seek it for for the sake of fleeting words of human praise. Rather, they receive it in humility by my true choice and the election of the people, and these are my most dear and proved guardians and my surest friends. 20. Those who flee God and seize office devilishly will be punished later. But there are those who go backward and get power in the dark, not caring how. They snatch the celestial mysteries by craft, by secular and earthly means, and such people fly from my face and the bitterness slay their own souls. They deride me and deny me and kick against my will. How? By despising me. They do not desire to attain to office through me or raise their inner hearts visions to me and say, does this please God or not? But each of them says within himself, even if this is bad in God's sight, I will accept it. I will trust in the Lord and at some point while I still live, I will repent. And thus they get the authority without me, the living God, and never ask me for it or trust to attaining it by my will. In their impatience they flee before my face, snatching at offices and running aground from the sea of my mercy. These people therefore are not inside the heart of the Supreme Father. They are outside, wandering in the regions of the north, which rules them in these matters. They choose not to seek me, the creator of all, but to seek their own will and hold it in place of God, and follow it and abandon me. They do not wish to know me, nor I them. Their desires prompt them to do as they wish. 
and because they refuse to fear me, I choose not to stop them at once by the terror of my wrath, and so their deeds will be held against them on the day when they can no longer prevail. If I let them go in this life, they will have to answer in the fearful last judgment for what they have done, for they had knowledge of me in faith, yet chose to ignore me in the deeds they did. 21. By the ordination of providence, these human distinctions exist forever. But you see that the two lesser walls extend from the north to the west corner. This is to say that when the greater and lesser orders of people were established from the time of Abraham and Moses, as in the north, to the manifestation of the Catholic faith and the true trinity taught by my son, as in the west, the distinction between people and their rulers was set up in my law. And thus was the germ of the prototype of the people of the New Testament, shown in advance and lasting till the time my son by my zeal was born in the flesh. So these distinctions were and are and always will be between people of inner and outer life, spiritual and secular people, and greater and lesser people. They are joined to these corners at each end like a vault. For the peoples are united in honor and teaching to the Old Testament at the beginning and the New Testament at the end. And it is like a vault because by the workings of divine providence they are well and worthy conformed to the structures of the heavenly Jerusalem. 22. There are three kinds of secular people, greater and lesser. The height of these two lesser walls is three cubits, which indicates that when the two secular conditions are rightfully upheld, there are three divisions between the people, the rulers, and those who are free from bonds of servitude, and the common people who are subject to their governors. 23. Spiritual rulers should excel in unity of faith, and so the distance between the inner arched wall and the middle one is one cubit, for that is the distance between the dignity of those high in spiritual authority and those who hold the lesser titles of earthly government appointed in the unity of faith according to God's will to hold in check the subject to him. 24. The secular rulers and the people must have innocent and loving relations. And between the middle one and the outer one, it is one palm, and that a child's. For between the lesser people and the secular governments and the servitude of the subject, there must be thoughtful justice, and the two must touch each other with the hands of their joint labor in the single-minded and simple devotion of childlike innocence. 25. In the work of God, six virtues prefigure all the others. And inside the building you see six figures standing on its pavement before the arched walls, this is to say that when God works goodness, six virtues appear, which prefigure all the other virtues, as in six days God created his creatures. These virtues stand before the wall as a preview of things to come. They stand before the Israelite people, who were bridled by the divine law and walled about by the authority and defense of their forerunners. And they tread underfoot the pavement of earthly cares, which forms the floor of the Supreme Father's building to signify that the army of Christians through them can fight the devil. 26. The position of these six virtues and the two others. Therefore, three are grouped together before the wall near the north corner. For when the Old Testament was begun by Abraham and Moses to oppose the devil, the holy and inseparable trinity, in the power of its majesty, was symbolized by diverse secret figures. And three are together at the end of the wall that looks to the west, for when the Son of God was born in the flesh at the end of time of the law to redeem the people who looked to the West, the Trinity, which reigns in the unity of the divinity, was preached openly by name. And they are all looking at the pictures of the arches of the walls, for all with equal devotion look at the authority of God's decrees for humanity, designated by his power and the law of the Old and the New Testament, and ponder how those decrees may be perfected in them. But at the same end of the wall, you see another figure within the building, sitting on a stone resting on the pavement for a seat. This is to say that when the old law of the Old Testament was laid by, and the new faith in the new trinity was begun, and God established all the constant virtues of the church, this virtue also appeared to do his work and will work through him in humans until the end of the world. And therefore she sits on the strongest of rocks, which is to say on God's only Son, for he is the seat and the repose of all the faithful who despise the transitory and with pure faith believe in him. And she leans against the wall to her right, 
for she rightfully reposes on the hope that this people, both the greater and the lesser, who by God's disposition have been placed under authority, may honor her in their works. But she turns her face towards the pillar of the true Trinity, for she directs her intentions towards the Trinity in everything, with sharpest vision and mental powers, as all who worship God must contemplate Him in their deeds, diligently and ceaselessly as the eternal Trinity inviolably in three persons. But at the same time you see another figure standing on the wall above the first. This is to say that when the shadows of the old law were transmuted by the faith of the Holy Trinity into the true light of justice, this virtue was elevated by the authority of rulers and the faithful people to the higher places. The desire for heavenly salvation. She stands there fighting against vice, upright in the Son of God, for she had her origin from him, and she shall remain with him in the heavenly Jerusalem when the world has ended. For she also turns towards the pillar of the true Trinity, for it is in her strength derived from the holy and ineffable Trinity that she brings back souls to their true country. 27. On the virtues clothing and what it means. And in these figures you see certain resemblances, for the virtues are of one mind, though diverse in the gifts of God. The first six and the last two are clothed in silk garments, which are the sweet works the worshippers of God offer to him in divine law and true justice, and white shoes, which are the eagerness to follow in purity the example of good human action. But the right-hand figure in the group of the three standing at the end of the wall is so pure and bright that you cannot discern any detail about her because of her great splendor. For this virtue, by the gift of the Holy Trinity, rose up in the true strength of salvation at the end of the ancient severity, so she is completely translucent and pure, devoid of all devilish impurities and shining with the joy of human gladness. And she has in the heavenly places such abundance of glory and honor that no exercise of reason by any mortal can comprehend or incomprehensible harmony unless God wills to reveal it. And the one who is standing on the wall is wearing black shoes, for before my son's incarnation, the sign and footprint of death were in all people both of the higher dignity and of the lesser. And none of these wears a cloak, which means that they have cast off care for the things of the earth and the outer garments of the law's commands, and are inwardly contemplating true justice. But the middle one of the three who stands at the beginning of the wall is wearing a cloak, for she did her work under God's protection at the beginning of the period of severity. But she is surrounded by the love of God and hides it in her heavenly treasures, rejecting the desires for caring things. And two of those same three, the ones to the right and the left of the middle one, and the two of the other three, the middle and the left of the figure, do not have women's veils on their heads, but stand with bare heads and white hair. For law and prophecy, which came forth from the power of the supernal majesty, displayed in their strength life and death, followed by twofold ways of love, and in their inner wisdom were constant against adversity and rejoiced in sweet divinity. And in their head, who is Christ, my son, they were faithfully freed from subjection to pain and the noose of death. Their hair is bright with the purity of virginity, for the divinities greatly loved the virginal nature and the Virgin Mary. But the middle one of the first three, and the one who sits on the stone next to the wall, have white head veils in the manner of women, which is to say that in the height of heaven and in the constancy of blessed repose they are pleasantly and sweetly bound by the strong bond of subjection. They venerate God, the head of all the faithful, with a pure and loving devotion, as with sincere love a wife should venerate her husband. And the middle and the right hand ones of the second three are clothed in white tunics, for their shining and pure works go forth among the people by the power of the divine majesty and sweetest beatitude ordained by the law of the Lord to whom they are united. But you also see differences between them, which is to say that, although they worship God in concord, he has given them different powers. 28. Abstinence and her appearance. Therefore, the figure who stands at the middle of the three first ones symbolizes abstinence, for she in the fight is like a city and a foundation and an ornament to the virtues near her. By her grave conduct, she keeps herself from sin, and having no wantonness in herself, she scrutinizes and reproves all childish wrongdoings. 
she appears like a mother in the midst of those virtues which showed the glory of the Trinity at the beginning of the time of the law in the Old Testament. And she has a yellow circlet like a crown on her head with the inscription carved on the right side, always burn. For she was crowned by the supreme head with the yellow ray of the brilliant sun, the Son of God. In his brightness she exists totally, desiring no one but him. And indeed, he always inflames her from the direction of salvation, which is the right. And thus, as you see, a dove is flying at the right side of this figure and breathing out the writings from its beak. For the right hand of heavenly bounty gives the gift of true simplicity, which is the Holy Spirit, and it enkindles all good things in abstinence by divine inspiration for the purpose of saving souls. And so this virtue shows in the words of her admonition already quoted. 29. Liberality and her appearance. Now the second figure standing at her right symbolizes liberality. She is of childlike simplicity with no over-subtlety or hard-heartedness with respect to human suffering. Together with abstinence, she withdraws herself from all harshness and takes the right path to God. For when abstinence decides on a work, liberality begins to carry it out. She has a lion on her breast which gives off light like a mirror, which is my son Christ Jesus, the mighty lion, enclosed in her heart like a tender and wonderful mirror of affection. And hanging from her neck to her breast on a twisted flexible rod is a pale colored serpent. This symbolizes the fact that my son bent his neck, which is to say his patience, to bear the pale agony of the body and the twisting of his pains when he was raised on the cross to heal all wounds. Liberality impresses this upon her heart with heavenly love and causes it to be contemplated in human minds. And so she says in the words of her already quoted declaration, 30, piety and her appearance. And the third figure on the left manifests piety, who never cherishes hatred or envy of human happiness, but always rejoices at and embraces human good fortune. By her freshness and her outpouring of generosity, abstinence is able to resist the devil who whispers to her from the left. For in the struggle of the banner, piety is the full work of abstinence and always in the victor. Hence, she is clad in a tunic of hyacinth red, for her splendid work surrounds her, yet in her beautiful patience she hides bloody injuries beneath it, suffering all of them according to my son's example and his passion. On her breast is the picture of an angel, a wing out on either side. This means that each person should imitate the angel in his mind by loving each of God's ordinances and lift himself up into flight on one wing and on two, which is to say by the one God, and by the twofold virtues, meeting the good and the bad on both sides, not unduly exalted by the good or prostrated by the bad. He should gaze on God in purity of heart, and therefore rise upward and not cast himself down to earth. And therefore its right wing stretches to the figure's right shoulder, for on the right, the side of salvation, human happiness comes to the help of piety, because my son brought back man to his true country and its left wing stretches to her left shoulder. And on the left, the side of the devil's snares, a faithful person casts off the work of darkness by extending his wing for a flight upward to the refuge of my son. And thus he is strong against all adversity and imitates the life of the just, as this virtue declares in her already quoted words. 31. Truth and her appearance. The figure who stands in the middle of the three second ones depicts truth. For in every case after abstinence and the virtue that cleaves to it have been established, truth arises. The other figure stands by her because she is their tower and their strong protector. She is at the heart of the virtues that prefigure the Holy Trinity when Jewish custom sets and true faith rises. Above her right shoulder hovers a dove of exceeding whiteness breathing into her right ear. This signifies the amazing power of the Holy Spirit who appears at the upper right the direction of the blessed restoration through the incarnation of the Son of God. Its touch breathes into her right ear, which is to say into the hearts of the believers, that they may understand the divine power of God. On her breast is the picture of a monstrous and shapeless human head, which is to say that God allows the hearts of his elect to be troubled by the miseries and persecutions of rulers, just as his son chose to suffer at the hands of the chief priests, and because God is 
in the hearts of the faithful, they should suffer persecution patiently for the love of God. And because death arose from the fall of the devil, they must sustain many struggles and sufferings, often hard and adverse for the body against the devil's villainies. For something clings to man that the ancient serpent always pursues. What is this? The lust of the flesh, which can be ensnared from ambush by the malignant enemy. And beneath her feet lies the likeness of people trodden down and crushed by her. This is to say that the lies of the devil which reside in human deeds are reduced to naught under the feet of truth. She loves the edifice of the church, where all the virtues shine clearly to be tested by her before all ages. She was hiding invisibly in the hearts of the Father, but at the end of time she appeared visibly in the true flesh of the Son of God. And therefore in her hands she holds a document fully unrolled, and on the side that faces heaven there is seven lines written. For in all the works of truth, by God's grace, a pattern is unrolled of the law established for the Christian people, and it should be observed with open worship on the side turned toward heavenly desire and feared on the side of carnal lusts. And it contains the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the unassailable bulwark against the devil's snares of death, and you try to read it, but cannot. For though man yearns to know the mysteries and secrets of God's gifts, it is not possible for him to understand or grasp God's will in his wonders, as long as he is burdened with the mortal body. But let man embrace and truly comprehend these mysteries by faithfully following God's precepts, as the virtue says in her words already quoted, 32, peace and her appearance. The second figure on her right symbolizes peace, which has the heavenly mark of the company of angels, for she puts forth buds in the full fruitfulness of truth. Truth is surrounded by marvelous gifts of heaven, which come from the light, the sight of salvation, and so, through the Son of God, she brings peace. How? As it is written in the angelic song, Glory be to God on the high, and on earth peace to men of good will. Luke 2.14 which is to say, because the Son of God was miraculously incarnate, humanity shines forth in the Most High God and God in humanity, and therefore God is worthy to be praised and glorified in heaven by his whole creation. And so will there also be on earth peace of salvation to those who receive the will of the Father with devotion and faith. For the peace of goodwill is the will of all the goodness of the Father, his Son, who is God and man at once. And how is he peace? He is the peace of humans and defends them from the snares of the ancient serpent. That serpent was the first false one and lost the light of life and was cast down into darkness. And then the true peace, which is the true Son of God, brought light to the people so that they became partakers of the kingdom of God and stood in the blessed place that the devil had lost. So as you see, this virtue has an angelic face, for she flies from all evil and beholds God as it were face to face with a holy mind and angelic desire. Hence, she too has wings capable of flying stretched out to each side. For faced with either tranquility or trouble, she flies upward toward God. She does not deal in terror or in bitterness, but remains calm and harmonious. By the joint effort of her two wings, she embraces the one God and persists only in serenity, which is not shaken by changeful tempests, either in good or in evil case. And she is in human form like the other virtues, for she shines miraculously through the Son of God. And all the other human virtues are made true in her. For she never seeks contention or dispute, but always leniency. And so she opposes the attacks of the devil as she manifested it in her words and in her discourse above. 33. Beatitude in her appearance. And the third figure on the left depicts beatitude, yearning for eternal life by her faithfulness and quiet gentleness. Truth can oppose on her left hand all the craft of the serpent's temptations which deceive the person who consents to him. For beatitude is the unconquered serenity of true glory and fears no miseries in death. Therefore she is clothed in a white tunic picked out with green. For she is surrounded by faithful work which are brought with celestial desire and fresh with the freshness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. She has in her hands a small vase, pale and shining, which is to say that her deeds depict the way man apprehends God by faith in a small container, the interior of his contrite heart. It is pale with the weakness of human flesh, 
because faith must be held to even in this mortal life, where misery is always with humanity. Therefore it gives off bright light like lightning, and this light shines on the face and neck of the figure. For knowledge of eternal light is diffused by both fear and love of God, which reaches from a person's inner heart to his face, which is to say it makes him begin righteous deeds that show his good intent. And then it shines on the neck, which means that the completed works include strength, and through beatitude shines before God more brilliantly than the sun, as this virtue declares in her speech quoted above. 34. Discretion and her appearance. But the figure who sits on the stone at this end of the wall denotes discretion. For when the Old Testament observances were fulfilled, she appeared in Christ. She is the wise sifter of all things, withholding what should be held and cutting off what should be cut off, as the wheat is separated from the tares. And she is clothed in a black tunic, for she is surrounded by mortification of the flesh, and has cast off all vain levity. And on her right shoulder she bears a small cross with the image of Jesus Christ, which is to say that when Almighty God gave His Son to be miraculously incarnated and humbly suffer, this virtue was firmly rooted in the power of God's strength, which is right. Discretion united with his love when she was manifested by him, and through her all justice is decided. And as God determines the stature that best befits man, discretion's office is to imitate him. That is, she fulfills her work in the giver, his crucified son, and exists in both his states, divinity and humanity. It turns hither and thither, for in the sight of the Holy Cross, discretion moves unceasingly in a round among good and bad people. And as from the clouds there shines on her breast a wondrously bright light. Which is to say that from God's mercy the brightest cloud above divine love is instilled and enkindled in human minds, waking discretion and enlightenment in them. Therefore this light is divided into many rays as is the splendor of the sun when it shines through an object's many small openings. For the Holy Spirit with heavenly power emits diverse rays, which are gifts to humans, and these rays, more brilliant than the sun, diffuse and penetrate the recesses of humility and the clear vision of faithful souls. And thus it enlightens their minds and senses, that they may gain a deep understanding in everything of what they should rightly do in God. In her right hand she holds a small branch like a fan, which is to say that discretion on the right side, which is the side of salvation, contemplates her work in humans through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These humans are in the flesh, which is fragile like wood, but the flesh has in it her sign, and so by God's help drives away the devil's temptations, which comes like a cloud of flies. Thus discretion is not dissipated in them by vanities, and so from the top of this wood three twigs have wonderfully sprouted forth into flower, that the faithful may believe above all that the Holy Trinity perpetually flowers in wonder and glorious rain in the unity of divinity. Thus they must not rashly contemplate the celestial secrets in themselves, but dispose all their actions well and rightly through the power of discretion, as God disposes his works justly and with discretion in all his creatures. And in her bosom she carries some minute stones, jewels of all kinds, which she looks at very carefully and diligently as a merchant looks at her goods. This is to say that in the bosom of the human mind she encloses everything that is apt and suitable, that its most minute thoughts and deeds may be jewels of virtue. And with cautious and diligent scrutiny she seeks all God-ordained justice and influences all human hearts with a sharp awareness of the reward of their work. The recompense from God, which indeed she herself says, as mentioned above. 35. Salvation and her appearance. And the figure that stands on the wall at the same end signifies the salvation of souls, which appears in the authority of the new grace when the old severity has set. Thus discretion is the foundation, and salvation appears above her, who arose in the Son of God when he was born of the Virgin for human salvation. She is bareheaded with curly black hair, for she is bare of subjection and servitude, and remains free in status because she openly cleaves to the Son of God, who mercifully raises her up. But her hair is black because among the Jewish people salvation was obscured, not shining in true brightness, but existing in great diversity and observance like curls of hair. She also has a swarthy face, 
For before the incarnation of the Son of God, she was in the shadow of death and seemed not to hope for the happiness of eternal salvation. Therefore, too, she is dressed in a tunic of many different colors. For among the people of the Old Testament, she was surrounded by many works, including many vices. But you see that she takes off the tunic and her shoes and stands naked. This is to say that when death was banished by the passion of my son, and when the Holy Spirit came and the sound of the words of the apostles were heard in the world, salvation awoke. She spurned evil works and rejected the wrong path and stripped herself bare of the devil's power. And thus she spoke within herself, O oh, you most shameful devil, you would never leave me except that I am redeemed in the blood of the Lamb, for you wanted to keep me in the pit of hell, but now by God's grace I am delivered. And thus suddenly her hair and her face gleam newly white like a newborn baby, for after the incarnation of my son the people represented by her hair increased. Well enlightened in the inner face of their souls, they grasped true and splendid justice and sought eternal happiness, trusting in life's brightness and the liberation of the faithful members who adhere to Christ the head. And so they are saved in celestial life through regeneration and the innocence of childhood, and her whole body shines like light. The faithful people subject to her through my son was made pure in dove-like simplicity and bright in the lucent beauty of the justice of God. But you see on her breast a splendid cross with the image of Christ Jesus, which is depicted above a little bush with two flowers on it, a lily and a rose, which reach upward towards the cross. That is to say that in the passion of Jesus, this virtue became a strong heart of the believing people. For the Savior Jesus, by his martyrdom and the steps of his righteous example, cast down the and broke the tree of Adam's death and perdition against which the two testaments had also fought the old in white and the new in red, by God's will then, and in the lofty understanding of the Spirit, they turned from the perdition of death to the passion of that noble and loving Redeemer and all his justice. So you see her vigorously beat the tunic in the shoes she has taken off, so that a great deal of dust flies out of them, for salvation shows in the new and righteous human deeds that the tunic of early custom and old vice is removed and the evil examples of Adam's transgression beaten out of it. She brings these things to naught by vigorous scrutiny and despises and rejects the dust of vainglory and other sins, and she makes known about herself in the words given above. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflections and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 7, The Pillar of the Trinity Then I saw in the west corner of the building a wondrous, secret, and supremely strong pillar, purple-black in color. It was so placed in the corner that it protruded both inside and outside of the building, and it was so great in extent that neither its size nor its height was clear to my understanding. I only saw that it was miraculously even and without roughnesses. The outside part had three steel-colored edges, which stood out like sharp sword edges from the bottom to the top. One of these faced southward, where a great deal of dry straw lay cut and scattered by it. Another faced northwest, where a lot of little wings had been cut off by it and had fallen. And the middle edge faced west, where lay many decaying branches that it had cut away. All of these had been cut off by those edges for their temerity. And again, the one who sat on the throne and showed me all these things said to me, To you I explain these mystical and miraculously unknown gifts in all their fullness, and grant you to speak of them and show them. For, O human, they appear to you clearly in the true light. This I do to enkindle the fiery hearts of the faithful, who are the pure stones that will build the celestial Jerusalem. 1. The Trinity is to be believed humbly and not pried into more than it is licit. For the holy and ineffable Trinity of the Supreme Unity, which was hidden from those under the yoke of the law, but manifested in the new grace to those freed from servitude, must be believed by the faithful with simple and humble hearts. One true God in three persons, and it must not be rashly scrutinized, nor must anyone be 
dissatisfied with the gift he has received from the Holy Spirit. If such a one seeks more than is fitting in the temerity of his self-exaltation, he will fall into a worse state, not finding what he improperly seeks. And this is shown by the present vision. For this pillar you see in the west corner of the building symbolizes the true Trinity. For the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are one God in Trinity, and that Trinity is in unity. It is the perfect pillar of all good, reaching from the height to the depths and governing the whole terrestrial globe. It stands in the west corner because the Son of God was incarnated in the sunset of the world, and He glorified His Father everywhere and promised the Holy Spirit to His disciples. So to the Son, in undergoing death by the will of the Father, gave a noble example to humans, so that they too could rightfully enter the edifice of the Supreme Father by performing true and just works in the Holy Spirit. And it is wondrous, secret, and supremely strong, for God manifests himself in his creatures so wondrously that they can never exhaust his presence, and so secretly that they cannot scrutinize him by any willful knowledge or sense, and so strongly that all their senses is directed to him and cannot be compared with his strength. 2. Christ's blood saves the world and shows the Trinity, but incomprehensibility. It is purple-black in color and is so placed in the corner that it protrudes both inside and outside the building. This is to say that by the will of the Father, His only Son poured out His pure blood on behalf of humans with their black sins. And thus He saved the world by His passion and brought the true and right faith to believers. And when the old rituals failed and the new holiness arose, the worship of the Holy Trinity was most plainly proclaimed. For it was openly believed that the Heavenly Father sent His Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, into the world, and the Son sought the glory of His Father and not His own, and disclosed the profound consolation of the Holy Spirit, as had been foretold. And thus it was hidden on no side, but was proclaimed both to the faithful who abode in God's work, and to the unbelievers who stood outside the faith. But it is so great in extent that neither its size nor its height is clear to your understanding, which is to say that the Trinity is of such ineffable glory and power that its greatness of majesty and its altitude and divinity cannot be bounded by any twist or presumption of the human mind, but it is miraculously even and without roughness. For wonderful to relate... It is mild and benign in grace and smooth in its sweet justice to all those who hasten to it, so that no rough place of injustice is in it, but justly and beautifully it confers salvation. 3. The Trinity is manifest in power and pierces even unbelievers' hearts. The outside part has three steel-colored edges, which stand out like sharp sword edges from the bottom to the top. This is to say that the ineffable trinity stands against the darkness of the world, appearing openly in the unity of deity. Its sovereignty and power are hidden from none of its creatures except the hearts of unbelievers. From them it is concealed because of their unbelief. Therefore God's judgment in due recompense deservedly slays them like sharp steel. It yields to no prideful opposition but extends from one end to the other, which is to say from the creation to the end of the world. In all that exists, it has penetrated and does penetrate like a sword in division, in profound divinity, in all wisdom and power. 4. Unbelief opposes the Catholic faith, and God cuts it down in confusion. And one of these faces southwest, where a great deal of dry straw lies cut and scattered by it, this is to say that among Christian peoples, the just and divine trinity cuts down and burns up all who raise the aridity of heterodoxy and negation and rejection against the righteous Catholic faith. They are utterly confounded, like the grass that is trodden underfoot and burned in the fire, separated from the fruitful grain of the wheat. For faith and works stem from the knowledge of Scripture and all that is contrary to the true faith, though the foolish people follow it like stupid cattle is scattered and annihilated. 5. God cast down the boasting of the Jewish people. And another faces northwest where a lot of little wings have been cut off by it and have fallen. This is to say that the divinity rejects the high vanity of the Jewish people, which was flying in great pride and mental exaltation, trying to be just in itself and not in God, 
like the Pharisees who tried to ascend into the heights of heaven, trusting with confidence in themselves. But by God's just judgment, they fell, rent in pieces from their presumption and their bad conduct. Six, the devilish division of the Gentiles are cut down by God and destroyed. And the middle edge faces west, where lie many decaying branches that it has cut away. For by the trinity the heinous and diabolical schisms of the pagans who stray from the right faith into the sunset of infidelity are cut off. And as decaying branches are a nuisance unfit for human use, so this people who follow the devil's lies and not the divine command was cut off and rejected from the joy of life. And therefore all these have been cut off by the edge of their temerity. For in all these cases the true and holy trinity allows the unfaithful people who boldly try to break away from it or stubbornly do not believe in it, to cut themselves off from it and go to perdition. For in their madness and ignorance they attack the divinity and choose not to yield to the faith that the Son of God brought in himself. This faith he transmitted to humanity through his disciples, as the following parable shows. 7. Parable on this subject. A certain lord who owned a fire-producing flint decided to command a numerous people to do a necessary thing, both personally and through messengers. But the messengers did not understand their lord's words and were foolish and inexperienced at fulfilling his commands, stupidly nattering. So while they were trying, there arose a tumult. There was a great tempest with rain and violent thunder, so that the earth quaked and the rocks were rent. And a vessel that had lain in the earth with its mouth facing away from the heavens, and which had a lot of small vessels within it, was rooted out of the earth with great force, and its mouth turned to face heaven. And then the Lord used his flint to produce a violent fire which ran through these messengers with such heat that all their veins were inflamed, And all timid indolence was stricken from them, as quickly as something poured over a dry skin runs off it. And so at last they remembered all the things that they had learned and heard from their Lord. And they went forth from the rootless people, whose cities had been destroyed, and announced to them their Lord's command. For some of these they reconstructed their roots and rebuilt their cities, but others they did not treat so but slew them like pigs and divided them. And therefore the flint is respected by the whole world and terrified and slays all the sins of human flesh. This means the following, that the Lord is the Father Almighty, with whom in his only begotten, the cornerstone conceived by the ardent Holy Spirit and born as a man from the intact virgin, the fairest and most beautiful flower of all fair and beautiful holiness, For the Son of God in his divinity was before all time and all creation with the Father and the fiery comforter. And then when it pleased the Father, he was sent as was foretold that he might be conceived by the Holy Spirit, truly incarnate and born of the Virgin and bestow on believers the fairness and beauty of life. When he was incarnate, the Father benignly proclaimed through him and his disciples the necessary thing the deliverance and salvation of those who believed in him. But his disciples, while the Son was with them in the world in his body, were foolish and unknowing and unresponsive, slow to understand his words in the Spirit and to fulfill them in work. For they heard them only as in a dream. They were simple, timid, and frightened, and had not yet been strengthened. And meanwhile there came the time of the raging hearts. The Jews, causing a tumult, sought to stir up many charges against the Son of God, and in that great tempest killed him. And they carried out their malignity, and they carried out their malignity even as they wished. In that violent storm, a murder was done, such as was never seen before and will never be again. And the earth quaked, which is to say that the earthly human minds and all the creation were terrified. And because of their criminal deeds, the laws of the Jews written on stone were cracked. Then the first man in whom is signified all of creation and who lay buried in death, bending all his will towards the things of the earth and turning his back on heaven and God was uprooted from the dust of death in which he slept with his children by the great power of the Son of God. And thus he sighed with all his heart and mind and turned to face the celestial country. For he heard Christ the Son of God who was slain for his sake. But after the Son of God had ascended to the Father through the Son, and according to His promise the Holy Spirit descended, 
For now the whole earth was full of heavenly dew because the bread of heaven had been in it. The faithless had ignored him like a false rumor, but the faithful had received him with all their devotion. And so, because the true word had become incarnate, the Holy Spirit came openly in tongues of fire for the Son, who converted the world to the truth by his preaching, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and because the apostles had been taught by the Son, the Holy Spirit bathed them in its fire so that with their souls and bodies they spoke in many tongues, and because their souls ruled their bodies, they cried out, so that the whole world was shaken by their voices. And the Holy Spirit took their human fear from them, so that no dread was in them, and they would never fear human savagery when they spoke of the word of God. All such timidity was taken from them so ardently and so quickly that they became firm and not soft and dead to all adversity that could befall them. And then they remembered with perfect understanding all the things that they had heard and received from Christ with sluggish faith and comprehension. They recalled them to memory as if they had learned them from him in that very hour. And so going forth, they made their way among the faithless peoples who did not have roots, which is to say the sign of the knowledge of the holy innocence and justice, and whose city, which is to say the instruments of God's law, had been destroyed by faithlessness. And to those they announced the words of salvation and of the true faith in Christ. And thus they brought back many from this throng to the knowledge of God and led them to the center, which is to say to the font of baptism, where they received the holiness that they had lost by their proud transgressions. And they built the holy city of the commandments of God, thus rebuilding the city which the seducer, the devil, had taken from them in Adam and restored it to them in the faith that leads to salvation. But there were some who did not believe and did not choose to receive the faith of baptism and the protection of God's commands. And these, reading the signs, the apostles passed by and condemned to death for their hardness and unbelief. For in their crimes and in the filth of their carnal pollution, wallowing in fornication and adultery as pigs wallow in the mud, they were not willing to be converted to the true faith, and therefore they were divided and separated from life. And thus the Son of God was shown throughout the whole world by many and wondrous signs, ineffably begotten of the Father in his divinity and then miraculously born of the Virgin in time. And so the hearts of all those who hear these things should be alarmed and agitated by fear and trembling, so that the vain and deceitful works they have been pleased to do may be negated in them by contempt of death. For the true word of God bears testimony to the Holy Trinity and to life-giving salvation through the water of regeneration. And so, beloved John shows in the words of his exposition when he says, 8, words of John, And it is the Spirit which testifies that Christ is the truth. There are three that give testimony on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are one, and there are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And the three are one. 1 John 5, 6 through 8. This is to say that the human spirit is spiritual. It does not come from the blood, nor is it born out of the flesh, but it emerges from the secret places of God, invisible to the mutable flesh. Therefore, it bears testimony to the Son of God, whose glory is wondrous in mystical breath. No person can perfectly understand that glory or know how the only begotten of God was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born into the world, just as no person can fully know how the soul permeates the human body and blood to make up one life. And as the human spirit is the certain cause of the knowledge granted a person by God and permeates everything else God gives him being true and faithful life and not false or deceptive, so too Christ is the perfect truth in whom life has arisen and the light of salvation has shown, and from whom death, which is deceptive, has fallen away. So three, which signifies the Holy Trinity, give testimony on earth, showing and granting in this world the remedy of life-giving salvation. For through that salvation the heavenly things without end must be attained, and in mortal flesh they are only awaited in hope and not possessed in actuality. Thus the human spirit in itself testifies to me, for it will not live fully in restored salvation unless it rises again through me in the water of regeneration. For humanity is deficient in the light that shines in me since it was expelled from felicity because it was corrupted into crime and increasingly bloody deeds. And water testifies to me, for it purifies all filthy things in it 
and clearly purges the fatal pestilence of death. It is joined to the spirit before the blood is, because as the spirit is spiritual, so the water brings spiritual sanctification. It stands in the middle between the spirit and the blood because it, its confirming carries both soul and body through spiritual regeneration to life. And blood too testifies, for it alters its poisoned course toward the house of holiness through the water of salvation, which is the medicine that arises in my son and remains in his life. For blood by itself carries shameful crimes and turbulent injustice and runs through uncertain paths in a twisted sweetness that leads to burning lust in frightful vices, which choke innocence, increasing in appetite by what they feed on, all this by the temptation of the seducer, the devil. And these three are one, for the spirit without the bloody material of the body is not the living person, and the bloody material of the body without the soul is not the living person. And these two are not strengthened unto life in the grace of the new law, except through the water of regeneration, or perfected in salvation as long as they are separated from his saving water. For then the transcendent honor of life is wanting in the person's reason. The redeemed must always make perfect praise resound in the presence of God, who gave him that reason. For God by his own will created man for that honor, which is consummated in the body of his Son in eternal life, when the lost man lives again in the honor of life, redeemed in God by healing grace, and the Spirit, which is invisible to the bodily eyes, symbolizes the Father, who is incomprehensible to every creature, and the water which purges filth symbolizes the Word, the Son of God, who by his passion wiped out human stains, and the blood which surrounds and warms people as the symbol of the Holy Spirit, arousing and enkindling the brightest human virtues. So these three, the Spirit and the water and the blood, are in one and one in three. And as was said, one in salvation. And they signify the Trinity and unity, and the unity in Trinity. How? The holy and heavenly Trinity gives heavenly testimony. It is not taken from something else, but originates by sure faith in itself. How? The Father testifies. Before the ages, he begot his one fruitful word, through whom all things were made. And then at the appointed time, the word gloriously flowered in the virgin. The word testifies that he went forth from the Father and stooped to enter the human nature, becoming incarnate in the purity of virginity. He went forth from the Father and spirit and returned again to the Father and fruitful flesh. And so he stands in the middle, since he was invisibly begotten by the Father before time began, and conceived in the body within time by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin. And the Holy Spirit testifies that it quickened the intact Virgin so that she conceived the Word of God, and that it strengthened the doctrine of the same Word in tongues of flame, permeating the apostles so that they proclaim the true Trinity throughout the world. How? They cried aloud that God the Father had completed the work whereby he created man, for heavenly happiness, of which he was then robbed. Man was made from the mud of the earth to stand upright, but by his own will he had bent down toward the earth again. But now by grace he is able to stand upright a second time through the incarnation of the Son of God, and enlightened and confirmed by the Holy Spirit, so as not to perish in perdition, but be saved in redemption. He has been restored to eternal glory. 9 on distinction and unity of the three persons. Thus the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit testify that they are in no way disunited in power, even though they are distinguished in persons because they work together in the unity of the simple and immutable substance. How? The Father creates all things through the Word, who is His Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Son is He by whom all things are perfected in the Father and the Holy Spirit, and thus the Holy Spirit is He by who all things flourish in the Father and the Son. And so these three persons are in the unity of inseparable substance, but they are not indistinct among themselves. How? He who begets is the Father, he who is born is the Son, and he who is in eager freshness proceeds from the Father and the Son and sanctifies the waters by moving over their face in the likeness of an innocent bird and streamed with ardent heat over the apostles is the Holy Spirit. For the Father had the Son before the time began, and the Son was with the Father, and the Holy Spirit was co-eternal, and the Father and the Son in the unity of divinity. Hence it must be seen that if one or two were lacking of these three persons, God would not be in fullness. How? They are one in unity of divinity. And so, 
If any one of them were lacking, God would not be. For though these persons are distinct, they are nonetheless one substance, whole and immutable and of indescribable beauty, and remain undivided in unity. How? Ten, three similes for the Trinity. Power, will, and fire are three peaks of a single height of work. How? The will is the power, the fire is the will, and they are inseparable like expelled human breath. How? The indivisible emission of human breath is the whirling air currents, the moistures and the warmth. So too is the complete human eye. How? The circuit of your eyesight has two transparent parts, but they form one house for all that is within them. Hear and understand, O human. Even so, there are three persons in one immutable essence of divinity, in the Father, in the Son, in both the Holy Spirit, and they are one, work inseparably with each other. For the Father does not work without the Son, nor the Son without the Holy Spirit, nor the Holy Spirit without them, nor the Father and the Son without the Holy Spirit, but they are undivided unity. Thus God is three persons, eternal before all ages. In the assumption of the flesh by the Son did not occur before the beginning of the world, but at the preordained time near the end of times when God sent his Son. And when the Son became incarnate of the virginal flower blossomed in her intact virginity, God was still in three persons and willed to be so invoked, and therefore no person was added to the ineffable trinity, but the Son of God simply assumed flesh. Hence also these three persons are one God in divinity, and whoever does not believe this will be cast out of the kingdom of God, for he tears himself away from the wholeness of the divinity of faith, as it is written. 11. Words of the Book of Kings and on the third day there appeared a man who came out of Saul's camp with his garments torn and dust strewn on his head. 2 Kings 1, 2. This is to say, on the day in which the Catholic faith arose by the manifestation of the Holy Trinity, humanity, which had now emerged from the camp of the army of death, broke out into many schisms and perversely sought what it was not possible for it to know. Therefore, seduced by the devil, artful persuasion, some now imagine that they are ascending above the heights and choose to know more than they should about the incomprehensible divinity, and therefore the garments of salvation and justice is torn from them, because they oppose God, and they are defiled by the strewing of the divisions of the head of their faith, for they lack complete faith, but scatter among many sects the honor due solely to the deity, and they diminish his high honor by mocking it in schisms. And so God will judge them all, as is clear from the following verses. And David said to the young man who told him, Where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said to him, Why did you not fear to put out your hand to kill the Lord's anointed? And David called one of his servants and said to him, Go near and fall upon him. And he struck him so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be upon your own head, for your mouth has spoken against you, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. 2 Kings 1, 13-16 this is to say, the victorious one, incomprehensible to every creature, speaks to the childish and self-exalting ignorance of humanity, which tries to know what it should not know. For it is folly to accost God and announce to him with temerity, Lord, I know you well. And God answers it thus, Where do you come from? Who, having a beginning, seek to know the whole which lacks a beginning? And the folly that has arisen in the creature with a beginning says, as if it knew, I am the son of a stranger who comes from the cursed land. For the first man fell by the taste of the fruit and journeyed into exile from his country, and I am his descendant. Then God says to him, Because you are a person from the accursed land, driven out as an exile from your country, why did you not fear presumptuously to seek out what is not for you to know? This madness chokes your deeds and makes them unable to give hope and approaches in wickedness to murder. For anyone who rashly searches out what God was before the creation of the world or what God will do after the last day is to be cut off from a share of the blessed communion, which is not to be known by a creature with a beginning who is in a state of sin. And so he will be miserable, torn away from the good knowledge that saves, because he obstinately sought out what he should not have sought out. And so you who do these things with presumption and the cruelty of murder are slaying within yourself the blessed understanding of King David's prophecy. For your soul should seek only pure knowledge and believe faithfully in God with appropriate simplicity. 
And then God commands the jealousy of his pure justice, which has in it no spot of iniquity, and says to it in the righteous unity of his judgment, Make haste and fall on him and take from him the knowledge of good which he had. Let him never repose in any happiness of the senses which he never prepared his heart for me to repose in. And so the blow of the jealousy of the Lord strikes that creature so that no spark of eyesight remains in him to see and know God. And so he dies to the justice of life-giving comfort because he was not able to rule himself. And then God says to him, Your bloody wickedness by which you raise yourself to heights you cannot understand recoil upon your own mind which you unjustly raised against me. May evil trample you underfoot in the mud for which you cannot raise yourself to the right measure of faith. For you did not follow the right paths but sought division in your mind. May words of wisdom forsake your mouth which spoke against your salvation when you deceitfully sought out the secrets of incomprehensible divinity and presumed to know what is not to be known. You said rashly within yourself, I know well what God is, and through this temerity you destroyed your inner salvation. You did not choose to believe in God with discretion, but proudly raised yourself against him. But let one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 8, the pillar of the humanity of the Savior. And then I saw on the south side of the wall of the building beyond the pillar of the true Trinity, a great and shadowed pillar, which protruded both inside and outside the building. And it was so obscure to my sight that I could not tell its size or height. And between this pillar and the pillar of the true Trinity, there was a gap of three cubits wide in the wall, as mentioned above. Only the foundation had been laid. Thus this shadowed pillar was standing in the same place in the building where I had previously seen, in the celestial mysteries vouchsafed by God from above, a great four-sided radiance of brilliant purity. This radiance, which signifies the secrets of the supernal creator, was shown to me in the greatest mystery, and in it another radiance shone forth like dawn with a deep purple light glowing in it, which was a mystical manifestation of the mystery of the incarnate Son of God. But in this pillar there was an ascent like a ladder from bottom to top, on which I saw the virtues of God descending and ascending, laden down with stones and going with keen zeal to their work. And I heard that shining one who was seated on the throne say, These are God's strongest laborers. And among these virtues I saw seven in particular, whose form and appearance I especially noted. They resembled each other in this. All of them, like the other virtues described so far, were clad, as it were, in silk. All of them went with white hair and bare heads and without a cloak except the first, who wore a woman's head veil and a mantle like transparent crystal, and the second who had black hair, and a third whose form did not seem human. The first, fourth, and fifth were wearing white tunics. All had white shoes except the third, who, as mentioned, did not seem to be in a human form, and the fourth, who was wondrously shod in shoes of shining crystal. And the differences among them were as follows. The first figure wore a gold crown on her head, with three higher prongs. It was radiantly adorned with green and red precious stones and white pearls. On her breast she had a shining mirror, in which appeared with wondrous brightness the image of the incarnate Son of God, and she said, 1. Words of Humility I am the pillar of humble minds and the slayer of proud hearts. I began at the lowest point and ascended the steep slope to heaven. But Lucifer raised himself above himself and fell beneath himself. Whoever wishes to imitate me and be my child and embrace me as a mother and carry out my work, let him start at the foundation and gradually mount upward from virtue to virtue with a sweet and tr for anyone who tries to ascend taking hold of the highest branch of the tree first will more often than not swiftly fall. But anyone who begins his ascent at the root will not fall so easily if he proceeds with caution. And the second figure was a deep sky blue like a hyacinth, both in person and in tunic. Into her tunic two stripes were marvelously woven and incomparably adorned with gold and gems, so that one stripe ascended to the figure's feet over her shoulders in both front and back, and she said, 
two words of charity. When Lucifer in heaven devoured himself with hatred and pride, I was provoked to indignation. Oh, 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 humility would not tolerate this, and therefore he was cast into great ruin. But when the human race was created, oh, 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 the noble seed, and oh, 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 the sweetest offshoot, the Son of God, was born human at the end of time for the sake of humanity. Lucifer wanted and intended to rend my garment and my integrity, but I appeared as most brilliant splendor in God and in man. Nowadays the blind and dead declare that the reality behind my name is brothels and harlots and incest, but just as filth cannot touch heaven and filthy accusations cannot touch my will. And so I will make myself wings of the other virtues and cast out these harmful things. Lucifer has scattered throughout the world. Where, O virtues, is Lucifer? He is in hell. So let us arise and draw nearer to the true light and build high the strong towers throughout all provinces so that when the last day comes, we may bear much fruit, both carnal and spiritual. And when the full number of the Gentiles has come in, then we too shall be perfect on earth and in heaven. O shameful Lucifer, what did your hasty temerity avail you? In the primal splinter in which God created you, you raved and gave yourself over to madness and tried to tread me underfoot and cast me out of heaven. But you fell into the abyss and I stayed in heaven and later descended to earth in the incarnate Son of God. And through me is perfected the multitude of the faithful, armed with a thousand soldierly arts of justice and goodness. Though, had you been able to, you would long since have snatched them away. O humility, who lifts to the stars the oppressed and the crushed. O humility, glorious queen of virtues, what strong and victorious protector you are to all who are yours. No one falls who loves you with a pure heart. And I too am a valuable and desirable defense to those who are mine, for I am very slender and subtle, and I seek out in those who revere me the smallest openings and deeply penetrate them. This third figure I saw in the same form as I had seen her in my previous vision, greater and taller of stature than the other virtues, and non-human in form. She was covered with eyes all over her body, and she lived wholly in wisdom, and she wore a shadowy garment through which the eyes could look out. And she trembled in fear before the shining one seated on the throne, and she said, Three words of fear. O woe to the miserable sinner who do not fear God, but hold him as an impostor. Who can evade fear of the incomprehensible God who allows the wicked who do evil to perish? Therefore I will fear the Lord God much and much. Who will help me in the presence of the true God, and who shall deliver me from this fearsome judgment? No one at all except God himself. Therefore I will seek him and fly to him for refuge. And the fourth was wearing a snow-white chain around her neck, and her hands and feet were chained together with white fetters, and she said words of obedience. I cannot run in secular paths according to my will, or be infected by human desire, but I choose to return to God, the Father of all, whom the devil rejected and chose to disobey. And the fifth had a red chain around her neck, and she said five words of faith. God is one, to be adored in three persons of one substance and equal glory. Therefore I have faith and confidence in the Lord to never blot out his name from my heart. And the sixth was clad in pale colored tunic. Before her in the air was the cross of the passion of the crucified Son of God. And toward it she raised her eyes and hands with great devotion. And she said, six words of hope. Spare us who sin, O loving Father. You have not forsaken the exiles, but you have raised them up upon your shoulder, and so we do not perish who have hoped in you. And the seventh was dressed in a tunic more brilliant and purer than crystal, which shone resplendent like water when the sun reflected from it, and a dove was poised over her head, facing her with its wings spread as if to fly. In her womb, as if in a clear mirror, appeared a pure infant, on whose forehead was written innocence, and in her right hand she held a royal scepter, but she had laid her left hand on her breast, and she said, Seven, words of chastity. I am free and not fettered, for I have passed through the pure fountain who is the sweet and loving Son of God. I have passed through him, and I have come forth from him. And I tread underfoot the devil with his limitless pride, who has not prevailed to fetter me. He is alien from me, because I am always in the Heavenly Father. Now at the summit of the shadowed pillar, 
I saw another beautiful figure standing bareheaded. Now at the summit of the shadowed pillar, I saw another beautiful figure standing bareheaded. It had curly black hair and a manly face so ardently bright that I could not look on it clearly like a human one. It was clad in a tunic of a purple and black with a stripe of red over one shoulder and a stripe of yellow over the other, which fell to its feet front and back. Around its neck it had a bishop's stole, wonderfully adorned with gold and precious gems, but a pure radiance so surrounded it that I could not look at it except from head to foot in front. Its arms and hands and feet were concealed from my sight, and the radiance around it was full of eyes on all sides, and it was alive, changing its form like a cloud and becoming now wider and now narrower. And this figure cried with a loud voice in the world and said to humanity, 8. Words of the grace of God to admonish humans. I am the grace of God, my little children. Therefore, hear and understand me, for my admonition makes radiant the souls of those who do. I keep them in blessedness so that they will not return to iniquity. And because they have not despised me, I choose to touch them with my admonition so that they will do good works. Those, that is, who seek me in simplicity and purity of heart. So I admonish and exhort humanity and grant it pearls of goodness when a person's mind is touched by me. I am his beginning. That is to say, when a person understands my admonition with his sense of hearing and his sense consents to my touching his mind, I initiate good in him. And it is needful that he begin thus, with me helping him. Then a struggle follows. Will my gift attain its end or not? How? Understand thus. When I admonish a person so that he begins to lament and weep for his sins, then if his will consents to my admonition for he will feel the change in his mind. And according to his mind's desire, he will raise up his eyes and see and his ears to hear and his mouth to speak and his hands to touch and his feet to walk. His mind will raise itself to conquer his senses so that they will learn things their habits could not teach them. How? They will change themselves for they must, though unwillingly, follow the will that is set over them. They are subject to its service being its inferiors, they will follow it, willing or not. Thus I initiate good and kindle it in the mind, and give the will work to accomplish, and this I do by admonition, exhortation, and the fire of the breath of the Holy Spirit. But if the will resists these gifts, all that I have mentioned comes to naught, and therefore while a person can still make a start inflamed by the preeminent gifts that come from me, let him hasten to do so. Let his will quickly come to good and end its work in splendor. For this is why man has the knowledge of good and evil, that he himself in all his works may know God better by avoiding evil and doing good. For thus he worships God with fear and embraces him with perfect charity. How? Thus, by opening the inner eyes of the spirit to good and denying and cutting off the evil that the outer person can do. And thus the earthly creation is subject to his power, that he may understand and love God the more. And with the understanding do in him the work of his knowledge, by which knowledge he fears and loves the Almighty, who has given him this great honor of having the creatures serve him. Thus man must wisely distinguish between the creatures, knowing which are to be loved and hated, which are useful and which are useless. And thus all his works will be concluded in faith, through which he understands God and pleases God and his angels. And sometimes I touch a person's mind to warn him to begin to work justice and avoid evil, but he disdains me and thinks he can do what he wants. He postpones the time of repentance until his body is reduced to old age, enough to obey him. And he is so old, he is tired of sinning. And then I admonish and urge him again to do good and resist in his mind. If he ignores me, he is often brought to the pass of doing good as it were unwillingly and in spite of himself, by monetary and other troubles that come upon him. And with his mind thus troubled, he has little delight in doing what he planned to do when he was prosperous and unopposed, when he thought he could act as and when he pleased. And such a person receives me in doubt, but yet I choose not to forsake him. For though it was thus he received me, he did not wholly despise me, and so I do not labor vainly in him. For I do not find it loathsome to touch ulcerated wounds surrounded by the filthy, 
gnawing worms that are innumerable vices, stinking with evil report and infamy, and stagnating in habitual wickedness. I do not refuse to close them gently up, drawing forth from them the devouring poison of malice by touching them with the mild fire of the breath of the Holy Spirit. But often such a wound grows hardened by old irritation, so that sin grows hot and burning in the person's mind, and in the clotted mass of the filth new wounds of sin appear swelling and rising from the defilement of worms and the application of dark muck from which comes the deadly poison of scorpions, serpents, frogs, and other poisonous vermin. And such wounds become as hardened as stone, a hardness no one dares try to break open. These things burden such people with insupportable loads. And what happens then? People of little faith cannot believe it is possible for such a one to be converted to God from his iniquity. They see him as already food for the devil, but I will not forsake this person. I choose by my help and action to be on his side in the struggle. I start by gently touching the strong and stony crust of his sin, which is so hard to break, for it stinks so vilely of horrible crimes, which have caused his great filth and wickedness and are like a rotting corpse in the food of the devil, and he has certainly swallowed them into his stomach. How? The scripture states that the Son of God said, My food is to do the will of my Father, John 4, 34. And so the opposite is the devil's food, by which he pulls people down into death, inspiring those who consent to his will and turn aside to follow him. And this is the desire and the continual study of the devil, for from this filth all evil arises. But many of these people recognize me. How? When I begin to touch them, one of them may say to himself, What is happening to me? I know nothing of good and am incapable of thinking of it. And then, and then in his ignorance he sighs and says, Alas for me, a sinner. But he feels nothing more, because he is weighed down by his huge weight of sin and the darkness of iniquity troubles him. Then I touch his wounds again, and having been admonished by me before, he understands me better this time, and looks at himself, saying, Woe is me! What shall I do? I do not know and cannot think of what will become of me for my many sins. Oh, where shall I turn, and to whom shall I flee? Who can help me cover over my shameful crimes and efface them by repentance? And again he looks at himself with the same turbulence that formerly propelled him into sin, and then he turns to true repentance, with a desire as great as his former eagerness to sin. And as this person, by my warning, thus wakes from the sleep of death, which he had preferred to life, he no longer desires to sin by thought, word, or deed, which before were ardently directed toward crime. And in strong repentance he rises to me, and I wholly receive him, and from henceforth discharge him as free. He will no longer be troubled by the aforesaid things which I use to warn my dearest children to hold out against the fiery arrow of the devil's persuasion, for he no longer needs them, for he will always sorrow at the sins he has committed, and in his self-scorn he will do such severe penance that he will deem himself unworthy to be called human, and the victory comes out of the stench of those filthy people whom I choose not to cast out, for after sinning they have sought me. I am prepared to do anything they ask for those who do not spurn me but receive my admonition and devoutly seek me. But those who despise and reject me are dead, and I do not know them. For there are many people who, feeling my presence and understanding that my admonition has touched their minds, fly from me by the evil ways of the sin they conceived which they have swallowed by their choice, consent, and deeds, and therefore they are to God as nothing, and no being at all, since they choose not to know what they can do when I touch them. I do not want to be near the pollution of these sinners, who will not receive my admonition or purify themselves by my exhortation and turn from their sins. They do not desire to eat that food which is the scripture of the gospel, with which all the faithful should be satisfied, or to taste the gift of its Savior. They flee from the grace of God, for they do not want to see or hear or think what they should do when goodness admonishes them. 
They flee the good admonition like a worm burrowing into the earth. The worm hides itself from all the beauty of the world, and so do the wicked, flying from the commands of God and wrapping themselves in ordure, pollution, and death, and hiding in it, afraid to come out of the stench of evil into the light. Such as these do not belong to me, for I do not choose to be apportioned here and there amid the mire. How? I choose to be with those who understand me and repent in purity. And then I join myself to human corruption in order to purge it. But those who refuse to receive me, I cast from me, choosing not to be with them. I have no part with them, for their part is that of stupid folly, which will not hear me. And I have no wish to take part in the work that builds up the abdurate perversity that ends in death. And those who spurn me thus imitate the lost angel, who saw God but did not want to contemplate and humbly acknowledge him, and thus suddenly fled from heavenly glory and trying to gain equal honor with God fell into death. These people despise me because their deeds are wicked and their pleasures call for illicit carnal desires. And because they despise me, they do what they will. They set little value on God and so neglect his command. And therefore, I often condemn them in my indignation to their full will. And so the life of eternal happiness eludes them as if they counted for nothing. And often they fall short in happiness both in this life and in the life to come because they are hard and unmoved by the happiness that comes from good. And I forsake the obstinate sinner who perseveres in his evil deeds, but I impart life to one who looks at himself and in pure repentance turns to me from his sins. For I am the firmly founded pillar, and I never forsake one who seeks me, one who understands me and intimately and faithfully unites with me, will never fall in perdition. But one who forgets me in his mind and in his pride, raises himself above me in trusting himself rather than me, he scorns to have faith in me. Counting the grace of God as nothing, I inhabit his mind like a whirlwind, but he regards me with careless mockery, desperately exalting himself in pride. And because of his pride, not because of the gravity of his sins, he mocks me thus. What is the grace of God? And I will cast him down and slay him and never raise him up by my choice, for he is dead to eternal joy. And people who do not have confidence that they can rise from a grave state of sin reject Almighty God and his grace. They despair miserably as if they cannot be saved from the enormity of their crimes, and so they fail and are rejected by me, and they run bitterly into death and live their eternal death in the lowest part of hell. But now I shall speak of my beloved children who receive me with open senses and willing minds and clear intellect and touch me with sighs and tears and follow me with joy to embrace me. O oh, my flowers, who when they feel my presence rejoice in me and I in them, they are more sweet and pleasant to me than precious stones and pearls to the people who most fervently desire them. They are to me indeed the finest cut stones, for in my sight they are always lovable. I will polish and refine them without ceasing, that they may rightly and fitly be placed in the heavenly Jerusalem, for in their minds they are always feasting with me in goodwill, never sated with my justice. When they feel my touch, they hasten to me like a heart to the water brook. I often withdraw from them so that it seems to them that they are without help. This I do so that their outer person may not be puffed up with pride. Then they weep aloud and lament, thinking I am offended with them, but it is thus I scrutinize their faith. And I still hold them with a strong hand, taking away their pride and forcing them to be ignorant of what they are in their secret good deeds. For thus I will to produce in them the fruit of grief and sorrow, and sometimes I let the devil try to seduce them with the fiery arrows of impurity and burning fornication, which wounds their frail bodies. This I permit that they may be imbued with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so become great messengers, glorious in virtue. They are tested like gold in the furnace, tried, tried by mockery and provocation, and set at naught. Very often they will be stripped of their substance by robbers and torn like lambs by wolves in the adversities of popular dissensions. 
but as sheep scattered by the wolf do not die, so these people do not perish in soul, but live more fully, purified by their troubles. For a good tree is watered and pruned and dug about, that it may bear fruit, and worms are removed from it, lest they eat the fruit. What then? Let good people then not grow hardened and embittered toward God's justice. Let them be mild and prepared to receive every good, cutting off evil from themselves and scrutinizing their work so as to repel the hurtful attacks of their enemies. For before a person feels me in his mind and his intellect knows that I am within him, I am his head, planting fruitfulness and power within him. I establish in him the strength of the city built on the firm rock. Let every faithful person therefore hear me saying this to him, O human, it is proper and fitting that a rational person should be mindless like an irrational beast, which does nothing but what it wants. O wretched people who refuse to know the great glory that God gave them when he made them in his likeness, but they cannot have their wish and freely do all evil they desire by right, as if their bodily nature gave them permission. They forget that they have the nature so that they can do good. God in his ordinances establishes all things justly, and who can oppose him? What then? Can anyone compare himself with God's ordinance, or compete with him in wisdom or discretion about anything? And why then do they wish to give up the ability that was given them to act rightly or wrongly? How? When I warn those who understand me with my touch, and they feel my presence, by my help they can carry out their good desires. But those who despise me fall into weakness and evil. But the wicked try to excuse themselves and claim they cannot do good works, so that they can freely work the will of their outer person. So now, my dearest children, sweeter in fragrance to me than spices, hear me admonishing you. While you have time to do good and evil, Worship you, God, with true devotion. Again, O oh, my dearest children, who are rising like the dawn and who must burn in charity like the sun, run and make haste, dearest ones, in the way of truth, which is the light of the world, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who redeemed you in the last days by his blood, so that when you die you may joyfully attain to him. And again I hear the one who was seated on the throne saying to me, those who desire heavenly things must faithfully believe, but not wrongfully examine. The Son of God being sent into the world by the Father and born of the Virgin. For the human mind, weighed down by the frail mortal flesh and the grave burden of sin, cannot know the secrets of God beyond what the Holy Spirit reveals to those it wills. 9. The humanity of the Savior appears in the works of the faithful people. So in a mystical mystery, the pillar you see on the south side of the wall of the building, beyond the pillar of the true trinity, signifies the humanity of the Savior, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the sweet Virgin, the Son of the Most High. For he is the strong pillar of sanctity and holds up the whole edifice of the church. His humanity is manifested in the ardent faith of its stones, which are the faithful people who work hard by the goodness of the supernal Father when the Trinity has been revealed to them. For when the Trinity in one God was made known to the believing people, the belief also appeared that the incarnate Word of God must be worshipped as true God, with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the unity of the divinity of the one true God. 10. The Incarnation, shadowy to the mind, is known to faith and works. It is a great and shadowed pillar which protrudes both inside and outside the building, for the great and incomprehensible holiness of the true Incarnation is so obscured to human minds that it cannot be contemplated except insofar as it can be done by faith. It can be understood in faith and works by those who labor in the divine cult, that is, inside the building, and those who stand idle outside can know it by words and sounds. It is so obscure to your sight that you cannot tell its size or height. For my son came among humans in the mortality of the flesh to undergo death for my people, and thus was in shadow because he was mortal. But he came without any spot of sin, and so his true incarnation exceeds all the power of the human intellect, incomprehensible in the mystical greatness of God's mysteries, and incalculable in the might of his divine power. 11. God alone 
knows who and how many will make up the body of Christ. And between this pillar and the pillar of the true Trinity, there is a gap three cubits wide in the wall, as mentioned above. This is to say that the incarnate Son of God, who is true God, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, is now inherent in his members. That is, the faithful people who will be born up till the end of the world and made members of their head through living works, as miraculously and symbolically you were shown above. But who, how many, and what kind of people they will be in the long ages to come, who will adore the Trinity and the unity of the divinity of the faithful and devout worship, resides in the mystery of the ineffable Trinity. For the place of those yet to be born is empty, and the wall of their good works has not yet been built, but the foundation has been laid, which is to say that they are in God's foreknowledge, and the faith that will save them is already strongly established, and so man must not hope and trust in anyone except God, and never despair of his mercy, since he is the strong foundation of the faithful soul. 12. All the works of the Son and the Church are the Father's will. But this shadowed pillar is standing in the same place in the building where you had previously seen in the celestial mysteries vouchsafed by God from above a great four-sided radiance of brilliant purity. The radiance which signifies the secrets of the supernal creator was shown to you in the greatest mystery. This is to say that the incarnate Son of God did all his works and suffered all his injuries in the body in the world according to the Father's secret will. That great radiance expressed this, in that its four-sidedness is a symbol of God's mysteries. For many who are born in the four corners of the world are to attain the knowledge of Christ. So does its brilliant purity, for no darkness can obscure the lucent divinity. And so here the nature of the supernal and glorious majesty, the Creator, who made everything this profound and mysterious knowledge, is revealed to you in symbols. Thus you see that no one helped that Creator, and no one resisted and opposed Him. He created everything through His Word, by will and goodness. So in it another radiance shines forth like dawn, with a deep purple light glowing in it, which is a mystical manifestation of the mystery of the incarnate Son of God. For thus God displays in His secret places the purity of the dawn, which is to say the Virgin Mary, who bore in her womb the Son of the Celestial Father, and the Son shed His pure blood which glows with the light of salvation, so that by the secret vision the incarnation of the Son is shown to you in a mystical obscurity. 13. In Christ all virtues work fully and are openly manifested. But in this pillar there is an ascent like a ladder from bottom to top. This is to say that in the incarnate Son of God all the virtues work fully, and that He left in Himself the way of salvation so that faithful people, both small and great, can find in him the right steps on which to place their foot in order to ascend to virtue, and so they can reach the best place to exercise all the virtues. How? In the fine places which are good hearts, the virtues join in the holy work of perfection, the Son of God and his members, the people who are his elect. And so in him, his example is perfection for all the faithful who concern themselves with the law of God and try to ascend from good to better. They see the manifestation of the true incarnation in which the Son of God was truly shown in the flesh, and that is where the certain ascent to the heavenly places is to be found. Therefore you see all the virtues of God descending and ascending, laden down with stones, for in God's only begotten the lucent virtues descend in His humanity and ascend in His divinity. They descend through Him to the hearts of the faithful who with good hearts and eagerness leave their own will and betake themselves to righteous deeds as a workman bends down to lift a stone that he must carry to a building site and they ascend through him when they offer to God the heavenly works that people have done with rejoicing that the body of Christ may be perfected as quickly as possible in his faithful members and so they carry stones to the higher places These are the winged and shining deeds people do with their help to win salvation. For each action is given wings by God to rise above the filth of the human mind and gain brighter splendor with which to shine before God. For what flows from the fountain of eternal life cannot be obstructed or hidden. And as the fountain should not be concealed but in plain sight, so that everyone who thirsts may come to it and draw 
water and drink, so too the Son of God is not obstructed or hidden from the elect, but is in plain sight, preparing to requite all deeds and show by just rewards which ones are done for the sake of his will. Therefore let the faithful person walk to God in his faith and seek his mercy, and it will be given to him. But those who do not seek it will not find it, as a fountain does not flow for people who know of it, but do not come to it. They have to approach it if they want to draw its water. Thus let man do. Let him approach God through the law God established for him, and he shall find him. And the bread of life and the water of salvation will be given to him, that he may no longer hunger and thirst. Therefore, these virtues are going with keen zeal to their work, for they run zealously to the divine labor like torrents of water, that the members of Christ may shine brighter than the sun and be nobly perfected in splendor and united to their head. And therefore, as you have heard, they are called God's strongest laborers because they are always active in the good deeds of the faithful. 14. The seven virtues represent the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And among these virtues, you see seven in particular whose form and appearance you especially note. This is to say that among the virtuous deeds, these seven virtues best designate the seven fiery gifts of the Holy Spirit. For it was by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit that the glorious virgin conceived the Son of God without sin. Sanctified by the holy virtues, they were clearly shown in God's only begotten and illumined in the hearts of the faithful as if in his form. And by this appearance, they take their place in the unity of faith as my servant Isaiah testifies, saying, 15 words of Isaiah, And there shall come forth a branch out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up from out of his root. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of fortitude, the Spirit of knowledge and of piety, the Spirit of fear of the Lord shall fill him. Isaiah 11, 1-3. This is to say, the Virgin Mary came forth from the troubles of earthly oppression into the sweetness of moral life, as a person might come forth from a house in which he was imprisoned, not by rising above the roof, but by walking in the designated path, or as a trickle of wine is pressed from the wine press, not by spurting up above the wine press, but by flowing gently down into its proper channel. And why a branch? Because it is not thorny in its manner, or knotted with worldly desires, but straight, unconnected with carnal lusts, arisen, therefore, from the root of Jesse, who was the foundation of the royal race from which the stainless mother had her origin. And so from the root of that branch arose the sweet fragrance of the virgin's intact fecundity. And when it had so arisen, the Holy Spirit inundated it so that the tender flower was born from her. How? Like a flower is born in a field through its seed, were not sown there. The bread of heaven arose in her without originating in the mingling with a man and without any human burden. It was born in the sweetness of divinity, untouched by unworthy sin, without the knowledge and utterly without the influence of devious serpent. Hence the flower deceived the serpent. He ascended on high and lifted up with him the sinful human race, which the serpent had seduced and drawn down with him into perdition. And because this flower was the Son of God, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon him, which is to say the Spirit and the eternal divinity. How? When humility was exalted by the ascent of the flower, scorn and disaster overtook pride. For the first woman had listened to it when she had strove to know more than she should have. But the second woman submitted to God's service and confessed him, acknowledging herself to be small and humble. And so the humble spirit ardently rested on him, in whom was hidden the surpassing charity that saved the lost people and effaced human crime and wickedness. For the fullness of sanctity was in him, and the living light shone upon him, and that light withered the fruit of sin and the evils that followed from it. And in that light the dead were healed, and the banner that conquered and destroyed death was raised. Sanctity was completely fulfilled in him, because he was conceived with no mixture of sin. Unlike human children who are born in many different sins, and when that flower breathed forth a perfume of justice by deeds and word, the Holy Spirit brought forth its fruit in fullness. For the Son of God, now clothed in flesh, clearly showed in his deeds what in times past the Holy Spirit had awakened in human minds by its inspiration mystically and secretly.
The Holy Spirit is said to have rested on the flower in a sevenfold manner, as God created all things through his word and the Holy Spirit, and on the seventh day rested from his work. But these gifts go in pairs, and their meaning for body and soul are joined together in twofold love by the unction of the Holy Spirit, yet should work as one in fear of the Lord, since fear venerates charity with trembling and adores one above all. And so the Spirit of the Lord is known by the strong virtues that shine forth from it. As branches grow out from a root, so also there is one God from whom all good things come and through whom all things are wisely disposed. And since the Spirit of the Lord rested upon the flower, the Spirit of wisdom was also with him. For where the Spirit of the Lord was present, wisdom could not be lacking. And so the Spirit of wisdom and understanding was in him. For when God created all things by his word, great wisdom appeared. For it was so diffused in the word that he was wisdom. That word was invisible when he was not yet incarnate. But when he was incarnate, he became visible. The word who was in the heart of the Father before all creatures, by whom all things were made and without whom nothing was made that was made, shone forth within time as a flower visible as a human being and offering good understanding to all humans by his word. What then? Understanding and wisdom should go together. For man was created by God with wisdom and should worthily have understood his creator. Thus, before the virgin birth, God was to be understood as God without qualification. And after the virgin birth, which brought forth the flower and the flesh, he was to be understood with amazement as both God and man. And thus, what was previously invisible to the intellect became visible and was seen in the flower. He was the tangible reason why man can now understand God in his action. How? When a person wisely worships his God, his wisdom is the origin of good works. And understanding follows, for when a person does a good work through a wisdom, that work shines forth to others, and they apprehend with joy the sweet scent and taste it has because of him. And in this virginal flower's counsel follows understanding, for man who has understanding had to be freed by divine counsel. Therefore the spirit of counsel and of fortitude rested upon him, for the Father held the counsel outside of time, that his word would be incarnate within time, perfecting all his works according to the Father's will and showing in himself obedience, so that when it shone on people through him, they might learn to imitate him in their actions. And so in the great virtue arising from his divinity, fortitude arose, but by counsel it lay concealed in him, that it might the more strongly vanquish the devil. How? Fortitude's right follows counsel. For God's counsel destroys the kingdom of the devil through the fortitude of his Son. The Son of God, the strong lion, crushed fatal infidelity by the shining light of faith. For it is by great fortitude that people believe through counsel what they cannot see with the bodily sight. What does this mean? Counsel united to fortitude pierces the hardness of stony hearts, obdurate in their evil habits. It so overrides that senseless hardness that the work of the flesh is abandoned and the work of God fittingly performed. And so in the aforesaid flower, knowledge accompanies fortitude. For by the fortitude God gives them, people attain to knowledge of him. And in his supernal sweetness, the spirit of piety resides in him along with the spirit of knowledge. For he knowingly has compassion on human miseries and is the hope by which people enter into salvation. And he knowingly wiped out the sin of the world in great piety by his death. What then? Piety is rightly linked with knowledge, for the Son of God fulfilled the will of his Father knowingly and in great piety. For he, the only Son born of the Virgin, scattered among the people the seed of heavenly virtue. And so he made it possible for them to follow the company of the angels in his modesty and chastity. Since this virtue arose in supernal piety, and so in the branch that came forth from Jesse, the virtues of this flower put forth buds. The first woman had fled from the virtues by consenting to the counsel she heard from the serpent. And the whole human race fell in her and was cut off from supernal joy and glory. But the blossoming of this branch uplifted the human race in knowledge through piety to the holiness of salvation. How? The fortitude that conquers the devil and is joined to knowledge is inspired by the Holy Spirit when faithful people devoutly acknowledge God with ardent desire and embrace him eagerly in the very depths of their soul. And in the virginal flower, piety is followed by the fear of the Lord. For when the faithful have Piety, they feared the Lord in order to fulfill his commands. And so the fear of the Lord filled that flower. 
For he himself was so full of virtues that there was no room in him for deathly pride or pleasure in honor or transgression of the law. He was completely full of fear of the Lord and never sought what was not his like the first angels and Adam, but honored his father and all his works and offered him fitting obedience. And thus the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all justice, for it is the end and the beginning of the other virtues, as the seventh day of rest was both the end and the beginning of all the creatures. How? Fear releases trembling, and trembling simulates the growth of the buds of fruitful virtues. And therefore this flower is full of fear of the Lord, for all the buds of good works are attached to him and draw their material from him. And the flower gives fruitfulness in all virtue, filled as he is beyond all others with their fruit, and able to perfect all good things as the scripture says of him. 16. Words of Solomon As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the children. I sat down under the shadow of him whom I desired, and his fruit was sweet to my palate. Song of Songs 2.3 Which is to say the son of the virgin is the sweet lover and chaste affection, and the faithful soul grasps him to crown her integrity with his sweet embrace. Renouncing an earthly husband, she unites herself to Christ, loves him with binding certainty, and regards him in the mirror of faith. He is the most beautiful fruit of the fruitful trees, which is to say that the son of the virgin comes forth from virginal modesty as a fruit, giving refreshing food to those who hunger and sweet drink to those who thirst, and thus he excels all the trees of the woods, which is to say the human children who are conceived and live and sin, not yielding the fruit he yielded. For he came from God bearing the fruit of the sweetness of life, while others have no fruit or fecundity of their own but only that derived from him. How? He gave salvation to the world through his incarnation. He appeared as the beloved Son of God among the sons of men, who through his fervor flourished and bore fruit, but were not fruitful with his great fullness. For he came from God all holy and was born of a virgin. And why is he beloved? Because he treads underfoot whatever obstructs the faithful soul, which is hastening to the heavenly places. And therefore the faithful soul most rightly calls him beloved, for she denies herself in faithful love and strives after him with devotion, struggling against carnal pleasures and rebuking herself for her desires, and she is close to him, like a wife to a husband whom she married, willingly and joyfully. And so when she begins to keep herself chaste and sigh for the Son of God, she says to herself, I want to overthrow carnal desire and unite with this bridegroom. He has fired me with ardent desire for him, and so kept me from the opposite fire. And under the shadow of his love I sit down. How? Because my desire is inflamed by his love. My soul consents to my keeping down the fiery love of the flesh. And therefore, his sweetest fruit, which I tasted in my soul when I sighed for God, is sweeter to me than all the sweetness of carnal delights I used to feel. And why sweet? Because he was born of the virgin. And so he has the sweetest savor and the strongest urgent, which he distills like balsam, which is the resurrection unto life, by which the dead have been raised. And that unguent has the healing in it that through his incarnation cleansed the wounds of sin. For the incarnation is full of sanctity and sweetness and all the virtues of virginity. Therefore, O virginity, by which the ardent and kindling produced the greatest fruit which shone in the star of the sea and fights the savage darts of the devil and despises all shameful filth, rejoice in celestial harmony and hope for the company of angels. How? The Holy Spirit makes music in the tabernacle of virginity, for she always thinks of how to embrace Christ in full devotion. She burns for love of him and forgets the human frailties, which burn with carnal desires. She is joined to the one husband whose sin never touched, without any lust of the flesh, but flowering perpetually with him in the joy of the regal marriage. 17. On the appearance and dress of the aforesaid virtues and what it means. So now you see a resemblance in the aforesaid virtues. All of them, like all the other virtues described so far, are clad, as it were, in silk. This is to say, that each of these shining lights in its own rank prepares a devout unanimity of human minds. And like the rest of the virtues in God, they have soft garments, which is to say gentleness and affection in judging holy souls, and an absence of the thorns and hardness of vice, 
Some of them go with white hair and bare heads and without a cloak, which is to say that the virtues which are joined in pure innocence in human minds are without a veil of evil habits and are not surrounded by worldly leanings, but entirely flee the influence of vice. But the first wears a woman's head veil and a mantle like transparent crystal, for she wears the chains of a humble subjection to God and throws down the pride of the devil with supernal care. She cleaves the merciful head who is Christ and imitates in lucent purity the humble and pure priest. And so she is without any taint of sin, restrained and humbled and pure as befits the priests of the Most High Priest. And the second has black hair, which clearly shows that through Christ her head she cleanses the blackness of human sin. And the third seems to have a non-human form, for her function is to alarm people and make them tremble in terror, and therefore she does not have a human appearance, for humans often disregard God and forget to fear Him, and she never does. The first, fourth, and fifth are wearing white tunics, for they are surrounded by the garments of innocence which Adam lost when he transgressed the righteous command. It was recovered for salvation in the white lily, which flowered from virginity, who assumed the work of obedience to God, and that work shines before God as the brightest star in the sky to human eyes. All have white shoes except the third, who, as mentioned, does not seem to be in human form, for these virtues are the most beautiful deeds of humans, to nullify in themselves the desires of the flesh, following the most splendid example of their Savior. But one does not resemble a human being, because a human is often careless and forgets himself in arrogance, but she is always careful and never takes refuge in audacity, that the faithful may carefully heed God's judgment. And the fourth is wondrously shod in shoes of shining crystal, so she constrains herself by her own will to pursue the shining path of Christ, and chokes death within her by the ardent flame of the Holy Spirit. But there are differences among these virtues, which is to say that though they are unanimous in their desire, they work diverse works in people. 18. Humility and her appearance. So the first figure designates humility, who first manifested the Son of God when God, who holds heaven and earth in his power, did not disdain to send his Son into the world. Thus she wears a gold crown on her head, with three higher prongs, because she surpasses and sweetly precedes the other virtues, and so is crowned with the gold crown of the precious and resplendent incarnation of the Savior. For he adorned her head with this mystery when he became incarnate. The crown is triangular, for the Trinity is in unity, and the unity is in the Trinity. The Son with the Father and the Holy Spirit is one true God, excelling all things in the height of divinity. It is radiantly adorned with green and red precious stones and white pearls. For the humanity of the Savior manifests the high and profound goodness of His works. The Son of God wrought them in the greenness of the blossoming of the virtues of His teachings, and in the redness of His blood when He suffered death on the cross to save humanity, and in the whiteness of His resurrection and ascension. And with all these the church is lighted and adorned like the object set with precious stones. And on her breast she has a shining mirror, in which appears with wondrous brightness the image of the incarnate Son of God. This is to say that in humility, which stands in the heart of the sacred temple in blessed and shining knowledge, gratefully and humbly, but splendidly and permanently, there shines forth the only begotten of God in all the works he performed in the body in which he showed himself to the world. And so the noblest impulses of the hearts of the faithful elect are sealed by this figure who sets up her tribunal in them and rules and directs all their actions, for she is the solid foundation of all human good deeds, and she shows the maternal admonition already quoted. 19. Charity and her appearance. And the second figure designates charity, for after the humility with which the Son of God deigned to become incarnate, the true and ardent lamp of charity, when God so loved humanity that for its love he sent his only begotten Son to take the human body, she is a deep sky blue, like a hyacinth, both in person and in tunic. For through his humanity, the incarnate Son of God enlightened faithfully and heavenly people, as a hyacinth illumines any object on which it is put down. And so he inflames them with charity that they might faithfully assist the needy. And this virtue is clothed with the tunic of God's sweetness, that she may shine upon all people with true light for their devotion 
use, and profit. Therefore, into her tunic two stripes are marvelously woven and incomparably adorned with gold and gems. These are the two commandments of charity which issue from the sweetness of God. We are adorned with his good and noble will as if with gold, and by just works as if by bright gems, by the wonderful gifts of the supreme giver, so that one stripe descends to the figure's feet over each shoulder in both front and back. For she carries these commandments very carefully. The one regarding God is on her right shoulder, and the one regarding one's neighbor is on her left. As Scripture says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10.27 This is to say, you should love the Lord your God who is your Lord because he has dominion over every creature, and who is your God because he has no beginning, but only is, the creator of all things. For the sake of the love of him in your heart, you should overcome and throw down your material body, which is exceedingly hard to do, because if the flesh has been conquered, the spirit will reign in you, and then you will understand God in your soul, and then will wisely keep his commandments and not fulfill them grudgingly, and thus all the powers of your soul and body will be subject to God. For when the first victory is gained in your body, you will understand God securely in your mind in everything you propose to do. For he is a firm bulwark for you against the snares of your enemies, so that no enemy can surpass his strength, and your mind should contain these things to confirm and consolidate everything you do. You shall therefore do these things with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, that nothing may be wanting to you in faith, and you may not consent to anything contrary to God. And you shall not waste yourself in matters alien to him, but collect yourself in the sweetness of his love. You shall also love yourself. How? If you love God, you love your salvation. And loving yourself in all this, you shall also love your neighbor, who is each faithful person who is joined to you by the Christian name and faith. You shall rejoice in his righteous prosperity and heavenly salvation, and his steadfast preservation and faith in the same way you rejoice in your own salvation. And this, therefore, is the double work of charity in humans, descending to their very feet, which is to say, to the appointed end. And it shows before them in loving God and behind them in helping other people and thus following charity. And then death is rejected and the people may attain the perfection of life as charity declares in her words already quoted. 20. Fear of the Lord and her appearance. And the third figure signifies fear of the Lord who arose in the minds of the faithful after the charity God showed humanity when he willed his son to undergo death for its sake. And this fear arose that people might understand the heavenly commands more fully and perfectly than they previously had when doing them. Now you see her in the same form as you did in your previous vision. For the immutable God, as was declared to you before, must be held in equal and similar honor and reverence in everything and creature of his. And she is greater and taller of stature than the other virtues, and non-human in form. For she above all the others brings people anguish and trembling. They look with sharp vision upon the greatness of the supreme majesty and the loftiness of his divinity, and they grow afraid. For God is to be dreaded and venerated by all people, since they were created by him and not another. For which reason this virtue does not resemble a human being. For as was mentioned, she rejects the perverseness that opposes God with evil deeds and fixes her inner eye on God alone and walks the righteous paths of his will. Thus she is covered with eyes all over her body, for she lives holy in wisdom. For with the eyes of good understanding she looks all around her and contemplates God in all his wonders, so as to pick out the right path of good works and bypass the devil's morass of evil works by the knowledge of God. She shines with wisdom. For she despises the deadly things that harm the spirit. She flees death and abandons iniquity and wisely builds herself a house in life. She wears a shadowy garment through which the eyes can look out. For she is surrounded by the severe abstinence that destroys carnal desires in humans. And in the abstinence she looks toward the light of life in which man is wondrously brilliant in beatitude, and she trembles in fear before me, for into the hearts of ardent people she infuses anguish and trembling, so that they will always hold in dread the turbulence and weakness of their flesh, and thus they will not slide into sin, or place their confidence in themselves or other people, but in him who reigns for all time, 
and so she avows in her speech already quoted. 21. Obedience and her appearance. And the fourth designates obedience, for when fear is shown to me in reverence, it is the next fitting that my command be obeyed. Thus she is wearing a snow-white chain around her neck, for when people forsake the strength of the neck of their own wills and join with the innocent lamb, my son, she makes their minds pure by the subjection of faithful obedience, and her hands and feet are chained together with white fetters, for she is bound by the purity of true faith and the work of Christ in the way of truth, and she does not act or walk as she wishes, but as God the ruler tells her, and she demonstrates in her words already quoted. 22 faith and her appearance, and the fifth designates faith. For when the people have obedience and obey my commands, upon hearing them, they will become believers in faith and faithfully fulfill in deed what they learn by wisdom and admonition. She has red chains around her neck, for she perseveres faithfully and steadily and is adorned with martyrdom of blood. So she trusts not in deceptive vanities but in God, and this, as already quoted, she declares about herself. 23. Hope in her appearance. And the sixth represents hope, who rises to life after faith and belief in God. Her life is not on earth, but hidden in the heavenly places until the time of the eternal reward, for which hope longs with her whole desire, as does a servant for his pay, or a youth for his inheritance. Thus she is clad in a pale-colored tunic, for her trust is as yet pallid because she has not yet been rewarded, but wearily awaits the coming of her longed-for desire. But before her in the air is the cross of the passion of the crucified Son of God, and towards it she raises her eyes and hands with great devotion. This is to say that she causes in the minds of the faithful a celestial desire, as if it hovered in the air for the martyrdom of my only begotten so that they may raise to him with humble and sincere minds this inner vision of faith and the glorious result of their labor. And so she says in her prayer, already quoted, 24, chastity and her appearance. And the seventh designates chastity, for after people have placed their hope fully in God, the perfect work increases in them, and then by chastity they start wanting to restrain themselves from the desires of the flesh. For abstinence in the flower of the flesh feels strongly as a young girl who does not want to look on a man nonetheless feel the fire of desire. But chastity renounces all filth and longs with beautiful desire for her sweet lover, the sweetness and the loveliest odor of all good things for whom those who love him wait in timid beauty of soul. Thus she is dressed in a tunic more brilliant and pure than crystal, which shines resplendent like water when the sun reflects from it. It is brilliant because of her simple intent and pure because not covered with the dust of burning desire. Miraculously strengthened by the Holy Spirit, she is enwrapped in the garment of innocence, which shines in the bright light of the fountain of the living water, the splendid sun of eternal glory. And a dove is poised over her head, facing her with its wings spread as if to fly. This is to say that chastity at her beginning, at her head, as it were, is protected by the extended and overshadowing wings of the Holy Spirit. And so she can fly through the devil's snares one after another, for the Spirit comes with the ardent love of the Holy Inspiration whenever chastity shows her sweet face. Therefore, too, in her womb, as if in a pure mirror, appears a pure infant, on whose forehead is written, Innocence. For in the heart of this purest and brightest of virtues there lives inviolable, beautiful and sure integrity. Its form is immature because it is simple infancy, and has integrity in its forehead, which is to say its knowledge shows no arrogance and pride, but only simple innocence. And in her right hand she holds a royal scepter, but she has laid her left hand on her breast. This is to say that on the right, the side of salvation, life is shown in chastity through the Son of God, who is the King of all people. And through him as defender, chastity confounds the left, the side of lust and reduces it to naught in the heart of those who love her. How? She allows no liberty to lust. As a fierce bird snatches a rotting corpse and tears it and reduces it to naught, she rejects and crushes stinking lust in God's sight, and defeated by her it cannot survive, as she hints in her words already quoted. 25. The grace of God in its appearance. 
but at the summit of the shadowed pillar we see another beautiful figure. This is to say that by the supernal and surpassing loving kindness of the Almighty and the incarnation of the Savior, another resplendent virtue is manifested, namely the grace of God. And it is powerful and full of God, admonishing people to repent so that all the villainies may be forgiven through it. It stands bareheaded, for its dignity and glory are revealed to all who seek it. It has curly black hair, for the only begotten of God clothed himself in virginal flesh without a stain of sin in the time of the Jewish people, who were tangled and knotted up in the black unfaithfulness. And it has manly face so ardently bright that you cannot look at it clearly like a human one. For God's grace and the powerful might of divinity appeared to give life in life, and it burned so ardently in that glorious divinity that no human being can see it with inner or outer sight while he is still weighed down by the heaviness of the body. So it does not stand with its secret revealed to the human judgment, but is mysterious, for the judgments of divine grace are hidden. It is clad in a tunic of purple and black, which is to say that the work of grace which burns in charity leans down over the blackness of sin as if it were clothing people. How? It warns people toward salvation and lifts them from the mire of sin toward the vision of the light by means of penitence. For as the day puts the darkness to flight, it builds up sinners towards life by taking away their misdeeds through repentance. This tunic has a stripe of red over the shoulder and a stripe of yellow over the other which falls to its feet in front of the back. For the grace of God in its strength and piety bends down to the faithful and lifts them up on high to heavenly places. How? By the two ways of the stripes. It grasps the anguish of the frail flesh worn out by the bloody battle and the strength of the soul grown tepid in the body and draws them up to love of heavenly things by the red and yellow splendor of the humanity of the divinity of the Son of God, the most serene Son. And so the faithful person who is touched by the integrity of the grace can resist his own sinful desires. He can put virtues in front of him and mortify vice behind him and thus courageously consummate his works and be clothed in them as in lovely and delightful clothes. And around its neck it has a bishop's stole wonderfully adorned with gold and precious gems. That is to say that Christ, the Son of God, who is the high priest of the Father, has the high power of the priestly office everywhere in the world. And so that office should be adorned by the grace of God, with the gold of wisdom and the gems of virtue by the faithful who are his imitators and members. But a pure radiance so surrounds it that you cannot look at it except from head to foot in front. For the grace of the omnipotent is surrounded by the serene whiteness of his mercy. In times before the humanity of the Savior, grace was hidden, invisible, and unknown in the mystery of the divinity, only from the time of his incarnation down to the last of his members, who will live at the end of the world, does grace show forth as far as possible to human understanding, openly manifesting in its works. But its arms and hands and feet are concealed from your sight, for the true power of the deeds of the goal of the grace of God working in human hands can be fully known to no one who is weighed down by a body. And the radiance around it is full of eyes on all sides, and is all alive. This is to say that the divine pity which dwells in the grace of God manifests his many mercies, and his abundant compassion in the form of many eyes, which look upon the sorrows of the people who try to follow God, and that radiance is all alive to console and save their soul, and does not prepare perdition for them but life. And that radiance changes its form like a cloud, for grace goes before the just that they may watch themselves and not fall, but follow sinners, that they may repent and rise again. And it becomes now wider and now narrower. For to the miserable and weeping hearts of the faithful, grace comes in great abundance and fruitfulness, while in the profligate and hard minds of sinners it often contracts itself to a trickle because of their aridity. And so God's grace precedes and proceeds, touches and warms people, And those who desire to be children of God can ardently receive and fulfill its words, despising fleeting things and embracing lasting ones. And so this virtue encourages the children of God to do in its exhortation already quoted. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflections and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 9, the Tower of the Church. 
After this I saw in front of the pillar of the humanity of the Savior a tower of brilliant splendor set into the stone wall on the south side of the building so that it was visible both inside and outside the building. Its breadth was five cubits across any radius of its interior, but its height was so great that I could not make it out. And between that tower and the pillar of the humanity of the Savior, there was nothing but a foundation laid, on which the wall had not yet been built. Thus there appeared an empty gap, as mentioned, which was one cubit long. And this tower was not yet finished, but was being diligently constructed with great skill and speed by a great many workers. Around its summit there were seven bulwarks built with wonderful strength. And I saw a ladder which reached from the inside of the building to the summit of this tower, with a multitude of people standing on the rungs from the bottom to the top. They had fiery faces in white garments but black shoes, and among them were some who were similar in form but taller and more splendid, who looked at the tower with great concentration. And then to the north of the building I saw the world and the people who descended from Adam going to and fro between the buildings, shining wall of reflective knowledge, and the circumference of the circle that surrounded the one seated on the throne. Many of these people went into the building between the tower of the anticipation of God's will and the pillar of the divinity of his word, entering and leaving through the wall of reflective knowledge like clouds, which are diffused here and there, and each one who entered the building was clothed in a white garment. Some of them rejoiced with great joy in the smoothness and softness of this garment and kept it on, but others seemed bothered by its weight and confining nature and tried to take it off. And that virtue whom I had previously heard called the knowledge of God often graciously stopped them and said to each one, Consider and keep the garment with which you are clothed. And I saw that some of them accepted this rebuke. And though the garment seemed to bind them, they made a great effort to keep it on. But others scoffed at these words, furiously pulled off the garment and threw it away, returning to the world from which they had come. And there they tried out many things and learned a lot about useless worldly vanities. And some of them at last returned to the building, took up the garment they had thrown away and put it on again. But others did not try to return, but remained ignominiously in the world, stripped of it. And I saw that some who were very dirty and black and acted insane came from the north and burst into the building. They invaded the tower, carrying on and hissing at it like serpents. And some of them left off this madness and were made pure, but the others persevered in their wickedness and filth. And I also saw inside the building facing the tower seven white marble pillars, completely smooth and round, seven cubits high. They supported a round dome of iron which rose nicely to a fair height. And on top of this dome I saw a very beautiful figure standing and looking at the people in the world. Her head shone like lightning with so much brilliance that I could not look directly at it. Her hands were laid reverently at her breasts. Her feet were hidden from my sight by the dome. She had on her head a circlet like a crown, which shone with great splendor, and she was clad in a gold tunic with a stripe on it from the breast to the feet, which was ornamented with precious gems. They glittered in green, white, red, and brilliant sky blue, and she cried out to the people in the world, saying, 1. Words of Wisdom O oh, slow people, why do you not come? Would not help be given to you if you sought to come? When you begin to go in God's way, gnats and flies buzz and hinder you, but take up the fan of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and drive them away as fast as possible. You should run, you should hope for God's help. Show that you are unfeigned in God's service and you will be strengthened by His hand. And on the pavement of the building I saw three other images. One of them leaned against the marble pillars and the other two stood before her on each side. All of them were directing their attention toward the pillar of the humanity of the Savior and the tower that was being built. She who was leaning against the pillar seemed to be as broad as five people standing side by side and so tall that I could not take in all her height. And thus she could see everything in the building. She had a large head and clear eyes with which she was looking acutely into the heavens and she was as white and translucent as an unruffled cloud, but I could see no other human attributes in her. 
And she cried out in a voice that rang through the whole building, saying to the rest of the virtues, two words of justice, let us swiftly arise. For Lucifer is spreading his darkness through the whole world. Let us build towers and strengthen them with heavenly bulwarks. For the devil is the adversary and opponent of the elect of God. Lucifer began by wanting and trying to get too much in his glory. And now he wants and tries to get too much in his darkness. For he blows and scatters his malice and wickedness all over and never ceases. And we are soldiers of heaven against him to conquer him in his malice and wickedness. For otherwise, because of his enmity, people will not be able to be saved in the world. And as he, when he first revolted, tried to resist the divinity, so too will his imitator, the Antichrist, try to resist the Lord's incarnation in the last days. Lucifer was thrown down at the beginning of time. Antichrist too will fall at the end of time. Then it will be known who is the true God. It will be seen who he is, who has never fallen. But as Lucifer had demons as supporters who followed him from the heights of heaven, as he fell to damnation, so even now he has people on earth who follow him to the ruin of perdition. So we virtues are appointed to fight his subtleties and mockeries, which he sends into the world to devour souls. And so we will reduce all his arts to naught in the souls of the just until he is confounded in every respect. And so we acknowledge God, who is just in all things, and so must not be concealed, but made manifest. And the first of the figures who stood before this one on each side appeared to be armed. She was arrayed in a helmet, breastplate, greaves, and iron gloves, and held an unsheathed sword in her right hand and a spear in her left. And she trod a horrible dragon under her feet, sticking the spear into his mouth so that it vomited forth unclean spume. And she held the sword as if to strike with it, brandishing it vigorously. And she said three words of fortitude. O mighty God, who can resist or oppose you? The ancient serpent, the devilish dragon, cannot. Hence, with your help, I too choose to resist him so that no one may prevail over me or throw me down. Be he strong or weak, prince or outcast, noble or baseborn, rich or poor, I choose to be the strong steel that makes all the arms to be used in God's wars unconquerable. I am the sharp edge of those weapons, and because of you, Almighty God, no one can dash me in pieces. Through you I arise to overthrow the devil. Hence I am a sure refuge for weak humans, and I give their softness a cutting sword for their defense. O merciful and benevolent God, help the brokenhearted. The other figure had three heads. One was in the normal place, and one was on each of her shoulders. But the middle one was a little higher than the other two. The middle and the right hand one shone so bright that their brilliance dazzled my eyes, so that I could not quite see whether their faces were masculine or feminine. The one on the left was a little bit shadowed, and veiled with a woman's white veil. The figure was dressed in a white silk tunic and white shoes. On her breast was the sign of the cross about which a great radiance shone like the dawn. In her right hand she held a naked sword, which she laid with great devotion against her breast and the cross. And I saw written on the forehead of the middle head, Sanctity, and on the right hand one, the root of goodness, and on the left hand one, self-sacrifice. And the middle one looked at the other two and said, Four words of triple-headed sanctity. I spring from holy humility, born of her as an infant is born of its mother. By her I was raised and strengthened as a child is cherished and strengthened by a nurse. My mother humility bears down and conquers all opposition, even that which is unbearable to others. And the right hand head looked at the middle one and said, Five words of the right hand head. I rise from my root in the lofty headed mountain which is God, and therefore, O sanctity, I must be attached to your body to enable you to stand. And the head at the left also looked at Sanctity's middle head and said, Six words of the left hand head. Oh, woe! Oh, woe! Oh, woe! How could I be so rigid and inflexible as not to conquer myself, O Sanctity, and come to your aid? 
For if I fled, you could not stand without me. Alas, 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 for the neglect of good, I must root out the painful thorn that would prick me toward perdition and pluck it out before it is completely buried in me and inflames me with foul corruption. O sanctity, I seek to evade and break with God's help the devil's entangling snare that you may freely persevere in your work. And again, the one who, as described above, was seated on the throne, showed these things to me and said, 7. After the incarnation, a new people built a new wall of virtues. When the Son of God became incarnate, a new people was called and arose, supported by his doctrine and salvation in the Holy Spirit. They were fortified against the fearsome enemy, whom no one can resist without the help of God's grace, by the exhortation of the strong towards the blessed virtue. And with God's help, they were so unconquerable that no art of the seducer could tear them or take them away from God. Therefore, this tower that you see in the front of the pillar of the humanity of the Savior represents the church. It arose when my son's incarnation was accomplished. Newly built out of all good works and lofty strength of heavenly deeds, it is strong and fortified tower, standing against the devil and resisting his iniquity. 8. The church illumined by Christ's humanity displays all human knowledge. Therefore, this tower is a brilliant splendor set into the stone wall on the south side of the building so that it is visible both inside and outside the building. For the church is illumined by the steady light of the humanity of the Son of God. To construct the divine edifice, she joins together living stones enkindled by the fire of the Holy Spirit, and thus her part in the work of the Supreme Father is doing through His only begotten is manifest both to believers and to unbelievers, to the inner understanding that comes from the heavenly knowledge of Scripture and to the outer foolishness of the secular affairs. 9. The Church gives all her adornments to her bridegroom. Its breadth is five cubits across any radius of the interior. For the church honors the Lamb, her bridegroom, and gives him all the inner thoughts and meditations which ornament her by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on what she receives through the five senses, and she also gives him all the virtues the true Lamb shows her. 10. The human heart cannot comprehend what the divine wisdom works in the church, but its height is so great that you cannot make it out. For the height and the depth of the divine wisdom and knowledge in the work of the church is too great to be understood by the fragile mortal human heart. 11. The church is moving toward perfection, but only God knows what it will be. And between that tower and the pillar of the humanity of the Savior, there is nothing but a foundation laid, on which the wall has not yet been built. Thus there appears an empty gap, as mentioned, which is one cubit long. This is to say that the knowledge of God, that firm foundation, conceals from the church, the betrothed of my son, that great praise she will have, for she is not yet radiant in complete perfection and lies in human hearts without fully flowering in them. But the gap is one cubit long, narrow enough to reach across, for the human senses are in the power of the one true Almighty God, and thus people can know good and evil and grasp through their intellect whatever is useful for them. And this was clearly shown to you above. And this tower is not yet finished, but is being diligently constructed with great skill and speed by a great many workers. This is to say that the church has not yet come to the direction and status she will have, but with great diligence and industry she incessantly hastens towards her full beauty through swiftly passing time and by means of her children. 12. The church is surrounded by the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the tower has around its summit seven bulwarks built with wonderful strength. For the church is surrounded in her high celestial labors by the seven impregnable gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they are so strong that no adversary can destroy them or even lift his mind so far as to touch them. 13. The church is fortified by its doctors flowering in apostolic doctrine. And you see a ladder which reaches from the inside of the building to the summit of the tower this is to say that the work of the Supreme Father works through His Son in His divine counsel has many stages by which the church was set up and progressed. These stages by the simple unity of the plan of the church leads to the height of the secret place of heaven, strengthening and fortifying the church as they go. So a multitude of people are standing on the rungs at the bottom to the top. For throughout the church's progress, 
from her first betrothal to the nuptial day when she will openly rejoice with the bridegroom and the full number of the children. The shining apostles stand on the rungs of God's commands, giving light and protecting her from the darkness of infidelity. 14. The doctors of the church have brought back the erring true faith. And thus they have fiery faces in white garments, but black shoes. For in the minds of the apostolic guides, the flame of the Holy Spirit kindles wondrous faith in the one God, so that they were resplendent before God and the world in the bright garment of good works. But they have black shoes because they have walked on the roads of infidelity and the filthy crimes of the unbelievers, and they won them over by their example, and finally, with great difficulty, converted them to the way of justice. 15. The apostles and their successors tenderly care for the church, and among them are some who are similar in form but taller and more splendid. This is to say that the apostles stand out among those defenders of the church as its first founders. After the Son of God, they built her by their preaching, and they and their followers who imitate them had the same idea which the apostles preached and their successors believed, but the apostles are outstanding, since they had no predecessors from whom to draw the example of the new greats except the Son of God himself, from whose mouth they heard the words of life, and they also surpassed the others in glory because it was they and not the others who saw the splendor of the Incarnation. And they are looking at the tower with great concentration, for they are always there to help the bride of God in divine love and solicitous piety, so that she can continue in perfect strength, as it is written. 16. Words of Solomon Your neck is like the Tower of David, which is built with bulwarks, a thousand bucklers hang upon it, all the armor of the valiant. Song of Songs 4.4 4. This is to say, the incarnation of the strong line, the son of the supreme ruler, who rose from the blooming of the Virgin, is the strongest instrument of the new grace, and so too the strength of your incorrupt faith, O bride, is set as the sure rampart of the faithful people. How? All your children stand and join themselves into walls around your strength, nourished by the new light that trickles from the pure living fountain, and in this strong joining they hold you as the neck holds the head and the rest of the body, so you cannot be destroyed or dismembered any more than the victorious weapon of true David could be defeated. How? The strong tower is the strength of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and in the conquering host of the faithful are tested without defeat. No adversary can boast of prevailing over them, for they hold fast to Christ, true God and man, through whom in the second coming all your children will gloriously attain adulthood and salvation. To this end the pure incarnation was foretold by the prophets and adorned by precious gems of virtue, and it was manifested through the world for the salvation of believers through those bulwarks of apostolic doctrine who planted the justice of the true light, as the following parable shows. 17. Parable of the Same Subject A certain Lord had a marble city, he cried out upon it with a loud voice, and inscribed writing on its inner wall. From the scraping of the stone trickled down, and he spoke a single word to the waters of the sea, commanding them to rise above the mountain tops. And this being done, he told the flames of the fire to burn on the altars of small tabernacles. And when they did, the tabernacles grew so high that they rapidly overtopped the city, which is to say, This Lord is the one whom no other ever excelled in dominion. He alone is over all things and in all things, for nothing is before him or after him, and so he is Lord of all. He had in his power this noble city, the company of the prophets, who were strong and constant against the raging tempest of the world. And when the Lord cried out upon them, he filled them with the Holy Spirit and stirred them up to bring forth his mysteries in obscure words, as a distant sound is heard when the word cannot yet be made out. But the true word, the incarnate Son of God, followed on the sound of their prophecy. And when the Lord infused their understanding richly with the spirit of wisdom, he inscribed many things in their hearts. And thus they prophesied by their sense of the spirit the mysteries of God in the present and future and uttered in the spirit harsh words against wicked human behavior. And so they moved the hard hearts of the Jews to mildness and compassion and good works. 
But after the word of God became incarnate, the Heavenly Father gave a sign to his apostles, who, though human, were set apart from the common people, like pure streams diverted from the other waters that flow in a plain. And he told them to flow forth into the world in a flood of true faith, overturning and wearing away the great division of pride and idol worship, that all by their preaching might know the true God and forsake their infidelity. And when this faith was strengthened in the people, the provider for all gently spoke to his elect, whose minds glowed with the flame kindled by the glowing hearts of those touched by the fiery tongue of the Holy Spirit. And he told them to despise the world and contemplate celestial life, and not to refuse to be humble and poor in spirit, but to dwell in humility, so as to prepare for themselves treasures in heaven. And those martyrs and virgins and other self-rejectors who did despise transitory things and worked in humility, meditating in lofty zeal on God's wise precepts, ascended in that self-denial to the love of heavenly things. And so in the eagerness of their good works, they surpassed the vine dressers who worked in the vineyard of the Old Testament, and they counted themselves as nothing and strove with their whole desire towards heaven. And so a thousand bucklers, perfect defenses of the perfected faith, hang from the Son of God. And the first shepherds of the church follow his example and despise themselves for the hope of heaven. They pour out their blood to protect the Catholic faith from the fiery darts of the devil, which wound human souls. And the other elect who follow them also form a heavenly militia and take arms to establish the love of God in this world. How? The ancient serpent infused into the first man the evil stench of contempt for God, and so the devil himself is now pierced with the darts of heaven. The perfume of the spices of charity and continence and the fetters of God's commandments and the yoke of Christ's company and thus cast out from the city of God confounded and trodden down into his clear damnation, he is abhorred by all the faithful. 18. Those who live according to the flesh await the knowledge of God's power. But now to the north of the building you see the world and the people who descend from Adam going to and fro between the buildings, shining wall of reflective knowledge, and the circumference of the circle that surrounds the one seated on the throne. This is to say that by the sin of the first parents, the world and the worldly people are subject to carnal desires, which are centered on earthly weaknesses and worldly longings. But for one thing the knowledge of good and evil has been given them, that they may draw near to God by good and fly from evil, for another God has shown them his power, that they may know they are under his rule and all their deeds are judged by him. 19. The different kinds of people who enter and leave the church. Many of these people are going into the building between the tower of the anticipation of God's will and the pillar of the divinity of his word, entering and leaving through the wall of reflective knowledge like clouds, which are diffused here and there. For some approach the divine work through reflective knowledge, admonished by the Old Testament and New Testament and renouncing carnal desires, but some follow their pleasures and go out into the same way due to their evil desires. Their will for good or evil propels them as swiftly as clouds, and they withdraw, carried passively by their thoughts, and those who enter the building are clothed in white garments, which is to say that those who approach God's work with good will are clothed by His mercy in a pure and shining garment of the true faith that knows God. Some of them rejoice with great joy in the smoothness and softness of this garment and keep it on, for they are imbued with sweet and mild Catholic faith and have a contrite and humble spirit, and they are bathed in the inner holiness. So they rejoice with their inner vision and heavenly things and devoutly do and keep what the Holy Spirit inspires in them. But others seem bothered by its weight and confining nature and try to take it off. For they feel weighed down by the heavy burden and impeded by the difficulty of the path. So they tear and torture themselves inwardly by their restless and bitter habits and forbidden desires and end by trying to reject faith in works and refusing to listen to the divine precepts. And that virtue whom you heard called the knowledge of God often graciously stops them, admonishing them in the words already spoken. For the Most High God, as you saw, knowing how hard human hearts can be softened, in His mercy inclines Himself to them. He reminds them often to pray to Him and inwardly lament and weep, that they may be delivered from their perilous iniquity, to which they came to the devil's persuasion. 
and by this penitence he tells them to return to knowing what goodwill is and remembering the garments of innocence they received and the regeneration of the spirit and water. And you see that some of them accept this rebuke, and though the garment seems to hinder them, they make a great effort to keep it on. This is to say that when the Holy Spirit admonishes them, they receive the warning in faith, they choose the path that is harsh and difficult for them, and finally, not letting their weakness make them despairing or apathetic, with great labor they complete it. But others scoff at these words, furiously pulling off the garment and throw it away, returning to the world from which they have come. And there they try out many things and learn a lot about useless worldly vanities. These are the people who hold God's law and justice in derision. In their vain error, they strip themselves of their Catholic faith and deny it by wicked works, which lead to death and turn aside to the world's vanities that they earlier pretended to leave. And there they use perverse arts to probe into lustful deeds and so learn the strong savor of the world. And the devil deceives them into perversions and mockeries. And some of them, at last, return into the building, take up the garment they threw away and put it on again. For they return from the way of error to the divine path and reject the schism the devil has imposed on them. And so they resume the dress of true faith which they received in baptism and threw away in error when they scorned the true God, and they praise him again with pure and simple heart. But others do not try to return, but remain ignominiously in the world, stripped of it. For they disdain to return to God in pure penitence and remain despoiled of the garment of innocence and stripped of the good that would come from the works of faith. And so full of the devil's vicious arts, the evil vanities of the world, they live impenitent till death, and so are confounded both in this world and in the life to come. 20. On Simoniacs and the hidden divine judgment on them. And you see that some who are very dirty and black and act insane come from the north and burst into the building. They invade the tower carrying on and hissing at it like serpents. This is to say that they are wicked people, willful and blithely careless, who are blackened by the devil's point of view, and so despise God. Therefore they seek what they desire, not through the gift of the Holy Spirit, but inspired and incited by devilish arts. So they come from the direction of hell and craftily get into the divine edifice, and by secret intrigues and open seizures, they insanely ingest the offices ordained by God by means of the execrable, horrible, devilishly black money. And by their mad folly, they throw the church into disorder, and so hiss at her with the deceiving hisses of the ancient serpents. How? With diabolical cleverness, they mislead the unwary and conquer them with deadly bribes. And their boasting hisses corrupts the church, for they are stealing the powers God constituted in her. And because they do these things, they are banished from my sight. I do not recognize them as holders of these offices, for they got them by themselves and not through me. And so my servant Hosea indicates, saying, They have reigned, but not by me. They have been princes, and I knew not. Of their silver and their gold they have made idols for themselves, that they might perish. Hosea 8.4 This is to say, People who do their own will and set up for themselves whatever their own desires dictate. What is that? Their lustful will which persuades them that they can rule people by offices they have stolen or seized, though they never asked or got them from or were set up in them by me? Sometimes I will allow this to happen so that their wills may bring them to judgment, punishing them for not seeking me. What will it profit them? For it will produce nothing for them but aridity. It is not rooted and will give rise to a useless weed without a trunk. For fruitless plants spring up easily by themselves from the ground, but fruit-bearing ones must be sown and planted with great labor. And so I sometimes allow persons' earthly desires to blossom. If they have no root in evil, though they also seek no root in good, so they will lack summer fertility. I also sometimes allow a virtuous desire well-rooted in good to bear fruit in misery, for I love to water with sanctity all that lacks winter sterility. And so the vile often surpasses the useful common people in power, as weeds are sometimes taller than useful plants. But these people are appointed only by their own desires, not rooted firmly in my planting, 
or touched by my gift of knowledge, and I permit this to happen by my just judgment, for they established themselves by themselves and did not ask me, and they will answer for it in the judgment. For these people pervert to their vain opposites the felicity of good doctrine, which should be mentally purified from unworthy belief as silver is purified from dross, and the utility of deep wisdom, which should make their faith splendid and show them how to worship, venerate, and confess God. How? They turn this felicity to profound infelicity, for they give the reason they have from God over to the insatiable lusts of the flesh, as if that stinking and putrid flesh were God. They do not seek to raise their eyes to the God who made them, but they hold their own will as God, living by what they ordain for themselves. And they do this not to possess the field that bears the crop of eternal life, but to flee from it and lose themselves forever in impenitence. That which they worship as God is dead. So they too are dead these buyers and sellers of spiritual things who wanted to be something without asking me? For how can one who insanely usurps power and makes the rational gift of the Holy Spirit a thing to be sold get anything out of the sale? For one who sells his substance to others no longer has the use of it. And how can the buyer use the salvation he bought? For he did not try to receive it from God, but hastened to buy it for money. But God in his righteous judgment allowed him to buy it. For God in his anger at certain people allows them to become thieves. But yet he punishes them for it by a secret judgment, now and not in the future. He allows them to be confounded by the very thing they loved in place of the Holy Spirit, so that they will be brought by this disaster to penitence and return to God for forgiveness. And other people he tolerates and does not afflict in the present, but justly delays his judgment till the future. For they hold their wills in place of God, and so God in future will demonstrate to them what their wills are worth amid torments. And still others he punishes both now and in the future, for they willfully make their evil, brilliant minds vile and contemptible, and imitate the evil deeds of the devil. He allows some to go this far, that their evil may be negated by penitence, and that they may punish themselves bitterly and cast away their wrong like a putrid corpse. But he mercifully stops others from reaching this point, for if they did, they would do things that merited the pains of Gehenna and would not escape them. Now if someone dishonors and usurps a chair of power by means of his spiritual father, money, for in that transaction money becomes his bishop, he buys himself perdition. And both he who gave and he who receives the money must be cast out of their dignities. For if a person's animal is stolen from him and sold to another, the one from whom it is stolen has every right to demand it back if he finds it, while both he who sold it and he who bought it must give it up. And so to an office that should be held according to my rule is governed strictly by those rules. And if by some secret bribe it is stolen and wickedly given to an alien, the one who put it up for sale and the one who bought it shall both justly be deprived of the use of it. For they have made the temple consecrated to my name a den of thieves. How? The wisdom I counsel I put into their hearts they have put up for sale in the marketplace. And so they are getting the wages of iniquity by the perdition of others. So they must renounce this traffic with bitter penance or they will answer to me for it in unquenchable fire. For one who tries to juxtapose a living dignity, vivified by the Spirit, with the stench of corruption by buying it for dead money will be lost, unless he hastens to repent that perverse presumption. As Peter, the son of the dove, who deserted all error when enkindled by the Spirit, said to the fleeing whirlwind who tried to absorb the light into hideous blackness. 21. Words of Peter the Apostle on the subject. May your money perish without you because you have thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have no part or lot in this word, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Acts 8, 20-21, which is to say, This money with which you falsely believed you could become the master of a thing alien to you, but which regards you as a servant or as nothing at all, may it go with you into the perdition of the fires of Gehenna if you do not repent. 
And if you keep the gift of an ardent Holy Spirit, which you purchased with money, for in your transitory wisdom you have thought that you could have for money the enkindling of your soul by the great searcher of hearts, and you did not trust to get it by God's gift, but if you repent of this wrong, you must give up what you have bought and hold the money you gave for it as lost. For you tried to buy an eternal thing with mud from him who created you from the mud. And as long as you keep this purchased, you will never share the light of the company of the supernal angels. For by your speech you have revealed your heart's rapacity, coveting a thing not desired by the citizens of glorious eternity. And so your heart in this wickedness is unjust in God's sight, for it wants to have by a money purchased what should be given freely by God. And my just judgment likens those who will not seek this divine concord by the free gift of the Holy Spirit to vain idols. For idols are the work of hands and have no truth in them, but they are worshipped by the infidels instead of God. And so too those who use gifts not illumined by the Holy Spirit are teachers of deceit. For they do not take an office citing in their soul as being unworthy of it, but receive it with eager pride from other people and ignore my will about it. Therefore I will know not whence they came and hold them as alien to me, and if they persevere in their injustice, they are cut off from me. But if they repent with their whole heart, I will receive them, and the angels will rejoice in them. 22. Offices of power are set up by God, and those who resist them resist God. But though those who strive after these dignities with perverse ardor act unjustly and, as mentioned, consent must not be given to their usurpation, nonetheless, government itself is good for human welfare and well-ordained by God. So it must not be stubbornly resisted, but obeyed for love of me. So let no faithful person who wants to obey God oppose himself to the authority that governs him, for in keeping and feeding God's sheep, it imitates him in honor and must not be destroyed by an alien who is a thief and a robber. So as no one should oppose God, no one should foolishly resist his authority. Therefore, everyone who lives in the soul and body should obey the offices superior to him and subject himself to them, whether they maintain corporeal or spiritual justice. Human laws should be guided by fear of the authorities, lest people should turn from the right path to follow their undisciplined wills, to become laws unto themselves. This would be going astray from the way of the Lord, for powers from God exist to keep people from straying. How? Human governments are set up by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and through them people may learn the fear of the Lord. If people pervert them into anarchy by their wills, God does not will it, but only permits it, that these people's twisted wants may be satisfied to their ruin. And thus the powers of the offices are inspired by God for human advantage, justly ordained by him of necessity, for otherwise the people of God would live like flocks without a shepherd and follow every winding path of disorder. Hence he who resists them out of pride and refuses to obey them in just humility opposes not people but me, the Creator, who disposes all things justly. He follows Adam's transgression in so opposing me and thus increases the darkness of his condemnation. He is driven out of joy into sorrow. This does not mean that a person who humbly refused his consent to perverse wickedness, for if he does so properly, he increases God's justice and does not diminish it. It refers to one who tries to overthrow an office improperly because of his exalted pride. For as mentioned, these offices were constituted by me for the advantage of the living. The one who proudly defies them resists my inspiration. Nonetheless, some people in mad ignorance and forgetting to fear me obtrude themselves upon these dignities and transgress the divine command by their wicked wills. And by my just judgment, I let it be as they wish, but they will answer for it in a just judgment, either by severe penance or by the fires of Gehenna. 23. On Simoniacs who repent and those who do not. But you see that some of them leave off of this madness and are made pure, but that others persevere in their wickedness and filth. This is to say that some of them, by divine inspiration, come to themselves out of their wickedness and by pure and true penitence, earn the right to be cleansed and saved. 
but others are obdurate and impenitent and remain in their crafty impurity till the end of their life, and therefore they will die miserably by choking a painful and cruel death. 24. God gave the gifts of the Holy Spirit to defend and adorn the church. And you see inside the building, facing the tower, seven white marble pillars completely smooth and round. This is to say that the omnipotent Father, who has supreme power without beginning or end in the perfect round of eternity, has worked for the production and beauty of the new bride by manifesting the seven modes of the purifying inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which drives away all adverse storms. And they are seven cubits high because these gifts surpass in strength the height of all human intellect, and thus show that he who creates all things must be worshipped in pure faith. They are supporting a round dome of iron which rises nicely to a fair height. For these pillars in their excelling glory manifest the profound and incomprehensible power of the divinity, and by their perfect straightness they protect and support in heaven the people who, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, separate themselves from carnal pleasure here below. 25. Wisdom and her appearance. And on top of this dome you see a very beautiful figure standing. This is to say that this virtue was in the Most High Father before all creatures, giving counsel in the formation of all creatures made in heaven and earth, so that she is the great ornament of God and the broad stairway of all the other virtues that live in Him, joined to Him in sweet embrace in a dance of ardent love. And she is looking out at the people in the world, for she protects and guides the people who want to follow her and keep with great love those who are true to her. And this figure represents the wisdom of God, for through her all things are created and ruled by God. Her head shines like lightning with so much brilliance that you cannot look directly at it. For God, who is terrible or mild to every creature, sees and judges all things as a human eye assesses what is before it but no human can understand fully the profound mystery of the divinity. Thus her hands are laid reverently on her breast. This represents the power of wisdom, which she wisely holds to do her work, so that no one can oppose her by craft or might. Her feet are hidden from your sight by the dome, for her depths are hidden in the hearts of the Father and invisible to humans, and her secrets are naked and manifest to God alone. She has on her head a circlet like a crown, which shines with great splendor. This is to say that the majesty of God is without beginning or end, and bright with incomprehensible glory. And the divinity is so radiant that mortal sight cannot look on it. And she is clad in a gold tunic, which is to say that wisdom is often thought of as pure gold. It has a stripe on it from the breast to the feet, which is ornamented with precious gems. They glitter in green, white, and red, and brilliant sky blue. For from the beginning of the world, when wisdom first openly displayed her workings, she extended in a straight line to the end of time. She is adorned with the holy and just commandments, which are green like the first sprouts of the patriarchs and prophets who sighed in their tribulation for the incarnation of the Son of God, and white like the virginity of Mary, and red like the faith of the martyrs, and brilliant blue like the lucent dove of contemplation, which by the ardor of the Holy Spirit mandates love for God and one's neighbor. And so she will proceed even to the end of the world, and her admonition will not cease, but will spread as long as the world endures, and so wisdom declares in her already quoted exhortation. 26. The appearance of justice, fortitude, and sanctity. And on the pavement of the building you see three other images, this is to say that these virtues, which do the divine work by treading the earthly underfoot and following the heavenly, are the three instruments by which the church strives towards eternity in her children, nourishment from their teachers, and the fight of the faithful against the devil, and the rejection of consent to vice. One of them is leaning against a marble pillar, for the doctors of the church imbued with the gifts of the Holy Spirit find rest in their strength and the other two are standing before her on each side. For as the exhortation says, the love of God and of neighbor resides in the united and cooperative action of these virtues. Therefore all of them are directing their attention toward the pillar of the humanity of the Savior and the tower that is being built. For they are showing by their unanimity that the Son of God, true God and true man, is devoutly worshipped and adored in the church and that they are raising up justice 
demonstrating the way of salvation in the Old Testament saints, the Most High God in the incarnation of His Son. 27. Justice in her appearance. So this figure who is leaning against the pillar represents God's justice. For she arises after wisdom and by the Holy Spirit's work in all the justice of human beings. She seems to be as broad as five people standing side by side. For she takes in all five human senses and uses them to abide the law of God. And she contains and keeps all the commandments God instituted for those who love her. And she is so tall that you cannot take in all her height. And thus she can see everything in the building, for she is greater than the human mind and extends up to heaven just as she bent down from heaven in the incarnation of the Savior when he who was the Son of God came forth from the Father, who is true justice. And so she looked at all the attributes of the church, for they are made and contained by her, and thus are the higher bulwarks joined to confirm the strong tower. She has a large head and clear eyes, with which she is looking acutely into the heavens, for justice in her supreme goodness has shown people a bright vision in the incarnate Son of God, who showed himself in a human body to darkened mortal eyes, teaching heavenly things to save their souls. And she is as white and translucent as an unruffled cloud, and she dwells in the purity of the minds of the just who direct all their desire toward obeying the justice of God, and so is as white as a cloud, and thus she prepares for herself a pleasant habitation in just hearts. But you can see no other human attribute in her, which is to say that she remains heavenly and not terrestrial, as was declared to you. That is, those human deeds that weigh people down do not cling to her, but only those that lead them to justification and life. For God is just, and she, fighting against the devil, shows it in her exhortation already quoted to the other virtues which work for God. 28. Fortitude in her appearance. And the first of the figures who stands before this one on each side represents fortitude. For fortitude arises after God's justice like a prince under the rule of the supreme king, to repel by righteous and holy labor all traps set for humans by their enemies. For she is armed by the power of the Almighty God, and strong in faith repels the advance of the devil. Therefore she is arrayed in a helmet, which is to say with supernal power to save believers, and in a breastplate, which is to say in Christian law, which can never be destroyed by the devil's arrows, because it is full of justice and in grieves, which is to say in righteous paths walked by the main teachers in the doctrines, and in iron gloves, which are the strong and noble works the faithful do in Christ. She holds an unsheathed sword in her right hand, which is God's admonition in the divine scripture, whose inner meaning the Son of God disclosed when he opened the law to show the sweetness of its kernel. And she has a spear in her left hand, for when carnal desire for the pleasure of the flesh afflict the faithful, they resist by thinking of the eternal. And she is treading a horrible dragon under her feet, which is to say that by the path of righteousness, she subjugates to her power the ancient and frightful serpent. She is sticking the spear into its mouth so that it is vomiting forth unclean spume. For with the mighty daring of chastity, she pierced the gaping jaw of the fallen devilish lust and wrings from it the burning venom with which it polluted humans. And she holds the sword as if to strike with it, brandishing it vigorously, for God has displayed the vast strength of his pervasive word to slay all unfaithful idol worship and other schisms of unbelief, and so this virtue shows in her admonition already quoted. 29. Sanctity and her appearance. The other figure signifies sanctity, for when the devil is repelled by fortitude, sanctity arises in the good to adorn them in the heavenly host. She has three heads, for three attributes make up her condition. One is in the normal place, and one in each of her shoulders. For God, the head of all dignities, is to be respected and venerated in prosperity and adversity, in human joy and sorrow. But the middle one is a little higher than the other two. For he who is the judge of the good and the evil rises in his equity above all things. The middle and the right hand one shine so bright that their brilliance dazzles your eyes, so that you cannot quite see whether their faces are masculine or feminine, 
which is to say that sanctity is so honorable and sweet and full of heavenly grace that the depths of the mystery exceeds the human intellect and weighed down by mortality, that intellect cannot discern her liberty or her subjection in Christ except what is seen in him himself. But the head on the left is a little bit shadowed and veiled with a woman's white veil, for this perfection sternly constraining itself for love of God is anxious and careful to defend itself by God's help when attacked by the devil and people. And so in the sight of the faithful hearts, it commends itself humbly to the supreme redeemer and the purity and beauty of the Christian fight. The figure is dressed in a white silk tunic, which is to say that she is surrounded by works of sweet and lucent zeal in which perfect sanctity imitates my son. And she is protected by white shoes, for she shines brightly in human minds through the death of Christ and the pure regeneration of the spirit and water, that they too may imitate his death. On her breast is the sign of the cross, about which a great radiance shines on her breast like the dawn, for sanctity awakens in the minds of the believers who lovingly embrace her, and repeated remembrance of the passion of Christ Jesus, she declares with bright faith that he who obeyed the Father and suffered so much in his holy human state was born without stain of sin from the beautiful dawn, the Virgin Mary. In her right hand she holds a naked sword, which she lays with great devotion against her breast and the cross. That is to say that her holy works show how much she loves the scriptures revealed in the Holy Spirit, which the chosen recall to mind as they sweetly remember the passion of their Redeemer. And you see written on the forehead and the middle head, Sanctity, for sanctity is known by the inner face of the soul, full of joy and life and without unworthy shame. And on that of the right hand is one, the root of goodness. For that is clearly the beginning and foundation of sanctity unto salvation. And that of the left-handed one is self-sacrifice, for she sternly restrains herself from sluggishness, softness, and vain earthly pleasure, and adorns herself with the other virtues that she may be perfected in perseverance. And the middle one looks at the other two, and they look at it, and they all consult together for their advantage. For they are strong, united in inner vision and in love, and none of them can last without the help of the others. And so they direct their words and admonitions to people to help them go forward. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflections and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 10, the Son of Man. And after this I saw on the summit of the eastern corner of the building where the shining part and the stone part of the wall come together, seven white marble steps which rose like an arch up to the great stone on which the shining one sat on the throne and on these steps a chair was placed on which sat a man of youthful appearance his face was manly and noble but pale he had black hair down to his shoulders he was clad in a purple tunic he was visible to me from his head to his navel but from the waist downward he was hidden from my sight and he looked on the world and cried out loudly to the people in it, saying, 1. Words of the Son of Man O foolish people, you languidly and shamefully shrink into yourselves. You do not want to open an eye to see how good your souls could be. You constantly burn to do the evil of your fleshly desires and refuse to be of good conscience and think rightly. It is as if you did not know good and evil, or have the glory of knowing how to avoid evil and do good. Hear me, the Son of Man, saying to you, O human, regard what you were when you were just a lump in your mother's womb. You were mindless and powerless to bring yourself to life, but then you were given spirit and motion and sense so that you might live and move and come to fruitful deeds. 2. Man has the knowledge of good and evil and so has no excuse. So you have the knowledge of good and evil and the ability to do work, and you cannot plead as an excuse that you lack any good thing that would inspire you to love God in truth and justice. You have the power to master yourself and to not want to take pleasure in injustice. You can punish yourself and flee from the illicit lusts you delight in, and so honor my martyrdom by fighting against your burning desire and bearing my cross on your body. And why have you this great power? So that you may avoid evil and do good. And you will answer to me for your knowledge of good and evil, as you know yourself to be human. 
but you despise good and do evil, burning with carnal desire. Good seems grievous to you, and evil is easily awakened in you, and so you choose not to restrain yourself, but to sin freely. What did I not do for you when I, the Son of Man, suffered on the cross in frail flesh, and trembled in great anguish because of that? I require of you a self-martyrdom. You must suffer the lusts of your flesh and your other unruliness, your illicit desires contrary to to my will and bad actions that come from them. And you cannot excuse yourself by saying that you do not know your good from your bad actions. 3. Admonition to the married. But I do not reject the chaste coupling of legitimate marriage, which was set up by divine counsel when the children of Adam were fruitful and multiplied. But it is to be done for the true desire of children and not for the false pleasure of the flesh. And only by those to whom it is allowed and harmless by divine law, those allied to the world and not set apart for the spirit. You should love the good you have from me better than yourself. You are heavenly in spirit, but earthly in flesh, and so you should love heavenly things and tread the earth underfoot. When you do heavenly things, I show you a supernal reward. But when you seek to do what is unjust by the will of your flesh, I show you my martyrdom and pains I endure for your sakes that you may fight your wrong desires for love of my passion. You have been given great intelligence, and so great wisdom is required of you. Much has been given to you, and much will be required of you. But in all these things I am your head and your helper. For when heaven has touched you, if you call on me, I will answer you. If you knock at the door, I will open to you. You are given a spirit of profound knowledge, and so have in yourself all that you need. And this being so, my eyes will search you closely and remember what they find. Therefore, I require of your conscience a wounded and sorrowful heart. For thus you can restrain yourself when you feel drawn towards sin and burn in it to the point of suffocation. Behold, I am watching you. What will you do if you call upon me in this travail with a wounded heart and tearful eyes in fear of my judgment and keep calling on me to help you against the wickedness of your flesh and attack of evil spirits? I will do for you all that you desire and make my dwelling place in you. 4. Analogy of the Field Now therefore, my child, note how much work and sweat goes into a field before it is sown with seed. But after it has been sown, it brings forth the crop. Attend and consider these things. Do I not refuse to let the earth bring forth a crop without the sweat of labor? But when I choose, it bears so abundant that people have the fullest sufficiency, or even more. And when I choose, it bears so meagerly that people can hardly survive in their hunger, or even pine and die, and so too are people sustained by me. To a person who willingly and with good heart receives the seed of my word, I grant the gift of the Holy Spirit in superabundance, and to a good field. One who now receives my word and now refuses to accept it is like a field that is sometimes green and sometimes dried up. But this person does not perish utterly. His soul suffers hunger, but he has some greenness, though not much. But one who never chooses to hear my word or awaken his heart to do good by the admonition of the Holy Spirit or by human instruction will die completely. You wonder at this, O human, and want to know why. 5. Man must not look into what he is not meant to know. But just as you cannot look on divinity with your mortal eyes, you cannot grasp its secret with your mortal minds, except in so far as God permits you. Your wavering minds turn this way and that. And as water is evaporated by the heat of a furnace, your spirit is dried up by the turbulence of your foolish minds. For you want to know what cannot be known by the sinful seed of man. Will you raise your finger and touch the clouds? This cannot be done and neither can this search into what is not for you to know. As a plant cannot comprehend nature of the earth because they lack sense and intellect, you know not what they are or how they bear their fruit, though in their usefulness they encompass the earth, or as gnats or ants of such small creatures do not seek to rule their own kind or to know or understand the power and nature of lions or great animals, so you cannot know what is in the knowledge of God. When were you and what were you doing when heaven and earth were made? He who created them did not need your help, nor does he now. Why do you search into God's judgment? You are touched by the rain of salvation from above. Show me how you labor in the field of your heart to cultivate it. 
If that labor pleases me, I will give you good fruit. The fruit with its reward shall be according to your labor. Do I give the fruit of the earth without labor? Neither, O human, do I give to you without the sweat I ask of you. For through me you have in yourself all the means to work. Exercise yourself, therefore, diligently in labor, and you shall have the fruit thereof. And when you have the fruit, you shall have its reward. But now what? Many seek me with a devout, pure, and simple heart, and having found me, never let me go. 6. No one may too quickly come into the way of holiness. But many joke and play and try to approach me without mental labor or cogitation. They are unwilling to deliberate their course first, calling on me and examining the habits of their body. They wish only to seize upon me like one awakening from deep sleep and take the way of sanctity by their own will with a sudden and deceiving motion. Some therefore take my yoke on their shoulders by rejecting secular affairs, others by fleshly continence, others by modest virginity, and they think it possible to be what they wish without recognizing what they are and what they are capable of. But they remain unaware of the one who made them and who their God may be, wishing only to have him as their servant to do their will. To the person who tries to unite himself to me thus vainly, while in his ignorance he does not know me, I will not give my gift. I will not sow an empty field. Therefore his foot will often stumble, and I will say to him, O human, why have you not examined the field of your mind and rooted out the weeds and thorns and thistles? Why have you not called on me and examined yourself? For before you come to me, you are as one drunk and insane and ignorant of the good and depriving yourself of the help and consolation of the Spirit, the Paraclete. But what was your guide and helper in this? Your fallacious and deceitful mind, it led you foolishly into aridity, without the fruitful memory in your intellect, and you can do nothing good without me. And so what do you have? You will be wretched and empty, and will fall down before me and before the people, and be trodden into vain dust. If you work against me, what can you do? Nothing. And with me, what can you do? The most shining works, which are more splendid than the light of the sun and sweeter to taste than honey and milk to the desiring people. For when you seek me in your inmost soul, as you were taught through faith in baptism, do I not do everything you desire? But some who should have sought me up before they fell seek me, sighing and sorrowing after they fall. And to them I offer my hand, saying, Why did you not seek me before falling? Where was I, and where did you seek for me? And when you sought me, did I reject you? And I say, O human, if you stood on a bridge over deep water and foolishly boasted and forgot yourself the way you have despised me in these matters, thinking all things were possible to you, and you did not need my help, if then you decided proudly, I choose to avoid this bridge and walk on the water, would you be acting wisely? If you act so presumptuously and foolishly towards this creation, which was made for your profit, you will perish. But this will not happen because you have a present invisible fear of the water and of drowning and are on your guard. Or if you saw a large tree that had been sawn through and was falling, would you not flee to avoid being injured by it? Or if you saw lions or bears or wolves coming your way, would you not for fear hide in the ground if you could? But since you flee thus from physical injury, why do you not flee the cruel death of the soul by fearing your Creator? Have you ever seen or heard of one who could rebel against me? For he who is not with me will be dissolved, and he upon whom I fall will be broken into pieces. Where were you when heaven and earth were created, which go on as they were meant to? But you, who were formed by God's counsel and touched by his illumination, transgress his commands. O oh, great mindlessness, for the sake of the creation that serves you, you despise your God, though you tread the earth and watch the heavens, which fear their creator and fulfill his commands. This you foolishly do not do, for you choose not to know him with your thoughts and deeds, or to look toward him and know him as you should. Therefore, if you do not repent, hell will justly receive you, for you have imitated the one who was thrown in his obduracy down from heaven. But if you fall, seek me with your constant outcry, and I will lift you up and receive you. O human, you sometimes try to touch the highest things 
when you cannot understand even the lowest. 7. How virgins and celibates should draw near to sanctity. Therefore, hear me when I tell you this. If because of my words you wish to bear my yoke and renounce secular business or abstain from the things of the flesh, before you come to that, cry out and persevere in seeking me, and I will help you. And if touched by my admonition you wish to imitate me, recognize that I was born without male seed in modest virginity. As a flower is born in an unplowed field, humbly show me the field of your mind and speak to me with a flood of inner tears and say, O my God, I, an unworthy human, do not have it in me to carry out my undertakings to keep my virginity unless you, Lord, help me. For I am guilty of upsurges of burning desire and wallow in misery. By my own strength I cannot vanquish my taste for the sweetness of the flesh, for I am a tree conceived and born in sin. Therefore, O Lord, give me by your might the fiery gift that will extinguish this perverse kindling and burning in me, that with righteous breath I may drink of the water of the living fountain that will make me rejoice in life. For now I am dust and ashes, regarding the works of darkness more than the works of light. And if you are zealous and constant in this supplication, I will prepare for myself in you the field Isaac saw in his son when he said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a plentiful field, which the Lord has blessed. Genesis twenty-seven twenty-seven. And I will bless that field of mine in my heart. And as Isaac went on to say, Be Lord of your brethren, and let your mother's children bow down before you. Verse 29. So too you will be a generation raised above the common people, and I will sow in that field roses and lilies and other perfumes of virtue, and I will water it constantly with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I will uproot what is useless and tear out what is evil in it, so that I may survey it with my eyes and feast them on the greenness and the blossoming of this uncorrupt field. But this will be my doing and through me, not yours or through you, O human, for I am the flower of the field. As a field engenders a flower without being plowed, so I, the son of man, was born of a virgin without her coupling with a man. And therefore this gift is mine and not yours, for you were conceived in sin and born of corruption. But if you faithfully ask this gift of me, you may expect it confidently from me. I will grant that in the sight of my father you may participate with me in virginity, but because of the weakness of your body you will not have it without suffering from your desires. For your weak human nature will often manifest itself in you, and since you are flesh of flesh you cannot escape it. But in this you should bear my cross and imitate my martyrdom. You should restrain yourself and conquer yourself through me, which is always pleasing to me, for I know you are a fragile vessel. And so I choose to share in and pity your pains. But if because of those pains you fall, rising up quickly and do penance from the heart, and I will receive you and save you. 8. Inner continence of mind and examples pertaining to it. But certain people deceived by the devil and obdurate and evil think they are sanctified if they keep their outer selves from marriage. But they remain uncircumcised in mind and spirit, overflowing with impure thoughts and bringing forth evil in their words and works. They ignore the fact that this is disgraceful. They tepidly keep their bodies intact from fornication, but they reject the virginity of the Spirit. Hence, they are unworthy in my sight. Outside both the physical and spiritual law, for they have lived according to God's justice, neither in the flesh nor in the Spirit. They have not kept either the law of marriage, which was appointed for them, or what is more than the law's command, the love of virginity. Therefore they are unworthy in my eyes, and I know not what they are. For I have not seen them either walk in the command of the law, or do more than was commanded them. And they are rejected from my sight. I compare them to waste ground, which brings forth thorns and thistles and useless weeds. Though their height and color is that of roses and lilies and other useful flowers and herbs, that have healthy sap and sweet fruit and healing fragrance, and I compare them to copper, which pretends to be gold, but is secretly only an imitation and counterfeit of gold. For in the same way these people masquerade as wise virgins, but they are inwardly full of craft and unworthiness. Therefore they are also in my sight like a tepid breeze, with no briskness of heat or cold, for their mental heat makes them unfit to persevere in the virginity they began in. And in the cold of secular affairs they cannot proceed as they would like. 
They do not wander outside the confines of the law like the publicans, or sin within it like the unjust, but are inwardly tepid, neither just nor unjust, but as the young of unclean animals are cast out before they are conscious of living or growing in strength, so these people are cast out into death. For they do not know how to live unto life, or know in themselves the strength of the virtues, which are in the house of wisdom. And so I spew them out of my mouth, for they remain unpenitent, they are unworthy of my sight. So now, O human, look into yourself. 9. Analogy of the Treasure If someone who loves you very much gave you a treasure and said to you, Profit from this and enrich yourself, that it may be known who gave you this treasure, you would have to consider very carefully. You would have to ponder on how to make the best gain out of it and say to yourself, I should make the best profit possible with my Lord's treasure, that he too may be praised for it, and after it was thus increased to advantage, and you had multiplied it, a good report would come to the ears of the one who had given it to you, and he would think of you because of it, and love you more, and confer great gifts on you. This is what your Creator does. He loves you exceedingly, for you are his creature, and he gives you the best of treasures, of vivid intelligence. He commands you in the words of his law to profit from your intellect in good works and grow rich in virtue, that he, the good giver, may thereby be clearly known. Hence you must think every hour about how to make so great a gift useful to others as to yourself by works of justice, so that it will reflect the splendor of sanctity from you, and people will be inspired by your good example to praise and honor God. And when you have justly multiplied it to advantage, this praise and thanksgiving will come to the knowledge of God, who by the Holy Spirit inspired these virtues in you, and he himself in the sweetness of his love will give you grace to overflowing, and he will make you burn yet more for the love of him, so that strengthened by the Holy Spirit, you may wisely discern the good and do greater deeds, and ardently glorify your Father who gave you these things. Let my sheep hear these words, and let those who have the inner ears of the Spirit lay hold of them, for it pleases me that people who know and love me should understand what to do by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in the eastern part of the building I saw three figures standing on the pavement before the youth. They stood next to each other, looking at him devotedly, and opposite the north, between the building and the great circle, which extended from the shining one who was sat on the throne. And I saw a wheel hanging in the air, and as it was a human figure who could be seen from the breast up, looking with penetrating gaze on the world. And in the southern corner of the building another figure appeared standing on the pavement inside, turning most joyfully towards the youth, and all these figures resembled each other in the following ways. Like the other virtues I had seen, they were all clad in silk garments. All of them were veiled with white head veils, except the right-hand one and the three mentioned above, who was bareheaded and had white hair. None of them wore a cloak except the middle one of the three, who had a white one, but they were all clothed in white tunics except the one on the wheel, who had a black tunic, and the left-hand one of the three, whose tunic was pale-colored, all were shod in white except the middle one of the three, whose shoes were black and painted with different colors, but this was the divergence between them. On the breast of the middle figure of the three, who stood together, were two little windows. Above them was a heart facing the right side of the figure, so that its four feet were above the right window and its hind feet above the left, poised to run. And this figure said, Ten, words of constancy. I am the strong pillar who cannot be moved by light changefulness. A blast of wind cannot shake me like the leaf of a tree, for I abide in the true rock, which is the Son of God. Who can prevail to move me, and who can harm me, neither strong nor weak, prince nor noble, rich nor poor, will ever be able to keep me from persevering in the true God, who will not be moved forever. And I will not be moved, for I was founded on the strongest foundation, for I do not choose to be with the flatterers, who are blown here and there, and always by the wind of temptation, and who are never at rest in constancy, but always fall to the lower and worse. I do not act so, for I am set to the firm rock. And the figure on her right contemplated the heart, and said, 11. Words of Celestial Desire As the heart pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after you, O God. Psalms 41.2 Therefore I will skip over the mountains and hills and bypass the sweet weakness of the transitory life, and with pure heart regard only the fountain of living water. 
for he is full of immeasurable glory, with whose sweetness no one can ever be sated. And the figure standing on the left looked at the little windows and said, Twelve words of the compunction of heart. I always gaze on and think of the true and eternal light, and neither thought nor desire nor contemplation will make me sated with the perpetual sweetness that is in the supernal God. And the figure who was opposite the north in a wheel had a blossoming twig in her right hand. The wheel revolved without ceasing, but the figure within it remained motionless. And on the perimeter of the wheel was written, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there also shall my servant be. John 12:26. And on the breast of the figure was carved, I am the sacrifice of praise in all lands. And that figure said, Thirteen words of contempt for the world. To him who overcomes I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God, Revelation 2.7. For the fountain of salvation has drowned death and poured its stream into me to make me blossom in redemption. And the figure who stood in the southern corner was so bright of face that I could not look fully at her. She had a white wing on either side, each broader than the figure herself, and she said, 14 words of concord. Who is so strong as to try to oppose God, and who is so audacious that they would dare to strip me naked and corrupt me in the shameful hatred and envy? God is just and alone in power and glory. I want to embrace him always with pure and joyful face and rejoice in his judgments. And I do not want to change but to remain always in one mind and praise God continually. Therefore neither the devil nor envious man could ever weaken me or degrade me to the insanity of deceit or make me stop persevering in peace and concord. And when the world passes away, I will appear more gloriously in the heavenly vision. After that, I looked and behold, all the pavement of the building appeared like a white glass, which shone with a calm splendor, but the splendor of the shining one seated on the throne, who was showing me all these things, shone brightly through the pavement, even into the abyss, and between the building and the circle where it extended from the one who was on the throne, the earth was visible, sloping downward, so that the building suddenly seemed to be placed on a mountain, and the shining one seated on the throne spoke to me again. The Son of the living God, born of the Virgin, is the cornerstone, rejected by those who should have built their salvation on the law of God and refused. For they love darkness more than light and death more than life, but the Son reigns mightily in those who burn with the touch of the Holy Spirit, tread their outer selves underfoot and hasten, and hasten with full consent to the inner things of the Spirit in fullness of virtue and good works. 15. God's work in humans is consolidated by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you see on the summit of the eastern corner of the building, where the shining part of the stone part of the wall come together, seven white marble steps. For the sevenfold ascent of pure fortitude rises in high justice from the true east, which is the cornerstone of the divine work, where the two parts of the wall of necessity, reflective knowledge and human deeds, hold to each other in secure repose. This ascent in full and righteous action, God works and perfects in humans, and he works on six days and rested on the seventh. 16. God unites the deeds of the faithful to fear the Lord. These steps rise like an arch up to the great stone on which the shining one sits on the throne. For every act that is done by the faithful in faith and works is fittingly united by God's providence to the fear of the Lord, upon which he who rules all things is enthroned in supreme omnipotence. 17. The Son of God guides those who seek to persevere and destroy death. And on these steps a chair is placed, which is to say that the firm foundation of protection is set above the works God works in humans to guide and help them. And whoever chooses to persevere in him will not sink into error, for he is the mighty support on which all justice is established. And on the chair sits a man of youthful appearance. This is the constant ruler, the Son of Man, who reigns as one God in all justice with the Father and the Holy Spirit. His face is manly and noble, for he is the strong lion who has destroyed death, and the noble sinless one, who was visibly born of the Virgin. But he is pale, for he is, does not seek earthly honor by earthly means, but was gentle, poor, and humble, and with holy humility. 18. The birth and passion of the Son of God ended the shadow of the law. He has black hair down to his shoulders, for the Jewish people did not seek to clarify the faith displayed in the incarnation of my Son. And so they remained in the darkness of the shadow of the mere outward understanding of the law, and wasted away in obstinacy and faithlessness. They arose from the head of justice, 
but they only reached as far as the shoulders of fortitude. And when the perfect work blossomed in the humanity of my son, they ended in unbelief. And he is clad in a purple tunic, for he poured out his blood in charity to save people who have perished. 19. God's past deeds for the church can be seen by people, but not the future. He is visible to you from his head to his navel, which is to say that from his incarnation to the present time, the work he has done in the church have been manifest to the faithful. But from the waist downward he is hidden from your sight. For the things that will be in the church from the present time to the end of time are not for people to see or know, except by divine revelation and Catholic faith. For the great splendor of virtues that will be manifest in people before the last days still lie hidden, unknown to humanity. 20. God looks on humanity with mercy and tells them to imitate the saints. And he looks on the world because the Son of God directs a merciful gaze towards people and speaks faithful words of warning to them about things past and things to come, and tells them to imitate the heavenly army of saints, flee from the dangers of sin and fight with great strength to attain supernal felicity and escape the punishment of the wicked. 21. Constancy, celestial desire, compunction, contempt of the world, concord. And in the eastern part of the building you see three figures standing on the pavement before the youth. They stand next to each other and look at him devotedly. This is to say that when justice arose and bore down carnal desire, which occurred when, by the decision of the Almighty Father, the Son of God appeared in the flesh, these three virtues showed themselves unalterably unanimous in their devotion to the power of the Trinity, and they direct their gaze to the Son, because they desire him and seek him in all the faithful. Hence also, opposite the north between the building and the great circle that extends from the shining one who sits on the throne, you see a wheel hanging in the air. And in it is a human figure who you can see from the breast up, looking with penetrating gaze on the world. This wheel is a circle of divine mercy which fights the arts of the devil by secret power of God and builds a spiritual structure in human minds. It rolls in the air now touching the power of God's justice and now confirming his work in people. And in it appears contempt of the world, a Christian perfection seen as far down as the breast of her fortitude. For this virtue, trusting in God in the severest of struggles, reminds people who are alive in the secular world with her penetrating warning to imitate the example of the Son of God who went before them, rejecting worldly things and desired him with an unalterable mind. And in the southern corner of the building, another figure appears standing on the pavement inside, turning most joyfully toward the youth. For when fallen man was restored to life in fruitful ardor through the goodness of the supernal father, this virtue showed itself open in sweet affection, trod secular things underfoot and turned towards the Son of God in company of the angels and the faithful. For she blossomed by the power of heaven in the incarnation of the Savior. 22. Their appearances and dress. And all these figures resemble each other, for with similar devotion they manifest God in those people who magnify him with their works. So like the other virtues you have seen, they are all clad in silk garments, for they are equal in power to the other virtues who were truly shown before. And they are equally tending upward toward God in the gentle activity of their sweet work in the faithful. All of them are veiled with white head veils, which is to say that they all consecrate themselves before God their head with great devotion to the pure propositions of the law, as a wife veils herself before her husband, except the right hand, one of the three mentioned above, who is bareheaded and has white hair. For she manifests herself in strength and felicity through the heavenly trinity, not weighed down by any earthly care, and in the purity of her heavenly desire seeks only to depart and be with Christ. None of them wears a cloak, for they have been divested of all duties of servitude that might hinder them from the duties of freedom, to gaze perpetually into heaven and long for God, desiring nothing unless it is separate from the earthly things. Except the middle one of these three, who has a white cloak, this signifies her perseverance in the divine beauty of the conscious keeping of the blessed law. For this virtue is wrapped and covered, and the work as a person is wrapped in the cloak. But they are all clothed in white tunics, which is to say that they live in the purity of good work, without the blackness of depraved habits darkened by the villainies and vices of blind infidelity, except the one in the wheel who has a black tunic, for she moves with the swiftness of divine clemency, and lives amid the deeds of whose stringency is difficult for the flesh. And the left-handed one of the three, whose tunic is pale-colored, 
for she is surrounded and defended by God's supreme majesty and adversity and protected by the sorrow of the work she does, weeping and wailing and sighing to God. All are shod in white, for they glow with the death of my son and prepare the way of peace in human minds, so that those minds can desire celestial things, except the middle one of the three, whose shoes are black and painted with different colors. For she, though she remains under God's protection, bears the division of the faithless, who turn aside into black mockery from the way of truth. But she is the path of righteousness and trusts in the death of my son, and so she perseveres in strength and beauty through the many attacks of the devil and the many tribulations of the human spirit, and makes her way towards heavenly things. But there is a divergence between them, for though they are of one mind and joined to do their work, each one separately shows her powers over the people subject to her in heavenly fervor and clarity. 23. On constancy. So the middle figure of the three who stands together symbolizes constancy, who is the pillar of the rampart of the virtues who join with her. She reveals herself to the people in the center of this number, which signifies the Holy Trinity, showing them that they should be constant in good works, for indeed Christ, who was God and man, crowned his works in the world with a good end. And so this virtue is the foundation of the other inner virtues in people, and by her discipline leads them to God. And so on her breasts are two little windows, which is to say that in human hearts the things of heaven are manifest in two mirrors of faith, for there must be faith in both the divinity and the humanity of the Son of God, through whom the virtue of constancy perfected by the strength of his righteousness shall not be removed from people. Above these windows is a heart facing to the right side of the figure, for the Son of God is elevated by the belief of the Christian people above the faith that he is God and man, and in his swiftness which represents celestial desire, he faces the right side of constancy, for eternal life is to be found by perseverance and good works. Therefore the heart's four feet are above the right window, and its hind feet above the left, poised to run. For when he hastens with great suffering to the passion of the cross, his course brought him the salvation of souls and true life to those who persevere. And so this virtue points out in her already quoted words of avowal. 24. On Celestial Desire. And the figure on her right prefigures Celestial Desire, who always looks up to heaven and moves towards salvation, even as constancy does not seek the joys of the transitory, but desires the felicity of the eternal. She contemplates the heart, for she continually longs for the Son of God and his shining work, and cannot be sated with his sweet embrace. And so she affirms in her discourse on her desire, already quoted. 25. On Compunction of Heart. But the figure standing on the left indicates compunction of heart, and that memory in the mind that bemoans and weeps for its exile with intense contrition. By her blessed lamentation, Constancy turns away from the left, the side of the soul's perdition, and hastens from death to life, and so she looks at the little windows. For acting in the heart of the faithful, she directs all her intentions to the Son of God, who reigns in humanity and divinity, and she delights in the sweetness of this continual vision as she shows openly in her words already quoted. 26. On Contempt of the World And the figure who is opposite the north in a wheel indicates the perfection of Christ in contempt of the world. For the Son of God most clearly shows the fullness of virtue in the rejection of secular things. For he living among humans did not pant for earthly things. And so he admonished his imitators to strive eagerly after the heavenly. She has a blossoming twig in her right hand, for in the happiness of a saved soul, she holds fast the fresh and beautiful shoot of blessed virtues bathed in the breath of the Holy Spirit, and so the wheel revolves without ceasing, but the figure within it remains motionless, for the mercy of God bends down to humans and has compassion on their miseries, and so is always available to those who seek it. But the perfection of Christ in contempt of the world has no instability or fickleness, but always turns to what is immutable. And on the perimeter of the wheel is written, If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am there also will my servant be. This is to say that the abundant mercy of God has this quality. Whoever does service to the Son of God by imitating his example will rejoice in heavenly beatitude and will attain to the endless company of the angels. And so on the breast of this figure is carved, I am the sacrifice of praise in all lands. For Christ wisely taught disdain for secular things and imparted to the hearts of his elect 
that every faithful soul should venerate and adore him with deepest devotion as the sacrifice of the Father offered on the wood of the cross. For the voice and tongue of all the faithful continually make his glory and praise resound through the whole world, thanking him for their restoring to life as the virtue clearly manifests in her already quoted discourse, 27, on Concord. And the figure who stands in the southern corner signifies Concord, who flies from the madness of the evil spirits and embraces the company of the blessed angels. For love of God, she avoids the quarrels of the faithless and longs for the vision of eternal peace. She is so bright of face that you cannot look fully at her, for she is devoid of deadly hate and envy, and so brings greater glory to human souls than the mortal mind, weighed down by the frail body, can grasp. And she has a white wing on either side, each broader than the figure herself, which is to say that this virtue extends the protection of her shining goodness to those who tire themselves out in righteous work, both in prosperity and in adversity. Her charity to human beings is broader than the whole expanse of the multitude of people who are yet to be born, and when the world has ended, she will fly above the heaven of heavens in greater glory than she appears in now. For then nothing earthly and transitory will be sought, but that which is celestial and eternal will be sweetly embraced, and all glorious and beautiful things will endure, while all clouds of injustice are dispersed. And this is truly predicted in this virtue's words. 28. Good deeds are shown in the strong faith and perfect works of believers. And you see that all the pavements of the building appear like a white glass, which shines with calm splendor. This is to say that the strength of true faith supports and expands the work in the city of God, shining pure and clear in its candor and mirror-like simplicity. Faith watches and builds the city of God with all the works done in her. And so when people begin to do good works with a calm and bright intention, they touch God. And when they perfect the works, their souls are saved and they know him profoundly. For when the work is accomplished, faith herself shows the devotion with which each soul has sought God. 29. God cast down the ancient serpent by fortitude of faith. And the splendor of the shining one seated on the throne who is showing you all these things shines brightly through that pavement even into the abyss. For the grace of Almighty God who rules all and manifests to you all the things that you are learning in this vision reduces the devil to nothingness and the perdition of death through the fortitude of faith. How? When the Son of God charged his faithful to publish to the world the teachings received from him, God in his power pierced the darkness of unbelief with the pure faith that is the regeneration of the spirit and water and cast down the ancient serpent and the eternal death of perdition he brought into the abyss of chaos. 30. Pagans, Jews, and false Christians are expelled from the church on high. But between the building and the circle where it extends from the one on the throne, the earth is visible, sloping downward, so that the building suddenly seems to be placed on a mountain. This is to say that between the strong power of Almighty God and the chosen works of His goodness, there stands people who deny the true faith and follow the temporal instead of the eternal. Such are pagans, Jews, and false Christians. They descend from evil to evil, and ignoring the teachings of the Catholic faith about the transitory, try in their pleasure to draw out wicked deeds into the deepest sins. But the great and beautiful work of God in the height of His supreme goodness shines out clearly amid this dark misery to anyone who seeks it, as the beloved evangelist John testifies by divine revelation, saying, Words of John on this subject. And he took me up in spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from heaven with the glory of God, Revelation 21, 10 through 11. This is to say the spirit lifts up the spirit. How? The Holy Spirit, by its power, draws the human mind out of the heavy flesh, that it may share in the vision of the spirit, whose eyes are not obscured by the blindness of carnal pleasure, and who sees the inner things. What does this mean? The Holy Spirit lifts the human spirit upwards to the mountain of heavenly desire that it may clearly see the works to be done in the spirit, the great works of God. A thousand deeds of the devil lie prostrate before the works, and they tower over them as a mountain rises above the level surface of the earth. They have an immovable foundation like a mountain, which does not leave its place. They are so high that mortals cannot encompass them by their reason, for they surpass the most excelling human wisdom which springs from minds that are of the earth and earthly. And thus the work of the Spirit is shown in the faithful and holy souls. The heavenly Jerusalem is to be built spiritually without the work of physical hands. 
through works given by the Holy Spirit. The greatness and loftiness of these works of the Spirit are manifest, for the city will be adorned by good works performed by people touched by the Holy Spirit. It will be situated upon a hill with countless buildings assembled from the most noble of stones, the holy souls and the vision of peace purified from all taint of sin. And so with these precious stones, it will shine like gold for wisdom displays her brightness in good people. But where did they come from? These works performed in righteous justice, which adorn the celestial Jerusalem from the height of heaven. For as the dew descends from the clouds and sprinkles the earth with its moisture, good works descend on people from God, watered by the rain of the Holy Spirit. And so the person of faith brings forth good, sweet fruit and attains to the company of the supernal city. And the heavenly works which descend on humans by the gift of the Holy Spirit have the brightness of him from whom they emanated. How? The glory of God shines in the good works of the just, making him known, adored, and worshipped the more ardently on earth. And through the virtues the holy city is adorned with their ornaments, because people who with God's help do good works worship him in countless wonders. And so by this revelation the eyes of the Spirit sees and knows by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit righteous human works appear before God in the regions of heaven. 32. God will bring the church to her consummation and confound the devil. And so, as has been shown, God works from the east to the north to the west to the south and brings to that consummation, which is the last day, for love of the church in his Son, all that was predestined before the creation of the world. He produces his works through himself and draws it back to himself, confirmed and adorned and completed in the highest perfection. And this is mystically symbolized by the aforesaid towers and virtues. How? When Adam fell, the justice of the righteous action was revived in Noah, surrounded by many miracles and extended throughout time till the last day. And God did not cease to manifest this by his elect in different times. In the preparation of Noah, east corner, the manifestation in Abraham and Moses, north corner, and the consummation in his son, west corner. How? Before time began, the desire was in the heart of the celestial father to send his son into the world at the end of time to save and redeem lost humanity. And the son born of the virgin fulfilled with the perfect work all things foretold by the Old Testament saints, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was as when to perform an action, first the human arm bends and then the hand works. What does this mean? When Adam, by God's just judgment, was cast out of the flowering land, justice first began to move in Noah, like the joint of the shoulder, and then it broadened into more defined manifestations in Abraham and Moses, like the more flexible elbow joint, and finally it came to perfection in the Son of God, through whom all the signs and marvels of the old law were publicly fulfilled, and through whom all the virtues which will adorn the heavenly Jerusalem in her children are declared in the regeneration of the spirit and water as the hand with its fingers accomplishes and puts the final touches on a work. And thus I perfect my work to my glory and your confusion, O devil. I have opposed you by the strength of my arm in the north and the west and resisted you from the east and the south as far as the sun's course runs. And in the west I have so undermined you that you are utterly confounded. For in my church, which is the mountain of fortitude, I do the work of justice and sanctity and destroy you, O shameful impostor. You wanted my people to be destroyed, and you yourself will be conquered and destroyed utterly. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear the inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and inscribe them in the soul and conscience. The following reading is Vision 11, The Last Days and the Fall of the Antichrist, as seen and recorded by St. Hildegard in her book, Chivius. Vision 11, The Last Days and the Fall of the Antichrist. Then I looked to the north, and behold, five beasts stood there. One was like a dog, fiery, but not burning. Another was like a yellow lion. Another was like a pale horse. Another like a black pig, and the last like a gray wolf. And they were facing the west, and in the west, before those beasts, a hill with five peaks appeared. And from the mouth of each beast one rope stretched to one of the five peaks of the hill. All the ropes were black, except the one that came from the mouth of the wolf, which was partly black and partly white. And lo, 
In the east I saw again the youth whom I had first seen on the corner of the wall of the building where the shining and stone parts came together clad in a purple tunic. I now saw him on the same corner, but now I could see him from the waist down, and from the waist down to the place that denotes the male, he glowed like the dawn. And there a harp was lying with its strings across his body, and from there to the width of two fingers above his heel he was in shadow, but from there down to the bottom of the feet he was whiter than milk, and I saw again the figure of a woman, whom I had previously seen in front of the altar that stands before the eyes of God. She stood in the same place, but now I saw her from the waist down, and from her waist to the place that denotes the female, she had various scaly blemishes, and in that latter place was a black and monstrous head. It had fiery eyes and ears like an ass's, and nostrils and mouth like a lion's. It opened wide its jowls, and terribly clashed its horrible iron-colored teeth. And from this head to her knees the figure was white and red, as if bruised, by many beatings, and from her knees to her tendons, where they joined her heels, which appeared white, she was covered with blood, and behold, that monstrous head moved from its place with such a great shock that the figure of the woman was shaken through all her limbs, and a great mass of excrement adhered to the head, and it raised itself up upon a mountain, and tried to ascend the height of heaven, and behold, there came suddenly a thunderbolt which struck that head with such great force that it fell from the mountain and yielded up its spirit in death. And a reeking cloud enveloped the whole mountain which wrapped the head in such filth that the people who stood by were thrown into the greatest terror, and that cloud remained around the mountain for a while longer. The people who stood there, perceiving this, were shaken with great fear and said to one another, Alas, alas, what is this? What do you think this was? Alas, wretches that we are, who will help us and who will deliver us? For we know not how we were deceived." O oh, Almighty God, have mercy on us. Let us return, let us return, let us hasten to the covenant of Christ's gospel. For ah, 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 we have been bitterly deceived. And lo, the feet of the figure of the woman glowed white, shining with a splendor greater than the sun's. And I heard the voice from heaven saying to me, 1. The Five Ferocious Epochs of Temporal Rule all things that are on earth hasten to their end, and the world droops toward its end, oppressed by the weakening of its forces and its many tribulations and calamities. But the bride of my son, very troubled for her children, both by the forerunners of the son of perdition and by the destroyer himself, will never be crushed, no matter how much they attack her. But at the end of time she will rise up stronger than ever, and become more beautiful and more glorious and so she will move sweetly and delightfully to the embraces of her beloved. And this is mystically signified by the vision you are seeing. For you look to the north, and behold, five beasts stand there. These are the five ferocious epochs of temporal rule, brought about by the desires of the flesh from which the taint of sin is never absent, and they savagely rage against each other. 2. The fiery dog. One is like a dog, fiery but not burning, for that era will produce people with a biting temperament, who seem fiery in their own estimation, but do not burn with the justice of God. 3. The yellow lion. Another is like a yellow lion, for this era will endure martial people, who instigate many wars, but do not think of the righteousness of God in them, for those kingdoms will begin to weaken and tire, as the yellow color shows. For the pale horse. Another is like a pale horse, for those times will produce people who drown themselves in sin, and in their licentious and swift-moving pleasures neglect all virtuous activities. And then these kingdoms will lose their ruddy strength and grow pale with the fear of ruin, and their hearts will be broken. 5. The black pig. And another is like a black pig, for this epoch will have leaders who blacken themselves with misery and wallow in the mud of impurity. They will infringe the divine law by fornication and other evils and will plot to diverge from the holiness of God's commands. 6. The Gray Wolf And the last is like a gray wolf, for those times will have people who plunder each other, robbing the powerful and the fortunate, and in these conflicts they will show themselves to be neither black nor white, but gray in their cunning. And they will divide and conquer the rulers of those realms, and then the time will come when many will be ensnared, and the error of errors will rise from hell to heaven, and then the children of light will be pressed in the winepress of martyrdom, and they will not deny the Son of God, 
but reject the son of perdition who tries to do his will with the devil's arts. And these beasts are facing the west, for these fleeting times will vanish with the setting sun, for people rise and set like the sun, and some are born and some die. 7. The Five Peaks and Five Ropes And in the west before those beasts a hill with five peaks appears, for in these peaks is symbolized the power of carnal desire, and from the mouth of each beast one rope stretches to one of the peaks of the hill. For each of those powers will extend throughout the period in question. All the ropes are black, except the one that comes from the mouth of the wolf, which is partly black and partly white. For the length of the ropes indicates how far people are willing to go in their stubborn pleasures. But though the one that symbolizes greed is partly black and puts forth many evils, yet some will come from that direction who are white with justice, and these latter will hasten to resist the son of perdition by ardent wonders, as my servant Job indicates about the righteous doer of justice, when he says, The innocent shall be raised up against the hypocrite, and the just shall hold to his path, and to clean hands he shall add strength. Job 17, 8 through 9. Which is to say, one who is innocent of bloody deeds, murder and fornication and the like, will be aroused like a burning coal against one who deceives in his works. How? This latter speaks of honey, but deals in poison, and calls a man friend, but stifles him like an enemy. He speaks sweet words, but has malice within him, and he talks blindly to his friends, and then slays him from ambush. But one who has a rod with which to drive away vile brutes from himself, walks in the light of the shining sun on the righteous path of his heart. He is raised up in the sight of God as a bright spark, in a clear light and a flaming torch, and so... Bearing in himself the strongest and purest works, he puts them on a strong breastplate and sharp sword, and he drives away vice and wins virtue. 9. The church will shine in her justice until the time of Antichrist. And therefore, in the east, you see again the youth whom you first saw in the corner of the wall of the building, where the shining and stone parts come together, clad in a purple tunic, now standing on the same corner. For here is the sunrise of justice, the Son of Man, manifest to you to confirm the truth afresh through his mysteries and miracles, still presiding over the union of reflective knowledge and human deeds, having shed his blood by the will and goodness of the Father for the salvation of the world. So now you can see him from the waist down. For now you see him in the strength of his members who are his elect, and he will flourish as bridegroom of the church with many obscure signs and wonders, until their number is complete, and from the waist down to the place that denotes the male he glows like the dawn. For until the time of the son of perdition, who will pretend to be the man of strength, his faithful members will be perfected in fortitude, and he will be splendid in the righteous justice of his righteous worshippers. So in the same place a harp is lying with its strings across his body, which signifies the joyful songs of those who will suffer dire torments, in the persecution that the son of iniquity will inflict upon the chosen, torturing their bodies so much that they are released from them and pass over into rest. 10. The church's faith will be in doubt until the witness of Enoch and Elijah, and from there to the width of two fingers above his heel he is in shadow. For from the time of the persecution the faithful will suffer from the son of the devil and so the testimony of the two witnesses, Enoch and Elijah, who spurned the earthly and worked toward heavenly desires, faith in the doctrines of the church will be in doubt. People will say to each other with great sadness, What is this they say about Jesus? Is it true or not? 11. Before the end of the world the devil will perish and the truth be known. But from here down to the bottom of the feet he is whiter than milk. That is to say, by the testimony of those same witnesses, who await the eternal reward from the son of perdition is defeated before the world ends, the son of man will be brilliantly and beautifully seen in the Catholic faith. The truth will be plainly shown in him, in the falsity of the son of iniquity rejected in every way. As my servant David testifies when he says, The king shall rejoice in God. All they that swear by him shall be praised, for the mouth of them that speak wicked things is stopped. Psalm 62.12 Which is to say, the profound knowledge of the beautiful human language that gives voice to the will and disposition of God is a great measure of human stature, and it makes music at the altar of God, for it knows him. 
and when the hissing and gaping of the devil which taints human minds with shame is forsaken in the time of desperation the blessed will be praised in minds that sing and they will make a flowing path of words to the pure fountain of the mighty ruler 13 when justice grows cold the church will undergo suffering and persecution and you see again the figure of a woman whom you previously saw in front of the altar that stands before the eyes of God, standing in the same place. For the bride of the Son of God is shown to you again to reveal the truth, always present to the pure prayers of the saints, and as was said before, offering them up devotedly to the eyes of heaven. But now you see her from the waist down, for you see her in her full dignity as the church, replete with the full number of her children in the mysteries and wonders by which she has saved so many. And from her waist to the place that denotes the female, she has various scaly blemishes. This is to say, though she is now flourishing worthily and laudably in her children, before the time in which the son of perdition will try to perfect the trick he played on the first woman, the church will be harshly reproached for many vices, fornication and murder and rapine. How? Because those who should love her will violently persecute her. 14. Antichrist will horribly rend the faithful and cruelly tear humanity, and thus in the place where the female is recognized is a black and monstrous head, for the son of perdition will come raging with the arts he first used to seduce in monstrous shamefulness and blackest wickedness. It has fiery eyes and ears like an ass's and nostrils and a mouth like a lion's, for he runs wild in acts of vile lust and shameful blasphemy, causing people to deny God and tainting their minds and tearing the church with the greed of rapine. It opens wide its jowls and terribly clashes its horrible iron-colored teeth, for with his ferocious and gaping jaws he evilly infuses those who consent to him with his strong vices in mordant madness. 15. The son of perdition, unable to be gentle, will try to persecute. And from his head down to her knees, the figure is white and red as if bruised by many beatings, for the son of perdition will try to seduce people by evil deceptions, and at first speak to them flatteringly and gently, but then try cruelly to pervert and force them, and then the church will know purity of faith in her children. But anguish and bloody terror and the tribulations of many sufferings for herself. 16. The church near the end of the world will be bathed in righteous blood, and from her knees to her tendons where they joined her heels which appear white she is covered with blood. For at the time near the end of the world when she must endure assault, and so the coming of the two witnesses of truth who will keep the church together by their strength, she will suffer most terrible persecutions in the blood of those who despise the destroyer will be most cruelly shed. What does this mean? When the son of perdition is strengthened through deceit and derives confidence from his perverse teachings, the church, as she hastens on, will be bathed in the noblest blood, and she will be fully constructed as the celestial dwelling. For you, O streets of Jerusalem, will then shine with the purest gold, which is the blood of the saints. The devil will be extinguished for persecuting the members of the supernal king, and his great terror will be reduced to naught. 17. We are now in the seventh millennium. But, O ye people who desire to dwell in those streets, flee from the devil and adore God who created you. For in six days God completed his works, and on the seventh day he rested. What does this mean? The six days are the six numbered epochs, and in the sixth epoch the latest miracles were brought forth into the world, as God finished his work on the sixth day. But now the world is in the seventh epoch, approaching the end of time, as on the seventh day. How? The prophets have completed their utterances. My son has accomplished his will in the world, and the gospel has been preached openly throughout all lands, and throughout the times of this full number, and more years after it, despite the diversity of human customs, the world has remained as it was, well established by me. 18. Why God now utters new mysteries by the mouth of an unlearned person. But now the Catholic faith wavers among the nations, and the gospel limps among the people, and the mighty books in which the excelling doctors had summed up knowledge with great care go unread from shameful apathy and the food of life which is the divine scriptures cools to tepidity. For this reason I now speak through a person who is not eloquent in the scriptures or taught by an earthly teacher. 
I who am speaks through her of new secrets and mystical truths heretofore hidden in books like one who mixes clay and then shapes it to any form he wishes. 19. God's warning to the learned not to spurn these words but exalt them. O oh, fruitful and rewarding teachers, redeem your souls and loudly proclaim these words, and do not disbelieve them. For if you spurn them, you condemn not them, but me who am truth. For you should nurture my people under my law, and care for them until the time for their supervision is past, and all cares and labors cease. But from now on the predestined epoch is approaching, and you are hastening toward the time when the son of perdition will appear. Grow, therefore, in vigor and fortitude, my elect. Be on your guard, lest you fall into the snare of death. Raise the victorious banner of these words, and rush upon the son of iniquity. For those who forerun and follow the son of perdition, whom you call Antichrist, are in the ways of error. But as for you, follow the footsteps of him who taught you the way of truth, when he appeared with humility, and not with pride, in the world, in the body. Hear, therefore, and understand. 20. The words of the Holy Spirit to the church about the last days. For the Spirit speaks to the church about the time of the final error. In the end of times death shall rush upon the church when she, when the accursed, the son of the curse, shall come. And he is the curse of curses, as my son testifies in the gospel about the worst city of error, saying, 21. The gospel on this subject. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted up to heaven? You will go down into hell. Matthew 11:23 which is to say O oh, you cave of iniquity you concealing ditch with your wings of hypocrisy and pretense how can you stand on the high place of the walls when your eyes devour the wickedness of vice hiding the burning light under a bushel of excrement you say who is as great as the hypocrite and murderer since the foolish call him lord will you have the signs and wonders of heaven when you dip your finger in hell how your works probe the bottom of hell and in its veracity you will lie swallowed up, and hell will vomit forth your stench, so that the world may see the bitterness of death for the destroyer who has destroyed. 22. When the world is dissolved in the elements, the church will be completed. But a head without a body or other members should not be. The head of the church is the Son of God. The body and the other members are the church and her children. The church is not yet perfect in her members, and her children... But on the last day, when the number of the elect is filled up, the church will also be full, and on that last day, the whole world will be confounded. I, God, will take away the four elements, and all that is mortal in human flesh, and in the consummation of the world there will be full joy for the offspring of the church. 23. The world is in its seventh epoch, and man cannot know what will follow. For as was said, God completed his work in six days. Five days represent five numbered epochs, and in the sixth, new wonders were manifested on earth, as on the sixth day the first man was created. And now the sixth number is complete, and the seventh has come, and the course of the world is fixed, in as it were the seventh day of rest. For now that work which the mighty doctors kept sealed in the holy scriptures is revealed. It is openly expounded in gentle words, like the words of this book, as if on a Sabbath of rest. For there are six days of work and a seventh of rest. There is no other number of days. And what lies beyond cannot be known to you, O human, but it is in the keeping of the Father. But you, O humans, have time to traverse from now on until the coming of that murderer who will try to pervert the Catholic faith. But as to what may happen then, it is not for you to know the time or the moment, even as you cannot know what comes after the seven days of the week, for only the Father knows this. Who has placed these things in his power? And about the days of the week and the times of the ages, it is not for you, O human, to know more. 24. How God willed his Son to be incarnate. But after five numbered epochs, I brought forth heavenly miracles for the world, as in five days the other creatures were created before man and subjected to man. For up to then there was a large population of pagans and Jews and various schisms, and evils were increasing among both the Gentile and the Jewish peoples. The law and the prophets had finished their work, and all the peoples had been tested for evil and for good, before my only begotten took flesh from the virgin. But I did not will to send him until all these things had first taken place, so that all justice might be tried by him, and all injustice offended by him. If my son had come earlier, it would have been premature, like a person who wants to gather his fruits before they ripen, 
and if his incarnation had been postponed until the very end of the world, he would have come to abruptly, like a fowler who catches birds by trickery, so that they know not how they fell into its nets. But my son came, as it were, at the ninth hour, when the day is turning to evening, when the heat of the day is declining and the cold is setting in. And so after five epochs of the world, my son showed himself to the world as it began to move toward its end. What then? He came and laid bare the essence of the law, changing its water into the wine of the gospel, and so he caused floods of virtue to stream forth, and he came appropriately to do this when the churchly virtues the Holy Spirit enkindled could not could take root and grow in humans and the virginity he brought in himself could bud and flower. 25. Annie Christ and his mother. But the insane murderer, the son of perdition, will come soon, when the last times descend and the earth forsakes its course, as if at the time when day departs and the sun goes down to its setting. O my faithful ones, hear this testimony and understand it with devotion so that you may be safe lest the terror of the destroyer should come upon you unawares and cast you into the ruin of infidelity and perdition. Arm yourselves, therefore, and prepare yourselves for the most strenuous battle, forewarned with firm defenses, for the time will come in which this vile deceiver will horribly appear. The mother who will bring this deceiver into the world will be nurtured in vice from her infancy to her girlhood by the arts of the devil, living among the most abominable people in the vilest of waste places. Her parents will not recognize her, and those with whom she stays will not know her. For the devil, pretending to be a holy angel, will persuade her to go away from them and guide her deceptively as he wishes. She will separate herself from all people as to conceal herself more easily, and when then she will secretly engage in vile fornication with men, though only a few, defiling herself with them with a great appetite for wicked doings as if her holy angel commanded her, to do this deed of shame. And in the burning heat of this fornication she will conceive the son of perdition without knowing which man's semen engendered him. And Lucifer the ancient serpent will take delight in this turpitude, and be my just judgment and by my just judgment will breathe on the embryo and possess it with all his power in its mother's womb. And so that destroyer will issue from the womb of that mother, full of the devil's spirit. Then she will stop her habitual fornications and declare to the unwise and foolish people that she has no husband and knows not the father of her infant. And she will call the fornication she has done holy, and the people will think and call her holy. And the son of perdition will be nurtured by the devil's arts until he comes to full adulthood, always withdrawing from people who know him. 26. The Antichrist will learn magic from his mother, and God will allow it. And throughout this time, his mother, by magic arts of hers, will show him both to the worshippers and to the non-worshippers of God, and he will be seen and loved by them. And when he reaches maturity, he will teach a doctrine that is clearly perverse, thus fighting against me and my elect. And he will gain such strength that in his great power he will try to raise himself above the clouds. But it is by my just judgment that I will permit him to do his will on various creatures. For as the devil said in the beginning, I will be like the Most High, and fell. I will lead him to fall in the last days, when he will say through his son of his, I am the Savior of the world. And as every age of the faithful knew that Lucifer was a liar when he tried at the beginning of time to be like God, so now every person of faith will see that the son of iniquity is a liar, making himself like the son of God before the last day. 27. The power of the Antichrist and the miracles he will seem to do. For he is the evil beast who kills those who deny him. He will join with kings, dukes, princes, and the rich, crushing humility and exalting pride, and by the devil's arts subjecting the whole world to himself. His power will issue forth like the wind. He will seem to set the air in motion, and bring forth fire and lightnings from heaven, and raise thunders and hailstorms to uproot mountains and dry up water, to take the greenness from forests and give it back again. In many parts of creation he will display his illusions in moisture and freshness and dryness, and he will also cause unceasing deceptions in people. How? He will seem to make the healthy sick and the sick healthy, to cast out devils and sometimes to raise the dead. How? When someone departs from this life whose soul is in the power of the devil, by my permission he will sometimes perform illusions on his corpse making it move as if alive, but he is allowed to do this only occasionally for a very short time and no longer, 
lest his presumption bring God's glory into scorn. Some people who see this will trust in him, and others will wish both to keep their earlier faith and to win his favor. In choosing not to afflict these latter too severely, he will bring illness upon them. They will seek medicine from doctors, but will not be cured. And so they will return to him to see whether he can cure them, and when he sees them, he will take away the weakness he brought upon them. And so they will love him dearly and believe in him, and so many will be deceived, for they will they will blind their own in, inner vision, with which they should have regarded me. For they will use their minds to probe this novelty, their outer eyes see and their hands touch, and despise the invisible things that abide in me, and must be understood by true faith. For mortal eyes cannot see me, but I show my miracles in the shadows to those I choose." No one shall see me while he remains in a mortal body, except in the obscurity of my mysteries, for so I spoke to my servant Moses, as it is written. 28. Words of Moses on the vision of God. For no one shall see me and live. Exodus 33.20. This is to say that no one who is mortal shall fix his mortal gaze on the glory of my divinity, and continue to live his mortal life in his corruptible ashes, for he changes with passing time, leaving one life and passing to another, while I, who establish all living things, live without change. And as a gnat cannot live if he plunges into a flame, so a mortal could not remain alive if he were to see the glory of my divinity. And so I show myself to mortals in obscurity, as long as they are weighed down by their mortality like a painter showing people invisible things by the images in his painting. But, O oh, human, if you love me, I embrace you, and I will warm you with the fire of the Holy Spirit. For when you contemplate me with a good intention and know me by your faith, I will be with you. But those who despise me turn to the devil, and choose not to know me, and therefore I too reject them. 29. Dupes of the Devil show omens and creatures, but cannot control them. But the devil makes sport of these people, and deceives them however he likes, so that they think that what he shows them is true. And the devil imparts this art of deceiving to those who trust in him, so that they can at will show people, by all his fallacious art, various potents and creatures. But they cannot in any way alter the elements or other creations of God. They simply feign monstrosities like nebulous apparitions to deceive those who believe in them. And as Adam, seeking more than was right for him to have, lost the glory of paradise, so these people let slip their inner vision and hearing, forsaking God and worshipping the devil. 30. How Antichrist will deceive his followers and why it will be allowed. And in this way the son of perdition will practice his deceitful arts on the elements and show in them the beauty and sweetness and delight desire by those he deceives. And this power will be permitted to him for one purpose that the faithful may perceive in their faith that the devil has no power over the good, but only over the evil, whose lot is eternal death. For whatever the son of iniquity brings to pass, he will do with power, pride, and cruelty, for he has no mercy, humility, or wisdom. He will incite people to follow him by his domination and the wonders he shows, and he will acquire for himself many peoples, telling them to do their own will and not restrain themselves by vigils or fasting, he will tell them that they need only love their God, whom he will pretend to be, and then they will be delivered from hell and attained to life. And they, being so deceived, will say, Oh, woe to the wretches who lived before these times, for they made their lives miserable with dire pains, not knowing, alas, the loving kindness of our God. He will show them his treasures and riches and allow them to feast as they will, confirming his teaching by deceitful signs, so that they think they need not restrain or chastise their bodies in any way. He will command them to observe circumcision in the Jewish laws and customs, but he will alleviate for them as much as they want the stronger commands of the law, which the gospel by worthy penance converts into grace. And he will say, When anyone is converted to me, I will blot out his sins, and he shall live with me forever. I will throw out baptism in the gospel of my son, and scorn all the precepts handed down to the church. And he will say with devilish mockery, See what a madman that was, who through his falsehoods decreed that the simple people should observe these things. 31. The pretended death of Antichrist and his accursed scripture after. But I will die for you and to your glory and will rise again from death, and I will deliver my people from hell, that you may live gloriously with me in my kingdom, as that deceiver pretended he had done before. And he will tell his beloved ones to run around 
to run him through with a sword and wrap him in a clean shroud until the day of his resurrection, and he will delude them into thinking they are killing him, and so they will fulfill his commands. Then he will pretend to rise again and bring out a writing as if for the salvation of souls, which is really a dire curse. And he will give this to people for a sign and command them to adore him. And if any person of faith refuses for love of my name, he will kill that person in great suffering and torture. And thus all who see and hear this will be struck with great wonder and doubtful amazement, as my beloved John shows, saying, 32. The Words of John and I saw one of his heads as if slain unto death, and his death's wound was healed, and all the earth marveled at this beast. Revelation 13.13 13. This is to say, I, the lover of God's mystery, saw the deceiver and the accursed surrounding the holiness of the saints with great countless iniquities, and wearying them with many vices. By his lying arts he will pretend he is pouring out his blood in death and perishing. He will be thought to be stricken and dying, but he will not fall in the body, but in a deceiving shadow. And having deceived people with these false wounds, and pretended to be dead, he will pretend to come back to life as if from the sleep of death. And everyone in the world will stand in terrible amazement, horrified at this accursed man, as the people were amazed at the great size and strength of Goliath when he appeared before them armed for war. And so, as you see, the pillars of my elect will be troubled by great wonder, both by their torments and by the perverse and marvelous and horrible signs that the son of perdition will produce, and they will lament in mournful anguish. 33. Enoch and Elijah, and why they are reserved to this time. But then I will send forth my two witnesses, whom I will hold back until this time in my secret will. Enoch and Elijah, they will resist him, and bring back those who err to the way of truth. They will show the faithful the strongest and solidest virtues. For when the words of their witness in each of their mouths agree with each other, they will augment the faith of their hearers. For these two witnesses of the truth were reserved so long by me, so that now when they will appear their discourse may be held and confirmed in the hearts of my elect, and through it the seed of my church may survive in humility, and to the children of God whose names are written in the book of life. They will say, 34. Their words to the children of God. O ye who are righteous and elect, and gloriously praise the graces of the blessed life, hear and understand what we confidently tell you. This accursed one was sent by the devil to lead into error the souls who submit to his commands. We have been secluded from this world, and reserved in the secret places of God, so that we have had no human care or anguish, and we were reserved and sent to you now, so that we may contradict the errors of this destroyer. See, therefore, if we are like you in bodily stature or age. 35. There are true signs by which the Antichrist will be cast down. And all who choose to know and confess the true God will follow these two aged witnesses of truth, carrying the banner of God's justice and abandoning the iniquitous error. For they will be radiant with praise before God and the people. They will hasten through the villages and roads and cities, wherever the son of perdition has breathed out his perverse doctrine, and perform in them the signs by the Holy Spirit, so that all who see them will marvel greatly. These great signs founded on the firm rock will be given to them, that they may reject the perverse and false signs. For as lightning kindles and burns, so does the son of perdition do his wicked acts and iniquity burning the people with his magic arts as lightning burns. But Enoch and Elijah will terrify and cast out his whole cohort with the thunderbolt of righteous doctrine, and so to fortify the faithful. 36. How will they be killed by God's permission and receive their reward? But by the consent of my will, Enoch and Elijah will at last be killed by Antichrist, and then they will receive in heaven the reward of their labors, and the flowers of their doctrine will fade, because their voices have ceased in the world. But they will bear fruit among the elect, who will despise the words and the ravings of the devil's arts, because they are set on the hope of a heavenly inheritance. Solomon tells this of a good and perfect person, saying, The house of the just is in great strength, but in the fruits of the wicked is trouble. Proverbs 15.6 Which is to say, in the righteous person, the reflection of the eye of God is a vivid inner dwelling, where weariness and misery are not. And God's eyes sees his wonders in this person like a sword eager to strike. 
but the deeds that come forth like growing fruits from the proud heart which erects runes on its pleasures will bring only sadness, for the proud heart does not trust in that hope which blossoms into the fullness of heaven. 37. Any Christ trying to learn the secrets of heaven will strike the church. Now you see that the monstrous head moves from its place with such great shock that the figure of the woman is shaken through all her limbs. This is to say that the son of perdition, the head of iniquity, will raise himself in his great arrogance and pride from the small error of his inherent wickedness, and seize upon a greater one, wanting to be exalted above all people. And when his deceptions are thus about to end, the whole church and her children, great and small, will be cast into extreme fear as they watch his mad presumption, and a great mass of excrement adheres to the head, which raises itself up upon a mountain and tries to ascend the heights of heaven. For the mighty arts of the devil, which bring with them so much filth, will help the son of iniquity, give him the wings of pride, and raise him to such great presumption that he will think he can also penetrate the secrets of heaven. How? When he has completely fulfilled the devil's will, and by God's just judgment, his great power for iniquity and cruelty is no longer allowed to increase. He will assemble all his cohort and tell those who believe in him that he wants to go to heaven. But even as the devil did not know that the Son of God was born to redeem souls, so also his worst of men, entangling himself in the evil of evils, will be ignorant that the mighty hand of God is about to strike him a blow. 38. God's power will strike the son of perdition and send him to damnation. And behold, there comes suddenly a thunderbolt which strikes that head with such great force that it falls from the mountain and yields up its spirit in death. For God's power will manifest itself and destroy the son of perdition, striking him with such jealousy that he will fall violently from the height of his presumption in all the pride with which he stood against God. And so ending, he will vomit forth his life in the death of eternal perdition. For as my son's temptations ended when he said to his tempter, Be gone, Satan, and the devil fled in terror, so now those trials the son of iniquity inflicted on the church will be ended by my jealousy. 39. The place of pride will become so fetid that the deceived will turn back, and a reeking cloud envelops the whole mountain which wraps the head in such filth that the people who are standing by are thrown into the greatest terror, for the impure and hellish stench will fill the whole place of his pride, in which that worst of criminals boiled with such uncleanliness, and by God's just judgment neither his beginning nor his end will be remembered, and the people, seeing his corpse prostrate on the ground voiceless and rotting, will know that they were deceived, and that cloud remains around the mountain for a while longer. But the smell of that devilish pride will show it to be impure, and thus the people seduced by him will perceive that stench and that impurity, and turn from their error and come back to the truth. For the people who stand there perceiving this are shaken with great fear when they see these things. The greatest horror will assail them, and they will pour out doleful words and tearful plaints, and admit that they have grievously sinned. 40. When Antichrist is dead, the church will shine to recall the erring. And lo, the feet of the figure of the woman glow white, shining with a splendor greater than the sun's. This is to say that when the son of perdition is laid prostrate, as was said, and many of those who had erred return to the truth, the bride of my son, standing on a strong foundation, will manifest purity of faith in the beauty that surpasses all the beauty of the glories of earth. 41. None but God can know the day of judgment. But after the wicked one has fallen, let no mortal ask when the last day in the dissolution of the world will come, for he cannot know it, because the Father has hidden it as a secret. Prepare yourselves, therefore, O humans, for the judgment. But as was said, the son of perdition and his father the devil, with all his arts, will be conquered in the last days by my son, the mighty warrior. This was prefigured when the enemies of the mighty Samson were cast down as it is written. 42. Example of Samson. And when he strongly shook the pillars, the house fell on all the princes and the rest of the multitude that was there. And he killed many more at his death than he had killed before his life. Judges 16.30 This is to say, the Son of God, symbolized by the mighty Samson, first wed the synagogue. To her he gave the secrets of his wonderful doctrine, 
which were hidden in the Old Testament and benignly disclosed to her the inner sweetness of the law, which was stronger than a lion. But the synagogue deceived him and caused his secrets to be mocked. She refused to respect his doctrine, but despised it in arrogant pride. Troubled by this, he foretold that the kingdom of God would be taken from the synagogue and given to another nation. Thus, amid many prodigies and amid a great crowd, he went up to Jerusalem. And the unbelief of those who spread their garments in the way came to an end when he paid by miracles what he had promised those to whom his bride had betrayed him. And in this turbulence he left his bride, prophesying that her house would be left desolate. But the father of his bride, seduction of the devil, married her to another husband, infidelity. Then the Son of God sent out wise foxes, the apostles, who burned the standing corn of his enemies with the fire of the Holy Spirit, that is, they turned the precepts of the law to spiritual insight. And so the synagogue was burned with her father, which is to say that her perverse infidelity was overthrown. Then with great signs and wondrous miracles he struck down the unbelieving, so that all trembled in great amazement. And they said they feared the Romans would come and take away their country and people, and therefore they gathered their cohort to destroy him. And he hid on a hill, and prayed, if it might be, for this cup to pass from him. But Judas Iscariot betrayed him, delivering him into the hands of his enemies, and he concealed the might of his strength, which was in his hair, which is to say, in his father." which was unknown to all the people except those who grasped it by faith, as hair can be grasped on a human head. But he showed the might of his strength afterward when he chose to suffer, wielding, as it were, the jawbone of an ass. For he told the daughters of Jerusalem to weep not for him, but for themselves, and thus killed them by predicting to them the error of the evils to come. And in his affliction on the cross, when he thirsted, a fountain of faith sprang from the Gentiles, and he did not blush to drink from it, declaring that so it was accomplished. And when he gave up the ghost, he descended into Gehenna, as it were, to the harlot, and his enemies tried to take him by setting guards at his sepulchre. But he rose again from the dead, carrying away the two doors, his special elect and the common people whom he freed from hell, and so he sought the heavenly kingdom. And then his beautiful bride, the church, asked him diligently after their marriage how she might know his strength. And he revealed his powers to her, not all at once, but little by little, discreetly. How? When the faithful first received the Catholic faith, some of them thought to walk in both the old and the new law until they had reached perfect rectitude, as it were. In sinews still moist and not yet completely dried, and the church still inexperienced said to the crowds, This is the strength of my bridegroom. And the people hearing these words wanted to come and worship God all at once by the book and not to live by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But his strength is not in this. Then virginity was nobly constituted, which had never before been deemed glorious, like new ropes which had never bound anything. And this binding strongly held the Son of God, but did not capture him fully. But the church raised herself and said, O oh, my friends, these are the greatest powers of my bridegroom. And all at once, with great tumult, many people rushed upon him, saying, We have seized him in his greatest strength. But not thus is his strength manifested. And when the church was assured of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, as it were, his seven locks of hair, fastened by a strong nail to the apostolic preachers as a foundation, and when she had thus woven faith, the church cried out, Oh, how strong is my bridegroom in his seven locks of hair! And all the peoples who heard her seized upon him, thinking that this was the limit of his strength. But again, his strength is not thus known. And so the church shed many tears, because she did not know the strength of the Holy Trinity. She said that she had indeed seen the humanity of the Son of God, but had not yet perfectly understood his divinity. Moved by this, he manifested by his beloved John such secrets of the Holy Trinity as it was lawful for man to know, in the honor of the Father and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he laid his head upon the heart of his bride, and he will rest there until the great schisms that will come with the son of perdition. And then his strength will be cut off as he is robbed of his hair. For people in that time will choose to follow the son of perdition and not him, saying, How is this, O God, that we see such wondrous miracles? And so his strength will be cajoled and the true faith clouded with the blindness of infidelity. 
But when Enoch and Elijah appear, his strength will return to him, and he will shatter by force all pride and presumption. He will hurl down the son of perdition with all the arts and vices of the devil. And when the church and the Christian name have passed over from the present temporal age to eternity, he will crush the devil's head much more severely than he did when divine worship flourished in the world within time. What does this mean? That when time ends, the temporal persecutions of the devil and deeds of human virtue will, will both cease. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and inscribe them in his soul and conscience. Vision 12, the new heaven and the new earth. After this I looked, and behold, all the elements and creatures were shaken by dire convulsions. Fire and air and water burst forth, and the earth was made to move. Lightning and thunder crashed, and mountains and forests fell, and all that was mortal expired, and all the elements were purified, and whatever had been foul in them vanished and was no more seen. And I heard a voice resounding in a great cry throughout the world, saying, O ye children of men who are lying in the earth, rise up, one and all. And behold, all the human bones in whatever place in the earth they lay were brought together in one moment and covered with their flesh, and they all rose up with the limbs and bodies intact, each in his or her gender, with the good glowing brightly and the bad manifest in blackness, so that each one's dead were openly seen. And some of them had been sealed with the sign of faith, but some had not. And some of those signed had a golden radiance about their faces, but others a shadow which was their sign. And suddenly from the east a great brilliance shone forth, and there in a cloud I saw the Son of Man with the same appearance he had in the world, and with his wounds still open, coming with his angelic choirs. He sat upon a throne of flame, glowing but not burning, which floated on the great tempest which was purifying the world. And those who had been signed were taken up into the air to join with him, as if by a whirlwind, to where I had previously seen that radiance which signifies the secrets of the supernal creator. And thus the good were separated from the bad, and as the gospel indicates, he blessed the just in a gentle voice and pointed them to the heavenly kingdom, and with terrible voice condemned the unjust to the pains of hell, as it is written in the same place. Yet he made no inquiry or statement about their works except the words the gospel declares would be made. For each person's works, whether good or bad, showed clearly in him. But those who were not signed stood afar off the northern region with the devil's band. And they did not come to this judgment, but saw all these things in the whirlwind and awaited the end of judgment while uttering bitter groans. And when the judgment was ended, the lightning and thunder and winds and tempests ceased, and the fleeting components of the elements vanished all at once. And there came an exceedingly great calm, and then the elect became splendid than the splendor of the sun, and with great joy they made their way toward heaven with the Son of God and blessed the armies of the angels. And at the same time the reprobates were forced with great howling toward the infernal regions with the devil and his angels. And so heaven received the elect, and hell swallowed up the reprobate. And at once such a great joy and praise arose in heaven, and such great misery and howling in hell as were beyond human power to utter, and all the elements shone calm and resplendent, as if a black skin had been taken from them, so that fire no longer had its raging heat, or air density, or water turbulence, or earth shakiness, and the sun, moon, and stars sparkled in the firmament like great ornaments, remaining fixed and not moving in orbit, so that they no longer distinguished day from night, and so there was no night but day and it was finished. And again I heard the voice from heaven saying to me, 1. In the last days the world will be dissolved in disaster like a dying man. These mysteries manifest the last day in which time will be transmuted into the eternity of perpetual light. For the last days will be troubled by many dangers, and the end of the world will be prefigured by many signs. For as you see on the last day the whole world will be agitated by terrors and shaken by tempests so that whatever is fleeting or mortal in it will be ended. For the course of the world is now complete, and it cannot last longer, but will be consummated as God's will. For as a person who is to die is captured and laid low by many infirmities, in the hour of his death, suffering great pains in his dissolution, so too the greatest adversities will precede the end of the world, and at last dissolve it in terror. 
for the elements will then display their terrors because they will not be able to do so afterwards. 2. All creation will be moved and purified of all that is mortal in it. And so at this consummation, the elements are unloosed by a sudden and unexpected movement. All creatures are set into violent motion. Fire bursts out. The air dissolves. Water runs off. The earth is shaken. Lightning burns. Thunder crashes. Mountains are broken. Forests fall. And whatever in air or water or earth is mortal gives up its life. For the fire displaces all the air and the water engulfs all the earth. And thus all things are purified. And whatever was foul and the world will vanish as if it had never been, as salt disappears when it is put into water. 3. The bodies of the dead will rise again in their wholeness and gender. And when, as you saw, the divine command to rise again resounds, the bones of the dead, wherever they may be, are brought together in one moment and covered with their flesh. They will not be hindered by anything, but if they were consumed by fire or water or eaten by birds or beasts, they will be speedily restored. And so the earth will yield them up as salt is extracted from water. For my eye knows all things and nothing can be hidden from me. And so all people will rise again in, in the twinkling of an eye, in soul and body with no deformity or mutilation, but intact in body and in gender. And the elect will shine with the brightness of their good works, but the reprobate will bear the blackness of the deeds of misery. Thus their works will not there be concealed, but will appear in them openly for the risen who are assigned and unsigned. And some of them are sealed with the sign of faith, but some are not. And the consciences of some who have faith shine with the radiance of wisdom, but the consciences of others are murky from their neglect. And thus they are clearly distinguished. For the former have done the works of faith, but the latter have extinguished it in themselves. And those who do not have the sign of faith are those who chose not to know the living and true God, either in the old law or in the new grace. 5. The Son will come to the judgment in human form. And then the Son of God in the human form he had at his passion when he suffered by the will of the Father to save the human race will come to judge it, surrounded by the celestial army. He will be in the brightness of eternal life, but in the cloud that hides celestial glory from the reprobate. For the Father vouchsafed to him the judging of the visible things of the world because he had lived visibly in the world, as he himself shows in the Gospel, saying, 6. The Gospel on the Subject. And he has given him the power to judge because he is the Son of Man, John 5.27, which is to say, The Father has borne witness to his Son. What does this mean? The Father gave power to the Son because he remained with the Father in divinity, but received humanity from a mother. And because he is a human, he received also from the Father that every creature should feel him as the Son of God. For all creatures were created and formed by God, and therefore all deeds will be judged by the Son, whatever their nobility or baseness, and he will put them in their proper order. For as he was a man palpable and visible in the world, he can justly distinguish all that is visible in the world. And he will appear in his power of judgment, terrible to the unjust, but gentle to the just, and judge them so that the very elements will feel the purgation. 7. The signed will be taken up easily to meet their judge. And those who are signed are taken up to meet the just judge, not with difficulty, but with great speed, so that in them who had faith in God, the works of faith may clearly be seen. And as was shown, the good are separated from the bad, for their works are dissimilar. For here it is apparent how both the bad and the good have sought God in infancy and childhood and youth and old age. 8. All God's flowers, the great heroes of the church, will appear radiant. And here all the flowers of my Son will shine out in radiance, that is to say, the patriarchs, the prophets who lived before his incarnation, the apostles who lived with him in the world, the martyrs, confessors, virgins, and widows who have faithfully imitated him, the holders of high office, both secular and spiritual, in my church, and the anchorites and monks who chastised and mortified their flesh and imitated the humility and charity of the angels in their garments, thus belittling themselves for my son's name. Those who seek me in the contemplative life because they think that life is more glorious than the other are as nothing to me. But any who seek me in humility in this life because the Holy Spirit inspired them to do so, I will put in the first ranks in the celestial homeland. 9. Amid the silence of heaven, the sun will give sentence on all. Then the heaven will subdue their praises and remain a while in silence. 
while the Son of God pronounces judicial sentence both on the just and the unjust. And they will give ear with reverence and honor to how he decides. And he will gently grant supernal joys to the just and terribly consign the unjust to the pains of hell. And there will be no further excuses or questions about human works. For here the conscience of both the good and the bad are naked and revealed. 10. Why the good and the bad need to be judged. Now the just who will receive the words of the most equitable judge have indeed done many good works, but while they lived in the world they did not act with fullness of perfection, and therefore their deeds must now be judged. And the unjust who will suffer a severe judgment against them have indeed done much evil, but they did not act in ignorance of the divine majesty, in the wicked unbelief that would damn them without judgment, and so they will not escape the judge's sentence, for all things must be weighed equitably. 11. Unbelievers are already judged and so will not come to the judgment. But those who are not signed in faith because they do not believe in God will tarry in the north, the region of perdition, with the devil's band, and not come to the judgment. But they will see it all in obscurity and await its end, groaning deeply within themselves because they persevered in unbelief and did not know the true God. For they neither worshipped the living God in the Old Testament before the institution of baptism, nor received the remedy of baptism in the gospel, but continued under the curse of Adam's fall with its penalty of damnation, and therefore they are already judged for the crime of infidelity. 12. When the judgment is finished, the great calm will rise. And when the judgment is ended, the terror of the elements, the lightnings and thunders and winds and tempests will cease, and all that is fleeting and transitory will melt away and no longer be like snow melted by the heat of the sun, and so by God's dispensation an exceedingly great calm will arise. 13. Glory will receive the elect, and hell swallow up the damned. And thus the elect will become splendid with the splendor of eternity, and with my Son their head, and the glorious celestial army will embrace glory and heavenly joys, while the reprobate together with the devil and his angels will wretchedly direct their course towards eternal punishment where eternal death awaits them for following their lust instead of my commands. And so heaven will receive the elect into the glory of eternity, because they have loved the ruler of the heavens. And hell will swallow up the reprobates, because they did not renounce the devil. And then such great joy and praise will resound in the glory of heaven, and such groaning and howling will arise in hell, as to exceed the grasp of human understanding. For the first have eternal life, and the second eternal death as my son declares in the gospel, saying, 14, the gospel on this subject. And these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the just into life everlasting, Matthew 25, 46, which is to say those who befoul themselves in the house of evil passions and do not thirst to drink justice from the supreme goodness will come in the course of their infidelity and wickedness to submersion in the pains of eternal perdition and according to their deeds will receive the torments of hell. But the builders of the heavenly Jerusalem, who faithfully stand in the gates of the daughter of Zion, will be radiant in the eternal life, which the fruitfulness of the chaste virgin miraculously gave to all believers. 16. Words of John. And there shall be no more night, and they will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord will illumine them. Revelation 22.5. Which is to say, one who possesses a treasure sometimes hides it, and at other times shows it. And even so, night conceals the light. The day drives out the darkness and brings light to humanity. But it will not be so when time is transformed. For then the shade of night will be put to flight and its darkness will not appear from that time on. For in this transmutation, the light people now need to dispel the darkness will not be needed. And the sun will not move and by its motion bring times of darkness. For then the day will be without end. For the ruler of all and the immutable glory of his divinity will illumine those who in the world have by his grace escaped the darkness. But let the one who has ears sharp to hear inner meanings ardently love my reflection and pant after my words and describe them in his soul and conscience.